Dare to Endure, Parallel World, Book Two, written and narrated by Christine Kersey. Copyright 2013 by Christine Kersey. Chapter One. I felt bruises forming on my upper arms as the enforcers squeezed my flesh and dragged me into the building. Maybe they were irritated that I had tried to escape and had nearly gotten away. Hansen, the one I'd need in the groin, squeezed particularly hard. Complaining wouldn't do any good. Plus, I didn't want them to get the satisfaction of knowing I was in pain, so I kept quiet. But that wasn't the only reason. My lip was swollen from when I'd been body-slammed to the ground, and I knew my words would be unintelligible, which would make me the object of ridicule. My face ached where it had skidded across the ground. Even though I'd been on grass at the time, it had felt like crashing into concrete when Dimples had taken me down. I didn't know his real name and hoped I wouldn't be around long enough to find out. My plan had been, and still was, to get back to the tunnel that had brought me to this awful world. Picturing the hut where I'd spent the night when I'd run away, I desperately wished that when I turned around to go home I'd kept going despite the darkness. Even though I'd been lost in the woods by then, it would have been far better for me to wander around in the snowstorm looking for my house than to end up in this insane world where it was illegal to be overweight. I still couldn't believe that I was a prisoner at a federally assisted thinning center, also known as a fat center. The name made it sound like they were just interested in helping me, but I'd never asked for their help, and I didn't want it. No, I'd been tasered into submission before being hauled out of my house. My crime? Being a few pounds overweight. Oh yeah, and I'd distributed cookies to my friends at school. You'd think the cookies were laced with drugs for how seriously this crime was being taken. And it was mostly thanks to Lori, my recent nemesis. It's true that I'd never been great at making friends, but in less than two weeks I'd met Lori and she had become my enemy, all over a boy, a boy I was certain I would never see again. But it was more than that. I had defied her and her attempts to bully me into submission. That's what she really hated. Holding back a sigh, I plodded down the hallway with an enforcer on either side of me. I felt sorry for myself, but more than that, I was scared. I didn't know what was going to happen next, and I didn't know how I was going to get out of there in time to make my way back to the tunnel that I fervently hoped would take me home, to my real home the one where people could eat what they wanted, and if they were overweight, they could choose to stay that way or choose to lose weight. No one was dragged out of their home, locked up like a criminal, and forced to lose weight. We entered a small room where a woman sat behind a desk. "'Can we leave her with you, Tammy?' Dimples asked. Tammy smiled at him. "'Sure!' She glanced at me, then back at Dimples. "'What's with her face?' "'She's a runner.' She shook her head at me, then focused her attention back on Dimples. You know what to do, then. The pair of enforcers led me to a chair near Tammy's desk and sat me down. Knowing it would be futile, I didn't resist. Hansen knelt and chained my right ankle to the chair, which was bolted to the floor. Then his eyes met mine, and he glared at me. I had a feeling that if the two of us had been alone, he would have enjoyed hitting me, hard. I hoped I wouldn't see him again after this. He stood. Thanks, Tammy. She smiled at him. See ya, hun. The enforcers left, and I looked at Tammy. Maybe she would be nice to me. That pathetic hope was immediately dashed when she frowned at me. Name? Morgan. Overwhelmed by what was happening, not to mention my swollen mouth, I barely managed to utter the word. Speak up. I cleared my throat and repeated my name. The woman typed on her keyboard. Last name? Campbell. Date of birth? I told her and watched as she typed it in. She asked for my address and the name of my parents. Did that mean someone would notify Mom that I'd been taken? She stopped asking questions but kept typing, ignoring me. After a few minutes, I gathered the courage to speak. What's going to happen to me? She stopped typing and looked at me. Her forehead creased in annoyance that I had disturbed her. Right now you need to sit there and be quiet. Someone will be here in a while to finish processing you. 
I felt so helpless and alone. Can I call my mom? She frowned. No phone calls allowed. I thought when someone was arrested, they got to make one phone call. Since when? She seemed sincere in her question. Obviously, the rules in this world were different. Never mind, I muttered. I have work to do, so I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't interrupt me. Without waiting for me to respond, she focused back on her computer screen. Thoughts tumbled around in my head as I imagined what would happen next. Fear coursed through me at the unknown, and I began to shiver. With my hands bound behind my back and my ankles shackled to the chair, there was nothing I could do but endure. I slowed my breathing, not wanting to hyperventilate like I had in the back of the enforcer's car, and forced myself to calm down. Trying to distract myself from my situation, my gaze wandered around the room. A large poster was tacked to the wall, and when I read the boldly written words, A healthy me is a healthy world, I squeezed my eyes closed, trying to shut out the reality of where I was and what had happened. Ten minutes later, the door to the room opened. By then I had settled down, but when I saw a new enforcer walk in, adrenaline surged through me. He glanced at the chain around my ankle, then smirked at Tammy. A runner, huh? So I hear. She sounded bored as she stood and handed him a plastic card. Thanks. He slipped the card into his shirt pocket, then knelt next to my chair and undid the chain. He gripped my arm and forced me to stand. Come with me. As if I had a choice. He led me through the door and back into the hall. We turned the corner and went into a room that looked like an exam room. He freed my wrists and I massaged them, enjoying the illusion of freedom. He pointed to a gown folded neatly on the examination table. Put that on. The doctor will be here pretty soon. I glanced at the gown, then back at him. I'll be outside. He left, and I heard a key turn in the lock. I was trapped. I frantically looked around the small room for some means of escape. There were no windows, and the only way out was through the door. There was nowhere for me to go. My eyes went to the gown. I had no intention of putting it on. Instead, I walked over to a cabinet, hoping there might be something I could use as a weapon. It was locked. So were all the drawers. This must be the room where they take the runners, I thought. Now I wished I hadn't tried to escape. All it had gotten me was a fat lip and fewer opportunities to get away, now that they were watching me more closely. Of course, I had no basis for comparison. They probably watched all of their prisoners closely. When I heard the lock disengaging, my attention snapped to the door. I hurried over to the exam table and stood next to it, my gaze riveted on the door. A moment later, it opened. The enforcer who had brought me in held it open for a petite woman with caring eyes. As soon as she entered, he closed the door behind her, leaving the two of us alone. I'm Dr. Bradley. She smiled at me. And you're Morgan, correct? I nodded. She stepped to a slim monitor and waved a plastic card in front of a reader, then placed it in her pocket. Was that the card Tammy had given the enforcer? She studied the screen. I couldn't see what it said from where I stood. Then she turned back to me, her gaze briefly going to the gown before resting on me. I... I didn't want to put it on. I see that. She smiled. That's okay. You'll want to take your shoes off, though. Every little bit helps, as everyone says. Her words reminded me of Mom, who had said the same thing to me before I'd weighed myself right after arriving in this world. I took my shoes off, then stood there. Please step on the scale. She motioned to a scale in the corner of the room. It was different than the one we had at home. This one didn't have an eye scanner. Even so, I hated the scale and the way it always loudly proclaimed my weight. It was much more interested in those numbers than I was. Maybe I should have cared more. Maybe then I wouldn't be here now. I stepped on the scale, but it remained silent. Dr. Bradley looked at the numbers. You can step off now. I did as I was told and watched as she went back to her computer and typed something. How long am I going to be here? Uncertainty filled my voice. Please have a seat, Morgan. She motioned to the exam table. I sat on the white paper, my feet dangling. Dr. Bradley stepped toward me, her face thoughtful. You need to lose 20 pounds before we can release you. 
Twenty pounds? I'd never lost that much weight before. Why would I when I thought my weight was just fine? Yeah, I wasn't as slender as some girls, but I'd never cared all that much. Now, though, I was worried. How would I possibly lose that much weight? And I would have to if I wanted to get out of there. How long will that take? We want you to do it in a healthy way. This isn't about punishment. It's about learning a healthy lifestyle. How long? From my experience, I'd estimate ten weeks. Ten weeks, I thought. That would put me past the time I needed to get to the tunnel. When I'd left my world, it had been November 10th, but in this world, it was mid-September. I wasn't exactly sure how moving from my world to this one had worked, but my best guess told me that I needed to get to the tunnel on the same date I had come through, November 10th. If I didn't, I would miss my chance to get home. What if I work extra hard and lose it faster? She stared at me. That's not ideal. If you try to starve yourself to lose it faster, then when you get back to your normal eating habits, you'll gain it all back and find yourself back here again. Wanna bet? I thought, picturing the tunnel that would take me home. She must have seen something in my face because she placed her hand on my knee and her voice softened. But Morgan, you must know that you're not leaving in ten weeks. Panic shot through me. What? Why not? Your file says you were distributing high-calorie food to minors on school property. You know that's an automatic six months. The blood drained from my face. What about a trial? What about being innocent until proven guilty? She smiled with indulgence. Wouldn't that be nice? She paused as she looked at me. Now, let's take care of that lip. In a daze, I sat on the exam table as she cleaned the blood from my mouth and made sure I didn't need stitches before placing a cold pack against my lips. Hold that there, Morgan. I did as she asked, my mind jumping frantically from one thought to another. She turned away and got something out of a drawer, then gently grabbed the arm that wasn't holding the compress. I was so absorbed in my thoughts that I wasn't paying attention to what she was doing. Something sharp jabbed into my upper arm. Ouch! All done. She placed a band-aid over the spot on my arm where she'd poked me. What was that? Your chip. My what? Your chip. Everyone who stays here has to have one. What does it do? I asked with trepidation. Tracks your heart rate, measures your body fat, keeps track of your location. The first two didn't sound so bad, but the idea that they would be tracking me sent a ripple of alarm coursing through my body. How could I escape if they kept track of my every move? Let's check to see if it's working, shall we? She sounded happy and bright, like this was completely normal. She went to her computer and typed something, then clicked on the screen. Staring at the monitor, she nodded. All systems go. I rubbed my arm where she'd inserted the chip and felt a tiny bump. Was there a way I could remove the chip without them knowing? Chapter 2 my gaze probed the exam room as I sought out an instrument of some sort to remove the chip, maybe a scalpel. Nothing was in view. Pain had always scared me, and I questioned if I could actually cut into my own arm, dig around, and pull the chip out. All set, Dr. Bradley said, startling me out of my thoughts. I stared at her, not sure what I was supposed to do. Kiara will be here in a moment to take you to your room. It's getting late, and you must be exhausted. With all the anxiety flooding my body, I was wide awake. Someone knocked at the door. Dr. Bradley opened it, and a girl a little older than me walked in. The first thing I noticed was her hair. Short and spiky, it was dyed a vivid magenta. You must be Morgan. She walked straight to me, a smile on her face. I nodded, still feeling out of place and unsure of myself, not to mention terrified. I set the cold compress on the exam table. I'm Kiara. I'll take you to your room and help you get settled. Her confidence comforted me. She didn't seem to hate me like the enforcers and Tammy did, and she seemed genuinely nice, unlike Dr. Bradley, who had jammed a tracking chip into my arm without my permission. I rubbed my arm in remembrance, and I noticed Kiara watching me, a slight frown on her lips. Grab your shoes, doll. She motioned with her head toward my feet. Obediently, I climbed off the table and put my shoes on my sock-covered feet. 
Kiera turned to Dr. Bradley, who was stationed next to her monitor. Okay if I take her now? Yes, she's all set. Dr. Bradley handed a card to Kiera. Kiera turned back to me. Okay, let's go. Good luck, Morgan, Dr. Bradley said. I looked at her. She seemed earnest. Thanks, I muttered, wondering how many other people she chipped like animals. Kiera opened the door and I followed her into the hall. The enforcer who had brought me in was nowhere to be seen. In fact, I didn't see anyone around. I could run, I thought. But then I remembered the chip in my arm. Kiera must have read my thoughts. Don't even think about it, she said. They'll know right away. What? I tried to act confused. I know what you're thinking. She paused. It's the same thing I thought when I first got here. Her admission shocked me. She seemed perfectly happy to be here, not like someone who would want to leave. Do you have a chip too? She laughed, but there was no humor in the sound. We all do. We reached the end of the hall and she turned right, then stopped in front of a bank of elevators. There were no buttons to call the elevator. Rather, there was just an electronic card reader. Kiera waved a card in front of the reader. The card was attached to a lanyard draped around her neck. A moment later, the elevator doors slid silently open and I followed her inside. Instead of buttons to press, there was a blank screen with a card reader beneath it. After Kiera waved her card in front of the reader, several numbers appeared on the screen, but the numbers seemed random. Three, four, six, eight, nine. She tapped the number six and the elevator door slid closed. Why are some numbers missing? I asked. She reached into her pocket and held out the card Dr. Bradley had given her. Your card will allow you to access the floors where you need to go, but none of the others. Even though I have more freedom than you, I'm still limited to what floors I can access. I took the card from her and examined it. Both sides were completely blank, just an unbroken canvas of blue. Tomorrow they'll put your picture on it. I nodded, then slipped the card into my back pocket. The elevator came to a gradual stop and the doors opened to reveal a small foyer. To the left and right were hallways with doors every ten feet or so. It reminded me of a hotel, except I'd never been in a hotel where they checked you in under armed guard and then jammed a computer chip into your arm before they let you visit. You'll be staying in room seven, Kiera said as she took the hallway on the right. She stopped in front of a door with a number seven painted on it and knocked three times before opening the door. Why is she knocking, I thought. Is someone already inside? Alex, are you in there? She paused, then walked into the darkened room. No one answered. She flipped on a light. The room looked very similar to the pictures my mom had shown me of a college dorm room. She'd been trying to motivate me to take some college prep classes, and I guess she'd thought if she showed me the fun times I could have at college, I would agree to take the classes. It had looked kind of fun in the pictures, but now that I stood in this room, all I wanted was to go home to my own room. I didn't even mind sharing with Amy. That will be your bed. Kiera pointed to a neatly made bed with a thin blanket and lumpy pillow. And you'll use that desk in that closet. She paused. Your roommate is Alex, Alexandra. She'll probably be back soon. I stared at the empty closet. I don't have any clothes with me. Your caseworker will ask your family to bring some things for you. My heart lifted at the thought of seeing my mom, and I spun around, smiling. When can I see my mom? Kiera frowned. You won't be able to see your family. Keen disappointment shot through me. Why not? Those are the rules. Frustration pushed my thoughts out of my mouth. This whole thing is ridiculous, you know. I haven't done anything wrong. I can't believe I'm even here. Kiera's face softened. I know exactly how you feel, Morgan, but you have to accept what's happened. Why? Why should I accept it? Why do you accept it? Kiera glanced over her shoulder as if she expected someone to be listening. For all I knew, people were listening to every word we spoke. Look, I'd rather be at home too, okay? But I'm serving my time just like you're going to be. It's better to just make the best of it. I looked at her more closely. She was very slender. 
Had she committed some crime, too? She certainly didn't look like she needed to lose any weight. Why are you here? I asked her. Pressing her lips together, she shook her head. This isn't about me. What you need to focus on is following your regimen, following the rules, and doing your time. My regimen? What regimen? What are the rules? Your orientation is tomorrow. You'll meet with your caseworker, and he'll go over all of that with you. Now, let me show you where the bathroom is, and then I'll let you get settled. She led me out of the room and down the hall to a community bathroom. The boys are on a different floor, so it's just girls that use this bathroom. There are three other bathrooms like this on this floor, but this is the one you'll use. She opened a drawer and took out a small toiletry bag. She opened it to reveal a new toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, soap, comb, and shampoo. This is complimentary, but if you need more, it will come out of your budget. My budget? She sighed. Your caseworker will explain, but the short version is that you'll be assigned a work assignment, and some of the money you earn will cover the cost of supplies. In other words, these first supplies are free, but when you need more, you'll have to pay for them, so don't waste anything. Okay, I murmured, feeling uncomfortable with all the rules I didn't yet know. I like to know what to expect, and right now I felt very much in the dark. You can keep your personal items in here if you want, Kiera added, but most people like to keep them in their room. She closed the toiletry bag and handed it to me. Then she opened a cupboard, which had two stacks of neatly folded thin white towels. She took one from the top of a stack and handed it to me. After you shower, make sure to hang on to your towel. You only get a fresh one on Mondays. She paused. Any questions? I actually had a lot of questions, but I knew she wouldn't be able to answer them, so I shook my head. Okay, let's go back to your room and see if Alex is there yet. This time when Kiera knocked, a voice called from inside, Just a minute! Then the door opened and a girl about my age stood in the doorway. Hi, Kiera! Her gaze flicked to me before settling back on Kiera. Alex, this is your new roommate. Her name's Morgan. A smile briefly lifted the corners of her mouth. Hi. She wore sweats and a tank top, and her face was flushed as if she just finished working out. Hey, I replied. Kiera turned to me. Stick with Alex, and someone will come and get you after breakfast so you can meet with your caseworker. She turned to Alex. See ya. Then she walked down the hall toward the elevators. As I watched her go, panic swelled within me. I was just starting to get used to Kiera and her funky hair and confident manner. Now she was leaving me with a complete stranger who would be sharing my living space. Chapter 3 Are you coming in or what? Alex stood in the doorway watching me watch Kiera disappear down the hall. I turned toward her. Yeah. She held the door open and I walked in, my toiletry bag and towel in my hands. I set them on a shelf in my closet and frowned at the pathetic emptiness of the space. I hoped Mom would be able to bring some of my things soon. I wondered if there was any way for me to see her. Let's get one thing straight right away, Alex said. I spun around to look at my new roommate, surprised at the hostility in her voice. I'm set to leave this hell hole in three weeks and I don't want anything to screw that up. My gaze traveled up and down her body. She looked like she was in great shape. I wondered what she'd look like when she'd first arrived. Yes, I know I look good now. She'd obviously noticed me looking at her. i just reached my goal weight, and once I've maintained that weight for three weeks, I'm out of here. I don't understand how I could screw that up for you. I know you just got here, and you haven't heard all the crap rules yet, but here's a newsflash. If you mess up, it's on me too. What do you mean? What does it sound like? They treat roommates like they're the same person, if you're late for work, our room gets docked, not just you. If you skip a workout, it goes against me too. Get it? But why? Why do you think? So that we'll make sure no one slacks. No one wants to be held accountable for someone else's mistakes. They figure one roommate will push the other to do what they're supposed to so that the innocent roommate doesn't get punished for the slacker being stupid. Oh, I said, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, except it sucks for people like me. They always put the newbies with someone who's going to be leaving soon so that the short-timer will make sure the newbie follows the rules. Even though I felt bad for her, I really didn't give a rat's behind if she had to stay there for the rest of her life. 
The only thing I cared about was getting out of there and getting back to the tunnel, and then if all went as hoped, back to my real life. You're not going to cause me any trouble, are you? She asked. Why do you ask that? Was she able to read my mind somehow? She gestured to my face. You tried to run, didn't you? I touched my swollen lip and flinched. It was still very tender. There's no point in trying to run now that they've chipped you. My hand moved from my mouth to the tiny lump in my arm and I frowned. She nodded. It sucks. I know. The hostility in her voice had lessened. How long have you been here? Four months, one week, and three days. She grinned. Not that I'm counting. Glad she was being more friendly, I smiled back. I didn't know if I could take having a roommate who hated me. Even though I planned to escape in time to reach the tunnel, I was realistic enough to know it might take a little time and it would be useful to have someone on my side who knew the ropes. Maybe she could help me speed up the learning curve so that I could find a way to escape before it was too late. I'm beat, she said. Breakfast is at seven, so if you want to shower beforehand, you should plan to get up early. I glanced at the clothes I wore. I don't have any pajamas or clean clothes. Her eyebrows went up. That sucks. I stared at her. I didn't know what I'd expected her to say, but that wasn't it. Look, I can go find Kiera and see if she can find you loners. Loners weren't my first choice, but I didn't know what else I could do. Thanks. Alex sighed. I'll be right back. Five minutes later, she came back. Kiera was right behind her and had some clothes in her hands. Sorry, Morgan, Kiera said. I should have told you I was getting you something to wear until your family brings you clothes from home. She handed me the clothes. Thanks. See you in the morning. She smiled and left. I'm going to get ready for bed, Alex said. I suggest you do the same. A short time later, Alex and I were in our beds. After changing into a clean pair of pajamas and freshening up, I felt a little better. What time do you get up? I asked. 5.30. I like to beat the rush to the showers. Oh, I hated getting up early. She told me good night, clearly not interested in any conversation. I closed my eyes but had trouble falling asleep as I replayed the events of the evening. The phone call from Anne warning me about the enforcers coming, the knock on the door. My terror when Dimples and Hanson had barged right into my house then tasered me and dragged me away. And of course my attempt to escape when we'd arrived here when I'd shoved my knee into Hanson's groin and run but had been body slammed by Dimples. It all seemed like a terrible nightmare. But as I reached up and touched my tender face and then the lump in my arm, it was all too real. What was my family doing? Were they worried about me? What about Dad? Was he sleeping in a room like this? Was it possible he was in this fat center? Maybe I would be able to see him. The thought brightened me, and I was finally able to drift off to sleep. The next morning, I woke to the sound of Alex blow-drying her hair. What time is it? I asked over the sound of the hairdryer. 6.20. You should get up soon. We don't want to be late for breakfast. I lay in bed a few more minutes, calculating how long it would take me to get ready, then decided I didn't want to cut it too close on my first day. The last thing I needed was to anger Alex by making us late for breakfast. Sighing, I threw back the blankets and forced myself to get up. I trudged over to the closet and dug through the clothes Kiera had given me. I found a package of new underwear and pulled out a pair, glad at least those weren't loners. I shook my head at the ridiculousness of this whole situation as I grabbed a clean shirt, a pair of sweats, and my toiletry bag and towel. As soon as I opened the door to the hallway, I saw several girls hurrying toward the bathroom. I followed them down the hall and into the large space and stopped at the back of the line. There were two girls ahead of me, waiting to use the row of four shower stalls. As I waited, I wondered how many girls were on our floor. Five minutes later, I was at the front of the line and no one was behind me. A few minutes after that, one of the shower stalls opened and a girl walked out. Glad it was my turn, I took one step toward it but stopped when a hand grabbed my shoulder. I turned to see who was holding me back and saw two girls glaring at me. New girl goes last, the girl gripping my shoulder said. My gaze went from her face to the face of the girl next to her. Both looked mean and both were bigger than me. Fine, I muttered as I got in line behind them. Furious that I would have to wait longer, I glanced at the clock nailed to the wall. I had half an hour before breakfast, and Alex had made it clear that we shouldn't be late. I watched as shower stalls opened, and both girls in front of me were able to take their turn. Five minutes later, I was able to take my turn. My face ached as I gently washed it, 
and as I ran my tongue over my lip I felt the swelling there. A short time later I dried off with a towel, which was rough and scratchy, then dressed and hurried back to my room. About time, Alex said, frowning. There was a line. I wasn't about to tell her that a couple of girls had bullied me, pushing me behind schedule. I wondered how long I'd be thought of as the new girl. Let's get going, Alex said. But I haven't done my hair. I hung the towel on a hook in the closet then set my pajamas and toiletry bag on the shelf. What exactly were you planning on doing with it? Uh, drying it? Anger at being bossed around filled my voice. Using? Alex asked. My anger deflated as I realized I had nothing but a comb, compliments of my toiletry bag. Could I use your hair dryer? Alex sighed. I'd let you if there was more time, but we need to get going. I turned my back to her and rolled my eyes, then pulled the comb out of my bag. Can I at least comb my hair? If you hurry. The comb caught on the tangles, but I worked it through. I turned to face her. What's the big deal about being late for breakfast anyway? I just don't like to be late, okay? I finished untangling my hair and set the comb aside. I'm ready as I'll ever be. Good, she said. Let's go. She paused at the door, a folded sheet of paper in her hand. Don't forget your card. I grabbed the card, which I had left on the closet shelf, and slid it into the pocket of the sweats I was borrowing, then followed her out of our room and toward the elevator. She waved her card in front of the card reader. A moment later, the elevator doors opened. You do it, she said, motioning to the card reader. I pulled the card out of my pocket and waved it in front of the reader inside the elevator. The number four appeared on the touchscreen, and since there was no other option, I tapped it, and the elevator doors slid shut. The elevator moved downward, and a moment later the doors opened to reveal a large cafeteria. Chapter 4 This cafeteria reminded me of the one at school, except for the machine where everyone seemed to be stopping and waving their cards, as well as depositing sheets of paper before picking up a tray and sliding it along the rail in front of the counter. Workers behind the counter consulted a computer monitor before handing food-filled plates or bowls to each person, pushing their trays along. Another thing that was different from school was the variety of sizes of the people. This was the first time since I'd been in this world that I'd seen people who were a size other than skinny. Somehow it made me feel more at home. One thing that was the same as school was the age of the people in line. They all looked like they were high school age. I wondered if they had different facilities for different age groups. If that was the case, then Dad wouldn't be here. Disappointment washed over me as any hope that I might see him was swept away. Alex gently pushed me out of the elevator and toward the line of people who were waving their cards in front of the machine. As we approached, I turned to her. What does that machine do? Everyone has a list of foods they're allowed to eat, she said. Your card will tell the workers what you can have. Oh. I glanced at the workers. How can they keep track of who is who? Your picture will be on their monitor. But they haven't taken my picture yet. She sighed as we stepped closer to the machine. Then you'll be the one without a picture. I didn't answer. Alex pointed to the machine. Go ahead. I waved my card in front of the reader and the machine beeped. She did the same, then slid her folded sheet of paper into a slot. What's that? I asked. My food journal. You have to turn it in each morning. Oh. I shuffled along, and when I got to the stack of green trays, I grabbed one, along with a package containing a napkin and some sort of plastic utensil, and glided the tray along the rails like everyone else was doing. A woman pushed a bowl of oatmeal toward me, and I set it on my tray. I hated oatmeal, and this looked especially unappetizing. A big lump of tan mush with no brown sugar mixed in, and I highly doubted they had brown sugar available. Another woman pushed a bowl of fruit toward me, I wasn't sure if it was fresh or canned, but at least it would be edible. She also handed me one power bar. I set the bowl of fruit and the power bar next to the oatmeal on my tray and trudged down the line. I would have preferred a plate of bacon and eggs and a large mug of hot cocoa with a large dollop of whipped cream on top. The thought made my mouth water. As we reached the end of the counter, I saw bottles of skim milk and sugar-free juices nestled in a tray of ice. Frowning, I took some sugar-free orange juice and set it on my tray. Follow me, Alex said, as she stepped away from the counter and wound her way through the tables. At least it wasn't like my first day at a new school where I didn't know anyone. I had Alex to keep me company. We approached a round table with six chairs. 
Half of them were filled with teenagers who looked to be my age. The other three were empty. Alex slid into a chair next to a boy with short black hair and piercing gray-green eyes. I noticed his eyes because they were locked on me as I set my tray down and sat in the chair next to Alex. "'Who are you?' he asked. The abruptness of his question startled me, and for a moment I couldn't find my voice. "'She's my new roomie,' Alex applied, much to my relief. "'Morgan.' He grinned at me. "'Tried running, huh?' My face flamed red as I realized that thanks to my swollen lip and bruised face, every single person in this room would know I tried to run, and failed, obviously, since I was here. I concentrated on opening the plastic packaging that held my napkin and utensil, but I could feel the eyes of everyone at the table lasered in on me. "'Don't be embarrassed, Morgan,' the boy said. "'It's not like you're the only one who's tried to escape this place.' I looked up suddenly. "'Did you?' He laughed and looked at Alex. She speaks. Then he turned back to me, all traces of humor gone. All the time. Stop it, Billy, Alex said. You're going to give her the wrong idea. Alex glanced at me, then took a bite of her poached egg. I dug the utensil out of the package and frowned. A spork. I guess it didn't matter what universe you were in, the spork was a staple. Ignoring the oatmeal, I stabbed a piece of sliced peach, but the spork didn't pierce it very far, and I wasn't able to pick it up. "'You might have to use your hands,' Billy said with a grin. I ignored him and instead opened the juice and took a sip. It wasn't too bad. My stomach rumbled, and I decided to try the oatmeal. Scooping up a small bite, I placed it in my mouth. It didn't taste bad, but that was because it had no flavor at all. I had a few more bites, but the texture was like glue.' Next time you should get the milk, Billy said. Then you can mix it with the oatmeal. That really helps to get it down. Thanks, I muttered. I glanced at the food on the plates of the other kids at my table and saw that no one else had such drab food as me. I looked at one of the girls. How did you manage to get an omelet? My mouth watered as I looked at it. Don't get too excited, she said. It's an egg white omelet. It looks better than this. I pointed to the tan mush in my bowl. When you're new, she said, that's what you get until they determine what you're allowed to eat. I nodded. What did you say your name was? Cassidy. She smiled. How long have you been here? Six weeks. When do you get to leave? Hopefully in two more months. Two months? How could she sound so casual about it, like it was perfectly normal? My gaze shifted to Billy. He didn't look fat at all. In fact, he looked underweight. What about you? What about me? Alex smirked. Billy's not going anywhere, she looked over at him, at least not for a while. I wondered what that meant, but after seeing the way his lips flattened like it was a subject he didn't want discussed, I decided it would be best to ask Alex later. I attempted to eat my fruit with a spork again. This time I managed to get a piece of banana. Once that was gone, and I failed again with a peach, my hunger got the better of me, and I picked up the fruit with my fingers and ate it that way. I glanced in Billy's direction, somehow knowing he would be watching me. Sure enough, he watched my struggles with undisguised humor. I ignored him and finished my fruit, then ate my power bar. A few minutes later, Kira came to our table. Everyone seemed to know her. I'm actually here to get Morgan, she said to the group. Then she looked at me. It's time to meet with your caseworker. Chapter 5 as I followed her out of the cafeteria, I scraped my hands through my hair. I didn't know why I was so nervous to meet him, but I was. I'd never had a caseworker before. It almost felt like he was my parole officer or something. After all, I had committed a crime. How are things going? Kiara asked as we waited for the elevator. Okay, I guess. I paused. Have you talked to my mom yet? Is she coming? You'll have to talk to your caseworker about that. Softly sighing, I didn't reply. We stepped into the elevator, and she waved her card in front of the reader, then pressed the button for the second floor. A moment later, we exited, and I followed her into a reception area. "'Morgan Campbell,' she said to a muscular man sitting behind a desk. His uniform marked him as an enforcer, and seeing him made my face throb painfully, memory as of being tackled by another enforcer fresh in my mind. "'I'll take it from here,' he said to Kiera. She turned to me. I'll see you later, Morgan. You're leaving? Panicked at being left alone with an enforcer, one who could be friends with Hanson and Dimples, I almost begged Kiara to stay, but kept my dignity. I have other things I need to do, she said. You'll be fine. I doubted that, but there was nothing I could do about it. 
I watched her leave, then turned to the enforcer who stared at me. I need to take your picture for your card. He held out his hand. I gave him my card, my hand shaking. He took the card without comment and stuck it in a slot on the camera. Stand over there. He pointed to a large X painted on the floor. I stood where directed, but couldn't bring myself to smile. He pressed a button on the camera. A moment later, the camera beeped, and he pulled the card out and handed it to me. It was the worst picture I had ever had taken. Besides the fact that I wasn't smiling, my lip was swollen and half my face was puffy. Oh well, at least it wouldn't be going in a yearbook. I shoved the card in the pocket of my sweats. Have a seat. Mr. Madsen will be with you shortly. I sat on one of the chairs and saw a stack of magazines piled on the table next to me. I dug through them, but nothing looked interesting. They were either exercise magazines or magazines about eating healthy. Instead, I leaned my head back and stared at the ceiling, pretending the enforcer wasn't sitting five feet away from me. You must be Morgan! Jerking my head up, I saw a thin man with a balding head approaching. He didn't look like he was much taller than me. I'm Mr. Madsen. He stopped next to my chair. Welcome to Camp Willamoss. Camp Willamoss? He said it like it was a summer camp of some kind, like people came here by choice. Let's go talk in my office. He turned and walked down the hallway. I followed him into his office and sat in the chair he offered me. He pulled up a chair across from mine so that our knees were only about a foot apart. How are things going for you, Morgan? Are you getting settled in okay? His niceness sort of creeped me out. Did he realize that his employers had jammed a tracking chip in my arm? Was he okay with that? I decided to play along. I'm doing okay. Good, good. I'm glad to hear that. He stared at me a moment. Now that you're at Camp Willowmoss, it's my responsibility to go over the rules with you and to discuss your personal goals. When do you think I'll be able to see my mom? I blurted out. I didn't care about rules or my personal goals. I just wanted to get out of there and be with my family again, preferably my family in the world I had come from. But seeing the mom in this world would be a good start. Seeing your family is a privilege, one that you can earn. What? Sharp disappointment stabbed at me. He ignored my outburst. Let's talk about your personal goals. What would you like to accomplish while you're here, Morgan? He smiled in a fake sort of way. I'd like to wipe that smug grin off your face for starters, I thought, and then get as far away from this place as I can. I plastered a fake smile of my own onto my mouth, at least as best as I could with a fat lip. I'd like to develop healthier eating habits and get into a better workout routine so that I can reach my goal weight and then maintain it. You know, a healthy me is a healthy world. His creepy fake smile got bigger. Very good, Morgan. He grabbed a notepad and pen off of his desk and wrote something down, presumably my lofty goals, although I couldn't tell for sure as he had crossed his legs and set the notepad on his knee, which tilted the notepad out of my view. What do you think you should do today to help you reach those goals? He poised the pen over the notepad, awaiting my response. I had a healthy breakfast already, so I guess I need to spend some time working out. I smiled a less phony smile, pleased with myself for coming up with answers I was sure he wanted to hear. That's right. He wrote something down. How much time do you plan to spend on exercising each day? I don't know. I guess about an hour? He nodded. Close. We require two hours per day. Two hours? Was he serious? I could see by his face that he was. How much weight am I supposed to lose anyway? How much weight do you think you should lose, Morgan? I didn't like the way he kept saying my name, like he actually knew me. Pushing aside the irritation, I thought about how much weight Dr. Bradley had said I needed to lose. Her number seemed high to me, so I made up my own. I guess about ten pounds? His eyebrows went up, but he didn't say anything, so I figured he knew what Dr. Bradley had said. Twenty pounds? I corrected. A smile slowly curved the corners of his mouth. Yes, at least. At least? I'd never been one to diet and exercise. This was going to be hard. Unless I could escape sooner rather than later. He sat silently, apparently waiting for me to say something. Okay, right, I said. Twenty pounds. He nodded and wrote on his notepad, then looked back at me. Now, let's discuss the rules. Here we go. He grabbed a sheet of paper from the top of his desk. I'll give this to you when you leave so you can remember them. But let's go over the rules together. Okay. How bad could they be? First, 
You're allowed to write letters to your family, but there are no phone calls and no visitors. But you said I could earn a visit. We'll get to that. Second, you are required to keep a journal of all the food you eat. It will be checked daily against the database the cafeteria keeps. If a friend gives you any of their food, be sure to write it down. You can be sure the friend will make a note of it in their journal, as should you if you give any food away. I felt suddenly faint and thought, I'm going to starve in here. You'll turn in the food journal at breakfast each morning. You may have noticed the others doing that this morning. I nodded. When you get back to your room, you'll find a stack of journal pages that you can fill out each day. He paused. Third, you must exercise a specified number of hours assigned to you. Your chip monitors your location, as well as your heart rate, so it is evident if you're exercising or not. This really is hell, I thought. Now I understood why Alex was so upset at the idea of me doing something that would mess up when she could leave. How many hours am I supposed to exercise each day? Two hours, just like we talked about, but you can break it up over two sessions or do it all in one. We leave that up to you. Oh, how very thoughtful, I wanted to say, but bit my inner lip to keep my sarcasm at bay. He looked back at the paper. Next, you must weigh yourself once each day. He looked at me. We leave it up to you when you want to do your weigh-in. Most people like to do it first thing in the morning. You may have noticed the scale in the bathroom. Actually, I hadn't, but whatever. You will be assigned a job, and you must spend six hours per day working. This is to help defray the cost of housing you. Why don't you just let me leave, I wanted to ask. That would save even more money. What's my job going to be, I asked instead. For now, you'll be assigned cleaning duties. Once you've proven yourself there, you can apply for one of the more desirable jobs. Isn't that just perfect? Not only will I be starving and forced to exercise, I'll also have to clean up after everyone. Nice. Since you're a minor, you're required to attend two hours of classes each day, as well as get all of your class assignments done. On top of everything else, I had to go to school? How am I supposed to fit everything in? He looked up in surprise. I'm sure you'll manage. My facade of cooperation was beginning to slip. Anything else? His creepy fake smile is back. We're nearly done. He looked at the paper in his hands. Absolutely no romantic relationships allowed. Like I'd have time for that, I thought with a frown. He lifted his gaze from the paper and looked at me, his fake smile gone. Since you've also been charged with a crime, you're required to attend nightly group counseling sessions so that you can be re-educated. Re-educated? What did that even mean? And finally, Morgan, your whereabouts will be monitored at all times, so make sure you're always where you're supposed to be. He held out the paper, and I reluctantly took it. Glancing at the long list of rules, I scowled, then folded the sheet of paper and put it in my pocket. You said we'd talk about how I could get to see my family? I didn't have to fake the pitiful expression on my face. I really was desperate to see my mom. He smiled slightly. Yes, well... After two weeks, if you've followed all the rules, we'll make an appointment for you to see your family. Two weeks? I hadn't meant that to sound like I was whining, but I knew that's how it came out. I mean, is there any way I can arrange to see them sooner? Can I just see my mom? His lips pressed together and he shook his head. That is the rule. Do you think you'll be able to earn the privilege of seeing your family? To think I'd been so anxious to run away from them that I'd ended up here. Now I was desperate to see them. How was that for irony? I sighed and nodded. Yes. Good. He set his notepad and pen on his desk, then turned back to me. Give me a minute to check on some things, and then someone will come and get you and help you get started on your job. He went around to the front of his desk and sat in front of his computer. I couldn't see what he was doing, so I sat in my chair and felt sorry for myself. After several minutes of typing and clicking, he turned his attention back to me. I'm printing out your schedule so that you'll know where to be at what time. The printer spit out a sheet of paper, and he handed it to me, then sat in the chair near me. I read over the schedule I was expected to follow. Daily schedule for Morgan Campbell, it said. 7 to 7.30, breakfast. 7.30 to 11, work assignment. 11 to 12, exercise or work on homework. 12 to 12.30, lunch. 12.30 to 3, work assignment. 3 to 5, classes, 5 to 5.30, dinner, 5.30 to 8, exercise or work on homework, 8 to 9, meet with counseling group, 9 to 10, exercise or work on homework, 10, lights out. 
The first thing I thought as I finished reading my schedule was that my best chance to escape would be during my work assignment hours or when I was supposed to be working on homework. Maybe during my work assignment I would have minimal supervision. Your mother dropped off some clothes for you while you were at breakfast. I gasped. She was here? Yes. We told her to come between 7 and 7.30 this morning, which she did. They did that on purpose. Had her come when I was least expecting it so that I would have no chance of seeing her. Fury blossomed within me as I thought about their stupid rules and my stupid schedule and the stupid reasons why I was even there. Angry words pushed against my lips, but I knew this was not the time to speak them. I pinched my leg as a distraction to force myself to calm down. Arranging a pleasant smile on my face, I said, It will be nice to have some of my own clothes to wear. I amazed myself with how civil I sounded. I carefully folded my schedule and put it in my pocket with a list of rules. Yes, I'm sure it will. Mr. Madsen stood. I'll walk you to the waiting area where someone will come and get you. I followed him out of his office, then down the hall to the waiting area where the enforcer was working behind the desk. Have a seat, Morgan, Mr. Madsen said. Though I was weary of being told what to do, I sat. We'll meet again in a week to discuss your progress. I can hardly wait, I thought. If you have any problems or questions, tell your work supervisor. I had no idea who that was, but knew I would find out soon enough. I nodded, and he turned away and went back toward his office. While I waited for someone to come and get me, I took the rules and my schedule out of my pocket and read them again. Though I planned on getting out of here as soon as I figured out a way, it would be foolish to break the rules. Maybe if I was a model whatever it was we were called here, guest, prisoner, inmate, camper, if I followed the rules to the letter, then my chances of escaping would be better. The door to the waiting area opened and Kiara walked in. Seeing her familiar spiky magenta hair and friendly face made me feel better. How long would it take to get a job like hers? One where I could go all over the place, by myself. Probably a lot longer than I planned on being around. Hi, Morgan. Hey. I tucked the papers back in my pocket and stood. Ready to get started on your work assignment? I dreaded this job. Six hours a day cleaning. It was hard enough for me to spend an hour every couple of weeks cleaning my bedroom. This would be pure torture. Ready as I'll ever be. Great, come with me. Chapter 6 We took the elevator to the sixth floor, my floor. At first your cleaning assignment will be on your own floor, Kiara said as she led me down the hall. In a week or so, if your supervisor feels you're ready, you'll be assigned to clean other floors. Who is my supervisor? We're on our way to meet him now. No one seemed to be around. Is everyone else doing their work assignments right now, too? Not everyone. The assignments are spread throughout the day and evening so that all the jobs are covered. Some people might be in class right now. Others might be working out. It just depends on their assigned schedule. We passed the door to my room, and I glanced at it, wondering what items Mom had brought. Kiera led me past my bathroom, and at the end of the hall, we turned left down another hall. As we walked past all the doors in this hallway, I realized there were a lot more people on this floor than I thought. Kiera stopped in front of an open door, which led to a windowless room a little smaller than the room I shared with Alex. Tucked in a corner was a small desk. One of the walls was taken up by shelves filled with toilet paper, soap, toothpaste, and other toiletries. Another wall had shelves filled with neatly folded white towels. A dark-haired man sat at the desk, hunched over a tablet computer, tapping on the screen. Kyle, Kiara said, I've got a new worker for you. Kyle looked up from his tablet. Hey, Kiara. Then he looked me over. I regretted that I didn't look better because he was really cute. I figured he was in his late twenties, which I knew was a little old for me, but did I mention he was really cute? Suddenly, I was looking forward to my work assignment. He walked over to us and looked at Kiara. Thanks for bringing her. We can use the help. No problem. I'll see you around. See ya, he said. Kiara left but this time I was okay with it. So Morgan, welcome to our little cleaning crew. I'm sure you'll do great. Duh, I thought. Cleaning wasn't hard, just boring. As you may know, there are four bathrooms on this floor. I vaguely remembered Kiara mentioning that the night before, but in any case, I had a feeling I'd get familiar with them soon. Each one has four showers, four toilet stalls, and four sinks. You'll be responsible to clean all of them. That's sixteen toilets, showers, and sinks. She can do math, he said to the ceiling. I was beginning to revise my earlier assessment that I might like this job. 
I'm the only one who works on this floor? For now, yes. We had another girl, but she was promoted to kitchen duty. Kitchen duty was a promotion? This was really going to suck. Don't worry. Chances are that we'll have someone new come in this week. Then you'll have help. Of course someone new would be coming. They probably hauled in new campers all the time. I'm responsible for all four floors of residence, Kyle continued, so you'll be on your own, more or less. I will be checking up on you, though. What if I have a question and I can't find you? Look, he said, this job isn't rocket science. If you have a question, save it for when you see me and ask it then. In the meantime, scrub. It's not that hard. His condescending attitude rubbed me the wrong way. He was treating me like I was a lowlife, like I didn't deserve to be treated with respect. Then I remembered that even though they tried to pretty up the name of this place by calling it Camp Willamoss, in reality, I was a prisoner here, a criminal, at least in their eyes. I had no rights and apparently no expectation of being treated with respect. He must have taken my silence to be agreement because he turned away from me and picked up a sheet of paper from the desk. Here are the items you are expected to complete. I took the paper he held out but didn't read it. I would have plenty of time to get acquainted with it. All the supplies you need are in this room. Follow the instructions on the paper and you'll do fine. Okay, I managed to say, although what I really wanted to do was wad up the paper and throw it at him. I understand you'll be working from 7.30 to 11 each morning and then from 12.30 to 3 each afternoon. If you say so. That's what your schedule says, Morgan. You might want to get familiar with it. The schedule doesn't say which days I have off. He laughed. Why would you think you get a day off? The work needs to be done every day. You're only working six hours a day. I was growing to hate Kyle more and more as each second passed. Then I realized he didn't make the rules, but he didn't have to enjoy them so much. You're already behind for today, so you'd better get started. If I'm not here in the supply room, your card will allow you to come in to get what you need. I looked at the sheet of paper he'd given me to see what I should do first. Collect all used towels and place them in the large bin by the elevator, I read. Do this first, so that the laundry crew can get started. Replenish the supply of towels in each bathroom. I looked at Kyle. I thought we only got fresh towels on Mondays. It's a rotating schedule, so you might be Mondays, but the other bathrooms are other days of the week. He paused. Since you weren't here yet, I already collected the towels for today. I nodded and continued reading. Clean all mirrors. Wipe down the countertops. Disinfect the sinks. Clean the toilets inside and out. Scrub down the showers, fill toilet paper holders, fill soap dispensers, mop bathroom floors, vacuum hallways, and foyer. There's a cart you can take with you, he said, to hold the supplies you need. He pointed to a wheeled cart parked next to the supply shelf. I suggest you complete an entire bathroom before moving on to the next one. As I considered all the work I had to get done, I felt a bit panicky like I wouldn't be able to get it done to his satisfaction, which would mean I would be stuck cleaning the bathrooms forever. What if I run out of time and can't get everything done, I asked. His expression softened slightly. Do the best you can. We'll see how it goes today, but I do expect you to get most of it done. Normally each floor has two people assigned to it, so I'll cut you a little slack, but don't take advantage of it. How many girls are on this floor? We have room for forty, but right now there are thirty-six. Oh. I'll be here for a bit while you get started. I'll check on you before I go to another floor. I nodded, then walked over to the cart. It seemed to be fully stocked, so I wheeled it out and headed down the hall to the nearest bathroom. As I worked, I wondered if there was any way I could take advantage of the fact that I would be on my own most of the time. Once Kaya left, I'd have to check out the supply room and see if there was something I could use to help me escape. I had nearly finished the first bathroom and was deep in thought as I scrubbed one of the shower stalls when Kyle walked in, startling me. It's looking good in here. Nice job. His praise lifted my spirits, even though what I was doing was difficult to mess up. Make sure to keep an eye on the clock. He motioned with his head toward the clock on the wall. At eleven, you're supposed to work on homework or go do a workout. It's up to you. I don't even know where I'm supposed to go to work out. Not that I wanted to. My arm muscles were already sore from cleaning. Wasn't that enough of a workout? The gym's on the third floor. Everything you need is there. Okay. I'll see you after lunch. The mention of lunch made me realize how hungry I was. Breakfast hadn't really filled me, and all of this scrubbing wasn't helping. I watched him leave and wondered if they'd let you have snacks here. I doubted it. 
sighing, I got back to work and tried to ignore the gnawing in my stomach. Chapter 7 When eleven o'clock finally rolled around, I wheeled the cart to the supply room. The door was locked, and I had to use my key card to get in. Once inside, I glanced around and noticed a security camera in the ceiling. It would be difficult to search knowing that someone could be watching me. Pretending to replenish my supply of toilet paper, I checked the other shelves to see what I could find. There was nothing that would be helpful in an escape. I glanced at Kyle's desk. There was no computer, and he had taken his tablet with him. There was no way to communicate with the outside world. The outside world! I remembered that Mom had brought some things for me. I left the supply room and hurried to my room. Using my card, I unlocked the door and went inside. Piled on my bed were the items Mom had brought. I scooped them up, then pressed them to my face, breathing in the smells of home. As I thought about home and how much I missed it, my heart ached and tears filled my eyes. I went through each item, looking to see if Mom had put anything in there for me, but there was nothing but the clothes and a pair of sneakers. I figured she didn't have time to do any more than gather my things and drop them off. Plus, I was certain the people at Camp Willamoss inspected any items families brought for the campers. After folding each item, I placed them on the shelves in the closet, happy to have my own clothes to wear. Suddenly I felt the need to write Mom a letter. I didn't have any paper of my own, so I went to Alex's desk and stood in front of it. I didn't really feel comfortable digging through her things, but what else could I do? I found notebook paper and a pencil in the first drawer I looked in. Taking them with me to my bed, I set the paper on my leg and began writing. Dear Mom, I'm so sorry for running away. After everything that's happened, I realize now how much you guys mean to me. I miss you so much, and I want to be home with you guys so bad. I just need help in figuring out how to get out of here. If there's anything you can do to help me, I'm begging you to do it. Love, Morgan. I reread what I had written and frowned. This letter was meant for my mom in the other world, not for my mom here. I hadn't run away from home in this world. I had just made a few mistakes that I hadn't even known were mistakes, until I got dragged off to Camp Willamoss. I tore the paper into tiny pieces, put the pencil back in Alex's drawer, then went to the bathroom and flushed the letter down the toilet. It took three flushes before it all went down. Back in my room, I lay on my bed and closed my eyes, trying to rest a bit before lunch and work. I woke up abruptly and looked at the clock on Alex's dresser. It was five minutes past twelve. I was late for lunch. I hurried to the elevator and waved my card in front of the reader and waited for the elevator to arrive. Five minutes later, I was sliding my tray along the rails, wondering what I was allowed to eat. Famished after scrubbing bathrooms for hours that morning, I really hoped it would be something filling. I still had two and a half hours of work to do after lunch, and I needed something to give me energy. When the lady behind the counter handed me my food, I was sharply disappointed. A slab of liver, brown rice, canned vegetables, and another power bar. I wondered if the power bars were served with every meal. At the end of the row, I chose a container of skim milk, then turned toward the room, searching for Alex. "'Over here, Morgan!' Alex called out, waving to me from the table where we'd had breakfast. Relieved to have someone to eat with, I wound my way through the tables— when I reached her, I saw the same group of people who had been there that morning. There was an empty seat next to Billy. "'Looks like you survived your first morning,' he said as he reached over to the chair next to him and pulled it out for me. I set my tray on the table and sat down. "'Barely. I don't think my back has ever been so sore.' "'We've all been there,' Alex said with a smile. "'What do you guys do for your work assignments?' I asked. "'I work in the laundry,' one of the girls who had been there that morning said. I remembered her name was Cassidy.' I was promoted to kitchen duty a couple of weeks ago, the other girl said. I got to help prepare that lovely meal you're eating now. She paused. I'm Piper, by the way. I'm Morgan. I paused as I opened the utensil package and found a plastic knife and fork. What's your job, Alex? I work in the gym. I have to make sure there are clean towels available, stuff like that. I imagined doing that job and hated my job even more. What about you, Billy? I work outside, pull weeds, crap like that. Oh, that seemed like a good job for someone like me, someone who wanted a way to escape. How did you get that job? Why, do you think it would be better than scrubbing toilets? I've always liked working in the yard, I lied. In all reality, I hated pulling weeds. It made my back ache and my hands get dirty. But if it would help me get out of this place, it would be worth it. Huh, well, you can request a job, 
but there's no guarantee you'll get it, especially if someone who's been here longer is already waiting. That figured. How do I request it? You can talk to your supervisor and see if he'll put in the request for you. You have to get a reference from him anyway. No one wants to take on a slacker. Glad I'd worked hard that morning, I decided even though I hated my job, I would work my hardest to impress Kyle. Then he would have to give me a good reference. As I ate my lunch, forcing down the liver, I half listened to the others chatting and fantasized about working outside and slipping away when no one was looking. Then I glanced at the other people in the room, wondering who was there because of weight issues and who was there for punishment like me, and what awful thing had they done to get them sent to Camp Willowmoss. Are you going to eat that? Billy pointed to my half-eaten liver. I glanced at him. I must have been lost in thought. Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. Stabbing my fork into the meat, I carved off a bite and put it in my mouth. Even though I didn't really like it, I was hungry enough to eat it. When I looked back at Billy, he was smirking at me, but I noticed his plate was clean. I felt a bit sorry for him. Do they give you extra food if you have a physically demanding job? He laughed, and everyone at our table looked at us. My face reddened, and I turned back to my meal, ignoring him. Morgan here wants to know if they give us extra food if we have a... He turned toward me. What did you call it? A physically demanding job? He made air quotes as he spoke. The others grinned or laughed. I felt like an idiot. I'll take that as a no. The point is for us fatties to lose weight, Alex said. If we burn more calories, all the better as far as they're concerned. I looked at each person at my table. None of them seemed fat to me. Maybe Piper was a little pudgy, but the rest seemed like they were at a healthy weight. How thin do they expect you guys to get? I asked. What do you mean, you guys? Billy said. You're here just like us. You have to lose weight too. I looked at Billy and thought, I'm not like you guys. This is your world, not mine. As soon as I can figure a way out of here, I'm gone. But what I said was, that's what I meant. How thin do they expect us to get? What do you mean? Billy said. Don't you know your own goal weight? I thought about my conversation with Mr. Madsen that morning. He told me I needed to lose at least 20 pounds. Of course. There you go, then. What about you? I asked him. What about me? No offense, but you look like you've gone a little past your goal weight. Alex giggled next to me. What's so funny? I asked, turning toward her. Sorry, she said. It's just that Billy never needed to lose weight to begin with. What do you mean? I looked at Billy. Then why are you here? Enough of this. He stood, obviously not interested in sharing his secrets. I have to get back to work. I watched him walk away, then turned back to the others. What's his story? Alex shook her head. It's his to tell. I must have looked disappointed because she leaned close to me and whispered, You wouldn't want everyone to know what you did, would you? But I didn't do anything I wanted to scream. Instead, I pressed my lips together and shook my head, deciding it wouldn't do any good to argue. I unwrapped the power bar and ate it, remembering the claims I'd read on the packaging at home that it contained an appetite suppressant. I hoped it was true, because I knew by dinner I would be starving. You should probably get back to work, Morgan, Alex said. What time is it? She pointed to the clock on the wall across the room. 12.40. I stood. Please tell me that clock is fast. Unfortunately, no. Great. See you at dinner. I said goodbye to my table mates and hurried to the nearest trash can, tossing in my utensils and milk container and setting the plate and tray in its place. Chapter 8 Though I was in a rush to get back to the sixth floor, I had to shuffle along with a herd and wait my turn to get on the elevator. When I finally made it on, I noticed that most of the buttons were lit up. With so many people needing to get on at the same time and everyone waving their cards in front of the card reader, the elevator would need to stop at nearly every floor. Maybe this is a flaw in the system that I could use. Fresh hope filled me at the thought. My gaze ran over the numbers and I immediately noticed that the first and second floors were not among the options. I wondered if they ever were. What about Billy? If his job was outside, wouldn't he have to go to the first floor? The idea of working in the garden became even more attractive. I would talk to Kyle after my shift and ask him to recommend me for the job. But first, I would have to impress him with my work, and being late certainly wouldn't help. Sighing, I waited as the elevator stopped on the fifth floor and several boys got off. 
A moment later, it stopped on my floor, and I hurried toward the storage room slash office to get my supplies. I hoped Kyle wouldn't be there so my lateness would go unnoticed. He wasn't. I smiled, relieved, then gathered my supplies onto the cart and wheeled it out of the room. You're late, Morgan. Fifteen minutes late. I stopped, caught off guard by Kyle's sudden appearance, but quickly collected myself. I'm really sorry. I didn't realize the time, and then everyone was trying to get on the elevators at the same time. He frowned. Look, I know it's your first day, so I'll let this slide this one time. He paused. Next time you'll have to give up some of your evening to make up the missed time. Okay. It won't happen again, I promise. He nodded. We'll see. Angry at myself for making such a stupid mistake, I pushed my cart down the hall. I would have to wait to ask for a transfer. How could he recommend me now? Why would he even want to? I worked the second half of my shift, my arms becoming like lead weights as each minute passed. I felt like a wimp, but I just wasn't used to all this scrubbing. Finally, it was time to stop. I'd cleaned all four bathrooms and done most of the vacuuming, but I needed to get to class. Taking my cart back to the storage room, I pushed it into a corner. Kyle was nowhere to be found. I went to my room and changed out of my sweats and into a pair of my jeans, then went into the bathroom, which was very clean, and freshened up. As I left the bathroom and walked toward the elevator, I realized I didn't know where the classrooms were. Hoping the elevator would know my schedule and only give me the option of the correct floor, although I wouldn't object if the first floor was an option, I waved my card in front of the reader and waited for the elevator to arrive. A moment later, the doors slid open and I stepped inside. When I waved my card in front of the reader, only the button for the ninth floor lit up. I pressed it and felt the car begin to move upward. A moment later, I stepped into an open area where several teenagers were walking toward rooms with open doors. I had no idea where I was supposed to go, but I noticed an office straight in front of me and headed toward it. The woman sitting behind the desk ignored me. I stood there for a moment, trying to be patient, but finally said, Excuse me? The woman looked up from her computer screen, which I couldn't see, but since she seemed annoyed at being interrupted, I had to wonder if I'd kept her from shopping or something. She stared at me, an expectant look on her face. I'm new, I began. I'm supposed to have class now, but I don't know where I'm supposed to go. What's your name? she asked, a fake friendly smile on her face. Morgan Campbell. Was pretending to be nice a job requirement at Camp Willow Moss? The woman typed something on her keyboard, then walked to a printer and grabbed a newly printed sheet of paper before handing it to me. This is your class schedule. The numbers are on the classroom doors, so you shouldn't have any trouble finding your way around. I took the paper and glanced at it, then looked back at her. I think I'm going to be late. Do I need a late pass or something? She sighed, plainly feeling put out by my request. Let me get you one. When she turned away from me, I shook my head and frowned, but gave her my own fake smile when she handed me the pass. Thanks. I walked out of the office and took a closer look at the paper she'd printed, then scowled. Even though I only attended classes two hours a day, I still had four subjects I'd be studying. The classes were on a rotating schedule where today I had math and English, and tomorrow I had social studies and science. Exhausted from working all day, I trudged down the first hallway I came to and kept walking until I found the right classroom. The door was near the front of the room, so when I walked in, every eye in the room focused on me. I ignored the other students and instead walked to the teacher who was staring at me as well. I didn't know if his look of disapproval was because I had come in late or because my face was still bruised and swollen, marking me as a runner. I held out the late slip and he took it without comment, glancing at it before looking back at me. Find a seat. I turned toward the room where everyone openly watched me. It was worse than my first day at the new school two weeks ago. Was it really only two weeks ago that this nightmare had begun? There were three empty seats, but all were in the front row. I slid into the closest one and tried to be invisible, although I didn't think it was working. I could still feel the gaze of the other students upon me. Where is your textbook, Ms. Campbell? the teacher asked. Heat flooded my face at the further attention. Uh, I don't have one. His eyebrows rose. You should have gotten your materials from the office before entering my classroom. That stupid witch in the office. Anger welled up inside me, but it manifested itself as tears of embarrassment. I blinked frantically, trying to clear my eyes. Please take care of it immediately, the teacher said. 
I stood and walked toward the door, not making eye contact with anyone for fear of them seeing my mortification at making this mistake, even though it wasn't my fault. How was I supposed to know the office was responsible for making sure I had what I needed? Irritation at the office worker swept over me, and I stormed down the hall. When I walked into the office, ready to complain, another woman was there, and the woman from just a few minutes before was nowhere to be seen. "'How may I help you?' the woman asked. Her smile seemed genuine, and I wished she had been there before. "'I was here a few minutes ago,' I said, and the other lady gave me my schedule, but she didn't give me my books and stuff. "'Oh, I'm sorry. She must have forgotten.' "'Yeah, right. Or she was mad at me for disturbing her online shopping and wanted to punish me.' "'Do you have your schedule?' the woman asked. I handed it to her, and she walked toward a tall shelf in the back of the room where textbooks sat in organized stacks. She pulled several out, along with a notebook and pencils, then set everything on the counter. "'This should be everything you need,' she paused and reached under the counter. "'Except you'll need a backpack to put them in.' She set a well-used backpack on the counter next to the textbooks. I loaded the backpack with the items she'd set on the counter, wondering how the other woman could possibly have overlooked this little step in the process of helping a brand new student. Then I reminded myself how ridiculous this whole experience was and tried to forget about my annoyance and instead focus on getting through my classes. A few moments later, I walked back into the classroom. Sliding into my seat without speaking, I pulled out the textbook, notepad, and pencil and looked at the teacher. He smiled briefly in approval then went back to his lecture. Math had never been my favorite subject, and my eyelids began to droop. I had to use all of my self-control to stay awake. I hardly heard what the teacher said, but convinced myself I would be gone soon, so it didn't really matter. Before I knew it, a bell rang, and it was time to go to my English class. Shoving my things into the backpack, I checked my schedule for the room number, then left the math classroom and walked down the hall. There weren't that many classrooms, so it wasn't difficult to find my way around, and after a moment, I found the right room. Not many people were there yet, and I went directly to the back row and slid into a seat, hoping I would be able to doze during class without being noticed. Pulling out my notepad and pencil so it would at least appear I was taking notes, I set them on my desk, then tucked my backpack under my seat. Other students came in, and I watched them, wondering who they were and what their story was. My mind wandered as I thought about home and what Mom and Amy and the boys might be doing. "'Hey, Morgan!' I turned to see who had spoken and was surprised to see Billy sliding into the seat next to mine. Hi, I didn't expect to see you here. Oh yeah, where did you expect to see me? I half smiled at his sarcasm. I just meant I didn't know you were in this class. There are a lot of things you don't know about me, Morgan Campbell. The way he said my name made me take a closer look at him. Why was he there anyway? Alex had made it sound like he wasn't there because of weight issues, so it must be for some alleged crime— "'Like what?' I asked. I hoped he might divulge some secret about himself. He stared at me like he was deciding if he could trust me. I gazed back, trying to look trustworthy. "'Okay, class,' an older woman with slate-gray hair and vivid blue eyes said from the front of the room. "'Time to begin!' Billy turned away from me and focused on the teacher, leaving me feeling disappointed, like I had just missed my chance to learn something important." Tearing my gaze away from the boy with the short black hair and piercing gray-green eyes, I looked at the teacher. As always, we begin with a pledge. All arise. I stood with the rest of the students, and when they began speaking, I said the words with them, though I had to force every word out of my mouth. I pledge to always follow the rules and to take care of my body. I will strive to put the good of all above the desires of one. A healthy me is a healthy world." When we sat down, fury pounded through me at being forced to say words that symbolized all that this world stood for, and it was all I could do to hold in a scream. To keep myself from losing it completely, I fantasized about the day I would leave Camp Willamoss and pictured myself entering the tunnel that would lead me back to my world. My mind began drifting, and what seemed like a moment later I felt a sharp whack on the back of my head. My eyes shot open. I'd fallen asleep. Lifting my head, I saw the teacher standing next to my desk, a thick textbook in her hand. The back of my head throbbed. Did she just hit me with that book? Shocked, I felt despair settle over me. This place really was a prison, and the workers were probably allowed to do whatever they wanted to us campers. I don't want to find you sleeping in my class again, young lady, she said. Then she marched back to the front of the room. 
I'd never fallen asleep in class before and felt even more humiliated than I had in my last class when the teacher had scolded me for not having my books. I looked around the room. The entire class was watching me. Some of the students were obviously trying not to laugh, while others seemed like they felt sorry for me. My face burned with embarrassment. I could feel Billy's gaze on me, but I studiously ignored him, afraid if I saw him laughing at me that I might just burst into tears. Instead, I watched the teacher and bit the inside of my cheek to distract myself from the urge to cry. Trying to distance myself from my sorry situation, I listened to the teacher as she talked about some book I'd never heard of and wrote down random things that she said. By the time class ended, I was able to push my feelings of mortification down into a place where I could control my emotions. The teacher left the room, and I turned to Billy. Thanks for waking me up, by the way. To his credit, he looked embarrassed. She noticed before I did, and by then it was too late. Sorry. My anger deflated. It's not your fault. He smiled. Are you hungry? I've never been so hungry. He smirked. You'd better get used to that feeling. I put my things in my backpack and followed him out the door and toward the elevators. Isn't there some way to get a snack or something? He shook his head. Nope. How can they expect us to work so hard on so little food? Morgan, he said in a stage whisper, you do realize that this is a fat camp, right? That prison is more like it, I said, as we reached the elevators and waited our turn to get on. But why do they have to punish us for being a few pounds overweight, I asked. That's what I don't get. He looked at me like I was from another planet, which in fact I was, or at least from another universe. Really? he asked. I knew I must have sounded crazy, at least as someone who'd grown up with a mindset that everyone in this world seemed to have, but I couldn't help myself. It's just not right, that's all. He smiled at me then, and there was a twinkle in his eyes that I hadn't noticed before. I like you, Morgan Campbell. My cheeks flushed for the millionth time that day, but this time I didn't care. Chapter 9 Unexpectedly self-conscious, I dug in my pocket for my card, prepared to wave it in front of the card reader. We stood in front of the elevator, waiting for our turn to get on, and I was hyper-conscious of Billy beside me. I tried to analyze the five words he'd spoken. I like you, Morgan Campbell. He'd only met me that morning, so he couldn't have meant much by it. Maybe he felt the same way I did, that the rules were stupid and unreasonable. Maybe he could be an ally in escaping this place. The idea bolstered my morale, and I wondered if I should confide my plans to him. I went to my room to drop off my backpack, then headed to the cafeteria. When I arrived, Billy had just gotten there, and we walked together to the line that had formed. "'What kind of food did they give us for dinner?' I asked, my stomach gnawing inside of me. "'You'll see soon enough,' he smirked. "'You need to have a little more patience.' Irritated by his attitude, I turned my back on him. "'What kind of house did you grow up in anyway, Morgan? You act like you've never been deprived of a meal.' "'Actually, I hadn't, but how could I explain that to him? Evidently deprivation was the norm in this world.' I turned to face him. "'I'm just hungry, okay?' He held up his hands in surrender. Okay, I get it. Really, he didn't get it at all. He had no clue the culture shock I was experiencing. Two weeks ago, I had been happily living in my world. Well, maybe not happily, after all I'd run away, but I had been stupid and naive. I hadn't realized how good I had it. Now, though, I was miserable and scared. Terrified, actually. I could hardly allow myself to consider the possibility that I wouldn't be able to get back home. The thought was simply unacceptable. The hope that I would soon be back in my natural world was the only thing keeping me going. I reached the front of the line and eagerly picked up my tray and slid it along the rails. The woman behind the counter glanced at her screen and handed me a small bowl of soup and a roll. My mouth watered as I took the items from her and placed them on my tray. Another woman gave me another bowl, this one with steamed vegetables. At the end of the counter, a different woman gave me a bowl of fruit and a power bar. It was probably canned fruit, but it still looked delicious. I grabbed a box of skim milk and waited for Billy. A few moments later, we were sitting with Alex, Piper, and Cassidy. There was still one empty seat, as there had been at breakfast and lunch. Is anyone else going to sit with us? I motioned to the empty seat. Everyone suddenly looked very interested in their meals. Not that they weren't interested before, but they were obviously ignoring my question. Alex? She looked at me and frowned. 
No. I looked at the others, who were watching Alex. What's going on? Piper set her spork down and leaned toward me, in a voice loud enough to be heard above the low roar of the room, but quiet enough not to carry beyond our table, she said, Some people don't deserve to be at this table. Then she leaned back in her chair, picked up her spork, and continued eating. What did that mean? I looked at Billy, my eyebrows raised in question. He seemed to be trying to hide a grin, evidently enjoying my confusion. Then he shrugged and dug into his food. Whatever, I thought. I tried not to care about the politics of this group, but I was desperate to know what someone had done wrong so that I wouldn't make the same mistake. I didn't know what I would do if I was banished from this table. I began eating my food and was pleasantly surprised by how tasty it was. It didn't hurt that I was starving. Piper, this is really good. Did you help make it? She smiled. I was with the group making the soup today. Not bad, huh? It's delicious. Even though the meal wasn't as big as the midday meal, it left me satisfied. However, at this point in the evening, I usually like to eat something sweet. I knew that wouldn't happen, and I tried to think about something else. What are you guys doing next? I think we all have workout time or homework time, Cassidy said as she looked around the table. I've got a ton of homework to do before tomorrow, Piper said as she stood and picked up her tray. I really wanted to get more information from her about what she'd meant earlier about some people not deserving to be at their table, so I stood too. I guess I'm supposed to exercise, I said, so I should probably get going. I walked with Piper, and after we dropped off our trays, we headed toward the elevators. Most people were still at their tables, so the number of people waiting to get on the elevators was fewer than there had been after lunch. You'd think they'd have us take stairs, I said to Piper. Wouldn't that give us some extra exercise? She smiled with a look of indulgence, like she would need to point out something obvious to the new kid. They like to control where we go. But we stop at most of the floors anyway. I paused. Plus, they put that chip in us, so they'll know where we are. True. She hesitated, like she hadn't considered my points before. Maybe they just want us all in one place. I don't know. Where are the stairs, I asked, the idea occurring to me that I could just run down them to the first floor. Piper looked thoughtful. I don't even know, to tell you the truth, but they're probably locked. That wouldn't surprise me, but I decided to check when I was cleaning the next day. Earlier, when I'd been cleaning, I hadn't noticed a door marked stairs, but now that I thought about it, I would see if I could find them. If I looked when I was vacuuming, it wouldn't be obvious that I was searching. Then, trying to get Piper on my side, I said, I think the people who run this place are crazy. She blinked rapidly before looking all around, then she whispered, you shouldn't say stuff like that. Worried I had done something seriously wrong, I whispered back, why not? She shook her head and glanced around again. Never mind. Other people waiting for the elevator crowded around us, and I knew this wasn't the time to have this conversation. What floor are you on? I asked as the elevator moved upward. The sixth floor, same as you and Alex. Oh, is Cassidy your roommate? Piper smiled, the look of fear gone now. Yeah. How long have you been here? A month. I still have to lose 30 pounds before they'll let me leave. The doors to our floor slid open and we stepped out. Still wanting to find out what Piper had meant when she'd implied the sixth chair at our table belonged to someone who had done something wrong, I walked with her toward her room. Do you like working in the kitchen? It's okay, she said, but it's better than some jobs. Then her eyes went wide. <laughs> Sorry, Morgan, I know you have the worst job right now. I frowned as I thought about my job. That's okay. I don't plan on doing it forever. Piper stopped in front of a door. This is my room. I'll see you later. She waved her card in front of the reader and opened the door. Piper, wait. She turned to me, a question on her face. Hey, I was just wondering what happened to, you know, make you guys not want the other kid to sit with you. A pained expression flashed across her face. Why do you want to know? This was where I sucked at expressing myself. I was embarrassed to admit that I was desperate to have this group of people be my friends. They were the only people I knew, and since I wasn't great at making friends, I was terrified to be set adrift on my own. If that happened, then what would I do? But I was also afraid to admit any of that to Piper. She would think I was a total loser, and then I would risk her telling the others about how pathetic I was, and then they would exclude me for sure. So I settled on saying, I was just curious. I hoped that would be enough. It wasn't. If it's all the same to you, she said, I'd rather leave the past in the past. 
Okay, sure. What else could I say? We stood there for a moment, then she said, I gotta get started on my homework. See you tomorrow. Disappointed that I hadn't gotten an answer, I smiled. See ya. I went to my room. Mom had brought some shorts and t-shirts, so I changed and put on a pair of sneakers, then grabbed my card and went to the elevator, dreading the workout I was required to have. Chapter 10 My work supervisor, Kyle, had said the gym was on the third floor, and sure enough, that was the only button that lit up when I waved my card in front of the reader. When I arrived, I stepped into a room filled with every kind of workout equipment imaginable— a row of treadmills line one wall with a row of elliptical machines behind it. Stationary bicycles, weight machines, and stair steppers were available as well. Some of the equipment was being used, but I decided to warm up on a treadmill. As I stepped onto an empty one, a man walked up to me. You need to check in before you start. He pointed to a small office, over there. Okay. I went to the office and found a teenage girl sitting behind the desk. Hi, I said. I'm supposed to check in? She looked up from what she was doing. Yes, you swipe your card on this reader. She pointed to a small device on the corner of her desk. I did as directed, and she looked at her screen. Morgan, huh? I nodded. You're Alex's roommate, right? Yeah. I remembered Alex saying that her job was in the workout area. The girl smiled. I'm Livy. Alex told me to watch for you. I exhaled slightly, grateful to Alex that she had thought about me. Livy got up from behind the desk. Let me show you around. She led me to a small room next to the office. After you check in, come in here and grab a towel. When you're done using any machine, make sure to wipe it down. And before you leave, toss your towel in this hamper. It was nice to be told the rules before I broke them for a change. Thanks. Livy led me to the workout area. Make sure you warm up before starting. She pointed to a corner where several people were stretching. That's the warm-up area, so make sure to stay in that area while you stretch out. Okay. If you get thirsty, there's a drinking fountain in the corner. I looked where she pointed and saw two people in line. Don't you have water bottles or something? She laughed. No. Oh. I guess they didn't want to waste any money on us campers for something as extravagant as water bottles. Have a good workout, Livy said. I watched her leave, then I went into the small room and got a towel. I walked over to the warm-up area draped the towel around my neck, then bent over, stretching my leg muscles. The other people were chatting, but I didn't say anything, uncomfortable not knowing anyone. You knew? One of the boys asked. I did a different stretch, noticing his curly blonde hair and chocolate brown eyes. Yeah. What's your name? Maybe this wouldn't be too bad, I thought. Morgan, what's yours? I'm Harley. Like the motorcycle? As soon as the words left my mouth, I wished I could pull them back. He laughed like it was a question he had heard before. No, I wasn't named after the motorcycle. Sorry, I muttered, feeling like an idiot. It's okay, I get that sometimes. I sat on the floor and did more stretches. He motioned toward my face with his head. Did you try to run? I kept forgetting that my face was an advertisement for a failed escape attempt and wondered how long it would take for the bruise on my cheek to fade. No, I just ran into a wall. I had no idea why I had just lied to him. Was it better for him to think I was a klutz? Why did I even care what he thought? Come on, Harley, a red-headed girl said to him. Nice meeting you, Morgan. He picked up his stuff and followed the redhead to the weight machine. I finished my stretches, then went to an empty treadmill and began walking. Exhausted from all that I had done that day, it was a chore to put one foot in front of the other, but I kept going. After twenty minutes, the man who had told me to check in came up to me. You need to pick it up. Your heart rate is barely moving. I turned to him, confused how he would know my heart rate. What? You heard me. You're not here to take an evening stroll. You're here to lose weight. Move it. I stared at him a moment, taking in his muscular arms and cold eyes, and had a flashback to the night before when Hanson and Dimples had dragged me out of my house and brought me here. I was about to tell Mr. Muscles to shove it when I also remember being tasered, twice. Then Mr. Muscles pressed a button on the treadmill, increasing the speed of the belt. I had to jog to keep from falling. I reached for the button, but he slapped my hand away. Don't touch that. I want you to run for twenty minutes before you slow down. Afraid of what would happen if I disobeyed, I kept running, hating his guts more and more with every step. This was nothing like doing laps for track. That had been my choice. 
Now I was being forced to exercise. Even worse, I wasn't able to decide how hard to exercise. Rage at Mr. Muscles pumped adrenaline through my body, helping to keep me going. But after ten minutes, my side began to ache and I desperately wanted to stop running. How did he even know my heart rate? Then I remembered the chip that the not-so-nice doctor had injected under my skin. She'd mentioned that it could read my heart rate. Loathing this place even more than before, I frowned. Alex was right when she called it a hellhole. How long was I going to have to stay here? I didn't know how much of this place I could take. The readout said twenty minutes had passed since the exercise Nazi had increased the speed. I punched the button, slowing the treadmill, and began walking at a more comfortable pace. After I'd caught my breath, I went to the drinking fountain and gulped down as much water as I could. Then I decided to try the elliptical. I still had over an hour that I had to spend here, and I wanted to get through it alive. A lot more people had arrived to work out while I'd been in the middle of torture Morgan time, and there weren't many pieces of equipment available. Then I saw one elliptical that wasn't being used and hurried over to it. Another girl reached it a moment after I did. I recognized her from the bathroom that morning. She was the one who'd made me move to the back of the line for the shower. I was here first, she said, which she and I both knew was a lie. Sweaty, hot, and tired, I was in no mood to let a bully push me around. No, you weren't. Her eyebrows went up. Evidently, she wasn't used to being challenged. What did you say, new girl? My name's Morgan, and I said I was here first, not you. She looked at the people who were nearby. We had an audience. Great. Then she leaned toward me so only I could hear. I'll let you have it this time, Morgan, but you'd better watch yourself. I watched her walk away, but rather than feeling victorious, I felt alarmed. The last time I'd stood up for myself, it was to Lori, and I had ended up here. What had I done now? Chapter 11 That took some courage. I looked at Harley, who was lifting weights next to my elliptical machine. What do you mean? That Beth is a bad seed, he said. I wouldn't cross her if I were you. Exhausted, dripping with sweat and hating life, I scowled at him. What am I supposed to do, let her bully me? He shrugged. You can do what you want. Then he turned back to doing bicep curls. I was already worried about what Beth was going to do to me. I didn't need someone else reminding me of the danger I could be in. I'd been here less than 24 hours, and already I'd made an enemy. That was even faster than with Lori. I was breaking all kinds of personal records. I continued my workout and looked at the clock. It had been nearly two hours since I checked in. I was supposed to meet with a counseling group at 8 o'clock so that I could be re-educated, but I was sticky with sweat and desperate for a shower. After wiping down the weight machine, I tossed my towel in the hamper, then took the elevator back to my floor. When I went into my room, Alex was sitting at her desk working on homework. She turned to me when I walked in. How was it? Awful, if you want to know the truth. Which part? The only part that wasn't was your friend Livy being nice to me and showing me around. Thanks for that. Alex smiled. You're welcome. I know how sucky it is to be new and not know anything. She paused. What did you think of Austin? Who? The guy who runs the gym. I hate him with every fiber of my being. Alex looked shocked. Why? What did he do to you? Embarrassed that he'd basically accused me of slacking, I said, I just thought he was a jerk. This is the muscular, good-looking guy? Then I remembered that Alex probably worked with him. He's muscular, yeah. She seemed to be thinking... Yeah, I guess he can be a bit bossy sometimes, but he's basically a nice guy. Maybe to you. She turned back to her homework. I've got a lot to do. I'm going to take a quick shower before my counseling thing. I paused. Where do they meet, anyway? She turned back toward me. On the ninth floor, where we have school. Okay, thanks. After my shower, I felt more human. When I arrived on the ninth floor, I saw a board posted with several sheets of paper, each one had a room number and a list of names. I found my name on the sheet for room 5. It was the same room where I had my English class earlier that day. Since I knew exactly where that was, I was able to walk down the hall with confidence. A moment later, I reached the room and saw that the desks had been pushed to the sides, and in their place were eleven chairs arranged in a circle. Several kids were already there. I sat down and waited for my re-education to begin, but I was skeptical about the whole process— I didn't need to be brainwashed about the way this world worked. That would never happen. 
I just needed a way to get out of here and back home. Other kids trickled in, and at eight o'clock on the dot, a slender woman my mom's age walked in, a tablet computer in her hand. She sat in one of the chairs in a circle and crossed one fashionably trousered leg over the other, then looked at each of us. I noticed one chair was still empty. So did she. She looked toward the door and sighed, clearly irritated to have any delay. Just then, Billy walked in. He went straight to the empty chair and sat down, immediately slouching and not making eye contact with anyone. So nice of you to join us, Mr. Foster. He ignored her and continued staring at the floor. This didn't seem to bother her, so I assumed she was used to it. Let us begin tonight's session. First, I need all of you to check in. She held up her tablet, which had a card reader attached to it. One by one, each of us, even Billy, stood and waved our cards in front of the reader. Very good. Once we were settled, she said, We have two new members of our group tonight. Please welcome Chad Beacon and Morgan Campbell. All eyes rotated between me and the new boy. Several of the kids said hello, but most just stared. I remembered the large bruise on my face and almost reached up to touch it, but was able to keep my hands in my lap. Deciding not to let myself be intimidated by these kids, after all, they must have done something wrong to be assigned to the counseling group too, I kept my chin up. My gaze flitted from one kid to another, stopping on Billy, who was staring at me, a small smirk curling his lips. What did he do anyway, I wondered. My name is Mrs. Reynolds. She paused. As always, we begin with a pledge. All arise. As I stood, I noticed most of the others didn't seem in a hurry to stand and felt a sudden kinship with this group. These kids were like me. They hated the way things were, too. Mrs. Reynolds began saying the pledge, and most of the kids half-heartedly followed along. When we finished, she spoke. Don't sit yet. You know that was unacceptable. How many times do I have to tell you? We'll continue to repeat the pledge until I'm satisfied with your recitation. She looked at each one of us. Let's try that again. We all spoke as one, this time with a little more enthusiasm. I pledge to always follow the rules and to take care of my body. I will strive to put the good of all above the desires of one. A healthy me is a healthy world. Mrs. Reynolds smiled. That was better. You may sit. We all did as instructed. Mrs. Reynolds spoke again. Last night, we were discussing how it's important to follow the rules so that society can keep order. Morgan, Chad, what are your thoughts on following the laws that society has put in place? I think they suck, Chad said. Everyone laughed, but Mrs. Reynolds did not look amused. Perhaps you're not familiar with the rules of this group, Mr. Beacon, she said. Outbursts like that will cause you to forfeit two meals. She smiled. Which two would you like to forfeit? Chad's face blanched, and everyone got quiet. He swallowed, and I could see his Adam's apple move. I guess breakfast? She typed something into her tablet computer. Breakfast it is. She glanced at him. Two days in a row. She set her tablet down on her lap and turned to me. What about you, Morgan? Me? Fear trickled down my spine like sweat after a vigorous workout. Yes. What are your thoughts on the importance of rules in society? Her eyes locked on mine, and I wasn't able to look away. Afraid I would say the wrong thing and be punished, I hesitated. Speak up, she said. I reminded myself that this whole thing was a farce, a fake world that I would soon be leaving. I just had to pretend until I could find a way to escape. I guess it's important to have rules so that you know what to expect. She smiled, evidently pleased with my answer. Very good, Morgan, very good. Her praise, though it was for an answer I had made up and didn't mean, helped me to look away from her. I felt the others taking the measure of me, but I ignored them, especially Billy, whose smirk I could see in my mind's eye. For the rest of the session, I was able to come up with answers I knew Mrs. Reynolds wanted to hear, and I got through it without any punishment. No one else got in trouble either. When we were done, she told us we could go, but asked me to stay behind. As I watched everyone file out, worry coursed through me. What had I done wrong? Finally, the last person left the room, and Mrs. Reynolds came and sat beside me. How are you settling in, Morgan? Okay, I guess. I hoped she would get this over with quickly. My imagination churned with all kinds of horrible punishments for what I may have done. Good. I'm glad to hear it. She paused. Here at Camp Willowmoss, we want our campers to develop good habits, not just to lose weight, but to cultivate a healthy lifestyle— a lifelong way of caring for their bodies. Now, as you know, there are those who are here for other reasons. 
That's what our counseling group is all about. Some people make poor choices and they need to be reminded why we have the rules that we have. Take you, for example. I'm sure what you did wasn't done maliciously. Nevertheless, you broke an important rule. As I sat in silence, I wondered where she was going with her lecture. Here at Camp Willamoss, we believe in second chances. Most people leave here with a new attitude and are ready to become productive members of society. There are some, however, who have no intention of changing their ways. Not only that, they want to bring down as many other people as they can. Alarm bells ring in my mind. Did she somehow know of my desire to escape? Could she tell I hadn't been sincere in my answers during the counseling session? Morgan, I have a good feeling about you. The alarm bells quieted. Plainly, she had no clue what was going on in my mind. As much as we want to, we can't be everywhere, so we rely on other campers to help us out. She watched me for a moment. How would you like to shave some time off of your stay? Really? She smiled, but it didn't reach her eyes. Yes. I would like that. I thought you would. She paused. You can earn points, which can go towards shortening your stay at Camp Willamoss. That's great, I thought. Maybe I'll need to work extra hours in my job or something. What do I need to do? I couldn't help it. My voice betrayed how eager I was to earn those points. You just need to share information with me. I felt my early release slipping away. What kind of information? Anything that you think we would be interested in. I think you'll know it when you hear it. This time when she smiled, it seemed evil. Okay. Can I count on you, Morgan? What was I supposed to say? Uh, I guess so. Good. I'll see you tomorrow night. She stood and left the room. Trying to process what I'd just been told, I stayed in my seat. If I ratted people out, they'd let me go early. I had no idea how early, but any time I could take off my stay, as Mrs. Reynolds called it, would be good. But could I do it? Could I be a snitch? I left the classroom and went to the elevator, my mind going a hundred miles an hour. Did I care enough about the people I'd met to keep their secrets? Not that they told me any, but what if they did? Would I be willing to risk losing their friendship to benefit myself? Chapter 12 When I got back to my room, Alex wasn't there. I wondered if she was working out. The night before when I'd arrived, she just finished a workout. Though I still had an hour until lights out, I was completely wiped out and decided to go to bed early. After getting ready for bed, I noticed a stack of blank food journal pages on my desk. Groaning with exhaustion, I decided to fill one out in the morning and instead crawled under my covers and was asleep the moment my head touched the pillow. The next morning, when I woke, my body ached. Between scrubbing all those bathrooms and the two-hour workout, my muscles screamed at me for using them when they weren't used to it. I crawled out of bed, gathered my things, and made my way to the bathroom. Since I had showered the night before, I wouldn't take the time to shower this morning. The bathroom was a beehive of activity, seven girls vying for mirrors, sinks, and showers. My gaze swept the room, and I noticed all the ways the girls were making a mess. After working so hard to clean yesterday, I couldn't help myself and spoke without thinking. Would you guys mind not making such a mess? One of the girls laughed and my eyes met Beth's. Oh, crap, I thought, recalling our confrontation in the gym the previous evening. Then I watched as she squirted some toothpaste onto the counter, took a tissue and scooped it up and smeared it on the mirror. That's for you, new girl. I want to make sure you have plenty to do when you clean up after us today. Fury spiked in my brain. How dare she treat me like her personal maid? But wasn't that what I was? For all of the girls on this floor? I had to use all of my self-control to keep from responding. Instead, I purposely ignored her challenge, then turned away and went about my business, hurrying through my tasks so I could get away from her. When I got back to my room, I saw the food journal sheets on my desk and remembered that I needed to fill them out. Still upset about what had happened with Beth, plus feeling achy and tired after working so hard the day before, I struggled to remember everything I'd eaten. I did the best I could and hoped it would be good enough, then folded the sheet of paper and put it in my pocket. After Alex and I turned in our food journals, we got our trays. Today's food was a little better. Fruit, eggs, a power bar, and no oatmeal. As I sat with my group, I tried not to think about what Mrs. Reynolds had offered me. Then it occurred to me that everyone here was probably told the same thing. But then I wondered if everyone had been. After all, Mrs. Reynolds didn't talk to Chad after the counseling session, just me. 
Did they only make the offer to those who they thought would be likely to tattle? I hated the idea that I came across that way, but at least it would make the people running this place less likely to suspect my true plans. You seem deep in thought, Billy said. He sat across from me. What? Oh, I'm just tired. What did Mrs. Reynolds want to talk to you about, he asked, as he took a bite of his cold cereal, some sort of brown flakes swimming in skim milk. All eyes turned my way. Did he really not know, or was this a test? Mrs. Reynolds pulled you aside, Piper asked. What for? My heart pounded as my mind raced. Obviously, I couldn't tell them the truth. What if one of them told me something juicy enough that it could get me released immediately? If they knew what she had said to me, they would never trust me. As much as I liked them, as soon as I got out of here, I would never see them again. She just wanted to know how I was doing, you know, if I was having any problems. Really? Cassidy asked. She cares? I laughed, maybe a little too hard. I doubt it, but I guess that's her job, to pretend to care. I looked at the others, and no one accused me of lying, so I went on. Have you guys noticed how fake their smiles are? It's like they get paid extra if they can pretend to like us. I know, Cassidy said. It creeps me out. Some of them don't even try to pretend they like us, Alex said. The Grey Witch hit Morgan with a book yesterday, Billy said. She did? Piper said, her eyes wide. What did you do? I looked at Billy. You call her the Grey Witch? He nodded, his ever-present smirk on his face. I looked at the others. I was so tired, and her class was so boring, I fell asleep, and I guess she didn't like it. I've seen her do that before, Cassidy said. I think she enjoys it. Well, Alex said, I'd better get to work. Yeah, Piper said, a knowing look on her face. You don't want to keep Austin waiting. Alex blushed. I pictured Mr. Muscles and wondered what she saw in him. I had to admit he wasn't ugly, but when I thought about how he had forced me to run on the treadmill for twenty minutes, all I saw was a horrible person who didn't care about us campers. I'd better get going, too, I said, not wanting to be late. When I got to the supply closet slash office, Kyle was just leaving. Glad to see you made it on time today. There's quite a mess in bathroom two. You might want to start there. Bathroom two? That was my bathroom. I pictured Beth purposely smearing toothpaste on the mirror and wondered what else she had done. Kyle walked down the hall. I need to go to one of the other floors, but I trust you can manage things here. Yeah, I called after him, then gathered my supplies onto the cart and wheeled it to bathroom two. The smell hit me first, then I saw brown streaks on the walls. You've got to be kidding me. I nearly gagged. I tried breathing through my mouth so I wouldn't smell the horrible odor emanating from the room. I just knew this was Beth's doing, but how could I prove it? And would anyone even care? After all, I was just a prisoner here. No one would care if I had to clean up someone else's crap. Rage boiled inside me at being so helpless. As far as I could tell, I had no rights here. No one cared about me. Well, my new group of friends seemed to care. They were my family now, and suddenly I knew I could never tell Mrs. Reynolds anything they said. Maybe that's what had happened with a person who was banished from the group. I certainly didn't want that to happen to me. Swallowing my pride, I put on a pair of gloves, grabbed a squirt bottle of disinfectant and a roll of paper towels, and got to work. When that bathroom was sparkling clean, I moved on to another one. Fortunately, no one who used the other bathrooms hated me, so the cleaning wasn't too bad. At eleven o'clock, when it was time for me to stop, I hadn't gotten as much done as I had the day before, and I was worried I wouldn't get everything done that I needed to. Even though I had homework to do, I continued working, trying to get a little more done. At eleven twenty, I heard someone walk into the bathroom where I was scrubbing the sinks. Looks great, Morgan, Kyle said, but you can stop now. Pleased that he had caught me doing more than I needed to, I said, bathroom two took longer to clean, so I thought I'd better work a little longer. He smiled, evidently impressed. You're a hard worker. I like that. But you don't have to overdo it. He paused. We might have someone join our little crew tomorrow, so that will help. I set the sponge down, my feelings mixed. It would be great to have more help, but that meant someone was about to be dragged in here today and probably had no idea. Had Kyle known I was going to be arrested and brought in ahead of time? The idea bothered me. Immensely. Great, I said, trying to show enthusiasm I didn't feel. I'll take the cart back for you. I'm sure you have other things you need to get done. I'll see you after lunch. Okay, thanks. I peeled off the gloves I'd been wearing and set them on the cart, then went to my room and sat on my bed. Even though I had homework from the day before, it wasn't due until the next day, so instead, I lay on my bed and stared at the ceiling and felt sorry for myself. 
At lunch, I sat with my new friends, glad to have them around. Without them, I would feel so much more alone. Using the plastic knife, I cut off a piece of my bunless veggie burger and stabbed it with my spork. The burger actually tasted pretty good, almost as good as the veggie burger I had had at the Come On In Diner. Remembering the waitress, who had seemed to disapprove of my choice to have the burger instead of the soup, I now understood her attitude. This whole society was so screwed up, believing everyone should be forced to be a certain size, and now I was basically in prison because I weighed more than what some random group of people had decided was acceptable. I'd better get back to pulling weeds, Billy said as he stood. I looked at the clock. My time was rapidly ending. I finished eating, said goodbye to the others, then dropped off my tray and went back to the sixth floor to continue being the maid for my floor. Chapter 13 When I walked into the office, I was on time, but Kyle wasn't there. I waved my card in front of the reader he had shown me to use for clocking in and out, then gathered my supplies and got to work. Toward the end of my shift, as I vacuumed the hallway, I remembered that I wanted to see if I could find the stairwell, assuming there was one. I glanced at each door as I moved the vacuum back and forth across the carpet, noting the number painted on each door. When I reached the end of the hall, farthest from the elevators, I noticed an unmarked door with a card reader next to it. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a camera mounted in the ceiling and maneuvered the vacuum close to the door, using my body to hopefully block the camera's view from seeing me reach out and press the bar that would open the door. Not surprisingly, it didn't budge, confirming my suspicion that a key card was needed to access the stairs. I turned the vacuum around and continued moving across the carpet, discouragement washing over me that I would have no way to access the stairs. At the end of my shift, I went to the office to clock out and drop off the cart. Kyle sat behind the desk. You're doing a nice job, Morgan. I'm glad you're on my crew. Did he have any clue how much I hated this job? Thanks. I hesitated. You know, I was wondering if you would recommend me for the gardening job. His eyebrows went up. Really? You don't want to work for me? Work for you? This is slave labor. It's not that. I smiled to show how much I loved working for him and cleaning up other people's crap. It's just that I miss being outdoors, and I really love working in the dirt. You know, pulling weeds, planting flowers, stuff like that. Stuff like that, huh? Yeah. He hadn't refused my request outright, which was a good sign. This always happens. What? As soon as I get a good worker, they want to leave. He chuckled. What is it about scrubbing bathrooms that does that to someone? So you'll put in the request? There's a waiting list, so chances aren't good. He paused. Tell you what, check with me after breakfast tomorrow. I might have an answer by then. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Then he turned away from me and went back to working. I left the supply room slash office and headed to my room, optimistic that my cleaning days were behind me. After stopping by the bathroom to freshen up, I got my backpack from my room and went to the classroom floor. Today I had social studies and science. Sometimes I actually found those subjects interesting, and I hope that would hold true here. As I approached the classroom, I felt less intimidated than I had the day before. Today I had my books and had an idea of what to expect. The classroom was filling up, and I found a seat in the back of the room. Today, though, I would make sure I stayed awake. There was no telling what the teacher in this room might do to a sleeping student. A couple minutes later, a good-looking man walked in. Tall, with thick blonde hair and a model's face, I guessed he was in his late twenties. Was he the teacher? Suddenly, I really liked social studies. Then Beth walked into the room. Now I hated social studies. Trying to pretend I hadn't seen her, I busied myself getting out my notebook and pen, but she had apparently noticed me. Well, she said as she stood next to my desk and stared down at me, who do we have here? I ignored her, which I hoped would, one, irritate her, and two, get her to leave. Only number one happened. Don't you dare ignore me, new girl, she said through clenched teeth. My heart raced, but then I reminded myself that I was in the middle of a classroom. What could she do to me here? Of course, there was always later. Still, my courage grew. I slowly lifted my gaze to meet hers. What do you want, Beth? Her eyes widened, like she was surprised I wasn't scared of her, but then she recovered. You're in my seat. I looked at the desk, then turned to look at the back of the seat. I don't see your name on it. Then I looked at her. You do know how to write your name, don't you? 
Her face flamed red and her eyes grew wide. She opened her mouth to speak, but the teacher interrupted her. Find a seat, Beth. Nostrils flaring and eyes squinting, she glared at me, and I began to wish I had just moved to a different seat. But knowing I would be gone soon emboldened me to do things I wouldn't normally do. I hoped I wouldn't regret it, but had a sinking feeling I might. Beth sat in an empty seat, and the teacher, whose name was Mr. Hughes, began. First, we all stood and said the pledge. Like the day before, I said the words, even though it felt wrong. As a teacher lectured, I had a hard time paying attention. For one, his handsome face kept distracting me, but in the back of my mind, I worried about Beth and what she was going to do to me for defying her. As soon as we were dismissed, I hurried and gathered my things and went to my next class, trying to avoid interacting with her. When I walked into science, which looked a lot like the science classes I'd been in before, long tables with Bunsen burners and microscopes lined up in rows, I looked for a familiar face. I saw one face I recognized and went over to him. Hi, Harley. It was easy to remember his unusual name. Oh, hey, Mary, right? I smiled. No, Morgan. Oh, right, sorry. That's okay. How's it going? Okay. Between my job and yesterday's workout, I am pretty sore, though. He smiled. You'll get used to it. He took his textbook out of his backpack and looked at me. So, has Beth given you any more trouble? As a matter of fact, yes. What happened? I decided not to mention the mess she left in the bathroom, since I wasn't certain it had been her doing, though I suspected it was. Instead, I told him about the confrontation I'd had with her in my last class. He laughed softly and nodded. I wish I could have seen that. What do you think she'll do to me? He chewed on his lower lip. I don't know, but let me put it this way. It won't be pleasant. What had I done? I had thought Lori was bad, but it sounded like Beth was ten times worse, even worse than Shelby, whose bullying had gotten me suspended when I'd stood up to her. What should I do? Not much you can do. I guess just try not to be alone with her. He glanced around then looked back at me. It's always good to have a few witnesses. Fear shot up my spine, and my face paled. "'Good afternoon, class,' a woman, who was obviously the teacher, said from the front of the room. "'Today we're going to talk about the periodic table, but first, I'll arise for the pledge.' During the lecture, I found my thoughts going to Beth as I worried about what she was going to do to me. Chapter 14 At dinner, I decided to consult with my new friends— do any of you guys know a girl named Beth that's on our floor? Piper glanced at Cassidy, then looked at me. You mean that bully with stringy brown hair? I hadn't really noticed her hair, but now that she mentioned it, it was kind of stringy. Yeah. Why, has she been picking on you? Piper asked, then she took a bite of her wheat roll. You could say that. You should just stay out of her way, Cassidy said. It's a little late for that now, unfortunately, I said. Piper grimaced. What happened? I described the incident in the gym the night before, my suspicion that she had left the mess in the bathroom, and then the confrontation in class. Dang, Morgan, Alex said. What were you thinking? I had to admit that they were right. It was stupid of me to respond to her like I had. Now I had made things worse, but what was I supposed to do? Let her bully me? I don't know, I said, but I can't change it now. I noticed Billy hadn't contributed anything to the conversation. What do you think I should do, Billy? How should I know? He took a large spoonful of soup. My motto is, stay out of everyone's way and they'll stay out of mine. Wow, this place was a bad mix of high school and prison. My desperation to get out of there went up several notches and I began to feel panicky, like if I didn't get out of there immediately, I might not make it out alive. Look, Alex said, I think you'll be fine. Just make sure you're never alone with her. That's the same advice Harley gave me, I said as I looked at my food. Miraculously, my appetite had diminished, but I suspected that was due more to stress than anything else. Who? Cassidy asked, her nostrils flaring. Harley? Everyone at my table stared at me. When did you talk to him? Alex asked. I met him in the gym last night, and today I sat with him in science. Why? Alex regarded the others before turning to me. He's a troublemaker. You should stay away from him. He had seemed perfectly nice when I had talked to him. What did he do? I don't want to get into it. Just... She hesitated. Be careful what you tell him. Okay. Everyone ate in silence after that, and my curiosity grew. Piper finished first. I've got tons of homework, like usual. She stood and gathered her things. Me too, I said, standing. Plus, I'm still supposed to do my workout. 
Okay, see you guys, Cassidy said as Piper and I walked away together. What homework do you have? Piper asked me as we dropped off our trays and headed to the elevator to join the small crowd. Math and English, what about you? I have homework in all my classes, she said. Technically, so do I, but they're not all due tomorrow. We stood at the edge of the throng. So what's the deal with Harley? Piper glanced around, then in a whisper said, You know that empty seat at our table? Yeah. Harley used to sit in it. Oh. I let this sink in. Come on, Piper said as she moved toward the open elevator. Though I was dying to know more, I had a feeling she wasn't going to satisfy my curiosity. Maybe I could find out from Harley. As we rode the elevator to our floor, I actually looked forward to going to the gym. See you later, Piper said as we each went to our rooms. I quickly changed into my workout clothes and headed to the gym. First, I went to the office to check in. A different girl was sitting behind the desk as I swiped my card. She ignored me, and I went to the small room where the towels were kept. Even though it was only my second day, I felt more confident since I'd gone through the routine once already. No one was in the warm-up area yet. Had I gotten there too fast to talk to Harley? Or did he not normally come at this time? I began stretching, and I was nearly done when Harley and a couple of girls joined me. Hi, I said to him with a smile. Hey, Morgan. I kept stretching, even though I'd already been there for ten minutes. I hoped I'd have the chance to bring up my questions in a natural way, but as long as the other girls were there, I couldn't really ask my questions. Just as I was formulating a way to bring up the empty seat at my table, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I turned to see who it was. Move it along, Mr. Muscle said. You've warmed up long enough. I really hated this guy and couldn't understand why Alex thought he was nice. See ya, Harley said. I went to the elliptical machine and climbed on. There wasn't a speed control on it, so there was no way for Mr. Muscles to force me to go faster than I was comfortable going. At least that's what I thought. After I'd been going for several minutes, he appeared next to me. You need to step it up a notch. I can go for longer if I go this speed. That was the first time I'd spoken to him. Doesn't matter. Your heart rate isn't high enough for a productive workout. Productive workout? What did that even mean? Not only did I not want to do a productive workout, I didn't want to exercise at all. Morgan, don't make me ask you twice. Who did this guy think he was? And what would he do if I didn't comply? I pretended like I hadn't heard him and continued at the pace I was going. He stood there staring at me, but I ignored him and focused on the row of treadmills in front of me. Have it your way, he said. Then he turned and walked away. The thrill of victory swept over me and I couldn't help but smile. My joy was short-lived, however, because a few minutes later, two enforcers walked up to me. Hello, Morgan, Hansen said, a malicious smile on his face. Chapter 15 I flashed back to 48 hours earlier when I chubbed my knee into Hansen's groin in my attempt to escape, and he had dropped to the ground. Now, seeing the look of anticipation on his face, panic flooded my veins— I was still on the elliptical machine, and one enforcer stood on either side of me. I had nowhere to go. "'You need to come with us,' he said, grinning. I looked at the other enforcer, who I'd never met, but he seemed bored with the whole thing. "'Where are we going?' I knew fear was plain in my voice, but I couldn't help it. I was terrified. "'Over there,' Hansen pointed to an unoccupied treadmill. "'What were they going to do?' I climbed off of the elliptical and tried to make eye contact with other kids who were working out, but it was obvious no one wanted to get involved. Anyway, what were they supposed to do? Even though they liked to call us campers, we were prisoners, and the enforcers were our guards. I walked past Mr. Muscles, who glared at me. More than anything, I wished I could pick up one of the free weights and smash it through his teeth. Anger pulsed through me, helping to displace the fear. When we reached the treadmill, I stopped next to it. Get on, Hansen said. I glanced at him, then stepped onto the belt and faced the controls. He reached past me and pressed the buttons to start the belt moving. Next time Austin tells you to move faster, you move faster. I began to jog as the belt moved under my feet and the speed picked up. You're going to run on this machine for 30 minutes. No stopping or slowing down. Hansen clearly enjoyed delivering this bit of news. I scowled at him, but he just smiled. You're here to lose some of that flab, Morgan, and whether you like it or not, we're going to make sure you do. I knew I could lose a few pounds, but in my home world, I was perfectly fine. 
Here, however, no one had a problem when people called me names, locked me up, and then forced me to run on a freaking treadmill for 30 minutes. What a nightmare. Are you going to watch me the whole time? I panted, hating the idea of them standing there enjoying my suffering. Yes, we're going to stand here for 30 minutes to make sure you complete this disciplinary action. Was that what they call this bizarre form of torture? Discipline? Then Hansen laughed. What's so funny? I asked. He sneered. There's just a lot of jiggling going on. My face was already red from exertion, but the blood stampeded to my cheeks at his words. Evidently, this discipline included humiliation. Well, I'd show them. I grabbed the arms of the treadmill and lifted my feet off of the belt and placed them onto the motionless sides. Sharp pain in my legs made me nearly collapse and I cried out. My head jerked around and I saw Hansen and his diabolical partner holding their batons. They'd each whacked one of my bare legs with their batons. Keep going, Hansen growled. My legs throbbed with pain, but I managed to get my feet back on the belt and began jogging without being thrown off the treadmill, but my hands were still holding the arms. No touching the treadmill, the other enforcer said, forcibly removing my grip on the arm. Seeing no other option, I let go and kept jogging. My lungs began to burn, and I thought I was going to throw up my dinner. Maybe I can throw up in Hansen's face, I thought, feeling a small bit of pleasure as I imagined doing just that. I looked at the timer on the treadmill and saw it had only been five minutes. Twenty-five minutes to go. There was no way I could make it that long. Not at this pace. Another ten minutes passed, and I knew I was in danger of dying. Please, I begged, my pride gone. Can we slow it down a little? Hansen pulled a small device out of his pocket and read the display. Nope. Your heart rate is right where it needs to be. His attitude infuriated me, and I worked up enough oxygen to say, What are you, a freaking doctor? He just laughed and continued watching me suffer. When there were ten minutes left, my strength had nearly drained away. If it were up to me, I would have stopped long ago. As it was, I had no control, and the only thing that kept me going was the fear of falling. The belt would throw me backward, and I was certain I would smash my face into the concrete floor. When there were six minutes left, it happened. I slipped but the enforcers must have been ready for it because they grabbed my arms before I fell. Come on, Morgan, Hansen said, his voice bored. You're almost done. Hansen and his partner held onto my arms to keep me from falling, but my feet were having trouble keeping up with a moving belt. The men lifted me higher, helping me get my feet under me, and I succeeded in regaining my balance. They released my arms and I kept going, hating them and everyone here with every fiber of my being. At three minutes to go, Hansen gradually slowed the treadmill, allowing me to begin catching my breath. Finally, mercifully, the thirty minutes were over. Placing my hands on my hips, I stood on the motionless treadmill and worked to drag oxygen into my lungs. The enforcers were still there, and I wondered what fresh hell awaited me next, but then Austin showed up. "'Next time, Morgan, you'll do what I tell you,' he said. "'Yeah?' Knowing I had lost this round, I nodded. "'Yeah.' Gentlemen, he said to Hansen and his partner, you may go. See you around, buddy, Hansen said. Then they fist bumped like they had just heard good news or won a game or something equally thrilling. Incandescent with rage, I felt my blood boiling, but there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. Work on free weights, Austin said to me. Since I had no choice in the matter, I did as I was told, using my anger as energy to get through the rest of my workout. Chapter 16 When I got back to my room, I looked at my legs where Hansen and his friend had hit me with their batons. Bruises were forming on both legs, reminders of my discipline. Now that I was alone, I collapsed on my bed, dropped my head into my hands, and sobbed as I relived the horrendous experience in the gym. As fat tears dripped down my cheeks, I pictured Hansen's face and the pleasure he had seemed to get from making me suffer. What kind of person enjoyed something like that? He was a monster. I replayed the nearly unbearable memory over and over in my mind and realized that even though I had been thoroughly humiliated and even though I believe the punishment was cruel and unusual, I had refused to let them break me. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that that was exactly what they had been trying to do. For criminals like me, they wanted to break our spirit so that we would comply with the absurd rules of this society. I would not comply, and I would not let them break me. 
This sudden understanding of their technique was like a revelation. Maybe now that I recognized what they were doing, I could let incidents like the one in the gym roll right off of me. Of course, that would mean I would need to act like they were winning, like I was being compliant, but I would only have to do that until I could escape. At the thought, I racked my brain to come up with a way to get out of here, but came up empty. Besides the fact that there was a chip in my arm tracking my every move, I had no access to the ground floor, so no way to get out. Then I remembered that Kyle had promised to put in a request to have me join the gardening work group, and I felt a small measure of hope. Enough hope to help me get up and get ready to meet with a counseling group. Things had gone well there the night before, so I felt confident that it would be the same that night. I just had to fake my way through it. After a quick shower, I headed to the ninth floor to meet with my group. The first thing I noticed when I walked into the classroom, besides the fact that the chairs were arranged in a circle again, was a large scale in the center of the circle. Wondering what that was all about, I found an empty seat. Mrs. Reynolds wasn't there yet, and neither was Billy, but most everyone else was. I noticed Chad, the other new kid, in his seat, and I remembered how he'd been singled out the night before and then punished. Fresh worry coursed through me, and I knew I had to stay on my guard. Even though I was confident of their methods now, I still had to live through whatever they doled out, and I didn't relish the idea of being the object of scorn or humiliation. Billy waltzed in and sat across from me. My gaze met his, and he smiled at me, which warmed me. After what I'd been through in the gym, it felt good to know I had at least one friend in this group. He never seemed intimidated. Had he clued in to the techniques they used here, too? Everyone but Mrs. Reynolds was there, and I wondered if it was possible that she wouldn't show up. That hope vanished immediately when she walked in moments later. When she reached the edge of our circle, she stopped and stared at the scale which we were all facing. I see someone hasn't weighed themselves in over twenty-four hours. She had a lilt in her voice like she was having a good time. The other kids looked around like they were trying to figure out who it was. Then it dawned on me that I hadn't weighed myself since getting on Dr. Bradley's scale two nights before. Could it be me Mrs. Reynolds was talking about? What would happen if it was? She walked into the circle and sat on her chair, then held up her tablet. Please check in. We lined up and scanned our cards through her reader, then took our seats. All arise for the pledge, she said. I chanted the words along with everyone else, and as I said them, I understood that saying them in conjunction with the treatment we received here was all part of the indoctrination. We didn't just say the pledge once a day, like in the schools, but in every class and in every re-education session. I had to make sure the words didn't get into my subconscious. After we sat, Mrs. Reynolds looked at each of us in turn. Then she looked at Chad. I felt a gush of relief that he was the one who was going to be picked on instead of me. Mr. Beacon, she said, please remind us what our subject was about last night. He shifted in his chair, obviously uncomfortable to have Mrs. Reynolds focus her attention on him. Uh, that it's important to follow the rules? She smiled at him and he noticeably relaxed. Very good. Then she looked at each of us again. We had a good discussion last night and everyone seemed to understand this concept. However, some of you, she stared pointedly at Billy, may say the right things. Then she looked directly at me. But your behavior makes a different statement. My hands began to sweat and my heart pounded. It was me all along. Though I talked a good game about not letting their treatment affect me, in reality, it affected me completely. Morgan Campbell, she said with a look of disapproval. Yes, I croaked, my throat suddenly dry. When did you last weigh yourself? I knew exactly when, but I was afraid to say it. I'm not sure. She looked at her tablet. Well, I am. It was during processing. She looked at the rest of the group. That was two days ago. She paused, then looked at Billy. Mr. Foster, how often are campers supposed to weigh themselves while staying at Camp Willow Moss? He glanced at me, clearly not wanting to be drawn into her game. Daily. Her gaze whipped back to me. Daily. That's right. She pursed her lips. Do you feel you're somehow above the rules, Miss Campbell? As a matter of fact, I thought the rules were ludicrous, but there was no way I would say that out loud. I had enough discipline for one day. No. Yet you act as if you are. Why is that? I'm just not used to the rules, that's all. I hope she was almost done, because I didn't know how much more of this I could take. Not used to the rules, she asked. What kind of parents did you have? 
You should have been brought up with these rules. The way she dissed my parents as if she knew anything about them, or me, made me livid. It wasn't their fault that everything was so screwed up in this world. Angry words pushed up my throat, but miraculously I held them in as I mentally chanted, I won't let them break me. I won't let them break me. Well, she asked, what do you have to say for yourself? Remembering that I wanted to get through this as painlessly as possible, I pushed my pride down deep and said, I'm really sorry. I was just trying to get used to everything here and I forgot. Which was true, except for the part where I was sorry. She nodded. I can understand that. Relief that this was coming to an end began to fill me and I started to relax. Morgan, please get on the scale. What? Dread replaced the relief. She stood and went to the scale, then motioned for me to come forward. Come on now, we don't have all night. I felt the eyes of the others on me as I walked to the scale and stepped on. Mrs. Reynolds looked at the numbers on the digital readout and stated them out loud so that everyone could hear. Though I felt embarrassed to have my weight advertised, I was pleased to know I had lost two pounds since arriving. Of course, with all the physical activity I'd been doing, coupled with a lower caloric intake— I would have been shocked if I hadn't lost any weight. You may sit down, Mrs. Reynolds said. Once I was seated, she sat as well. You still need to lose 18 pounds, Morgan. Why did she have to announce that? I know. She took a five by seven inch card out of her pocket and wrote something on it with a thick red marker. Then she put it in a plastic sleeve, which was attached to a lanyard. Here you go, Morgan. She passed the card to me. I looked at the card. She had written my weight on it. You are to wear that for the next 24 hours so everyone can see that you fail to weigh yourself. What? It was bad enough that she told everyone in my counseling group what I weighed. Now everyone at Camp Lamas would know. Go ahead, put it on. Clenching my jaw in mortification, I put the lanyard over my head and let the plastic sleeve hang where it was clearly visible. Good. Now let's talk about why the good of society takes precedence over the needs of the individual. Hyper-aware of the sign hanging around my neck, I tried to focus on the discussion so that when she called on me I would have an answer. I managed to get through the rest of the session unscathed, but by the time I got back to my room I was mentally and physically exhausted, and I still had homework to do. I succeeded in finishing my math homework, but then it was time for lights out so I had no choice but to go to bed. The next morning I awoke to Alex roughly shaking me. "'You stupid idiot!' she yelled in my face. Why did I have to get you as my roommate? I opened my eyes, disoriented and confused. What's going on? What's wrong? This. She held up a card identical to the one Mrs. Reynolds had given me the night before, but it had a different number on it. I sat up. I don't understand. Thanks to your stupidity, I have to wear this all day today. Her eyes blazed with anger. But I'm the one who forgot to weigh myself, not you. No kidding. She began pacing our small room. Did you already forget what I told you? She stopped pacing and stood in front of me. When you do something wrong, it's on me, too. I'm so sorry, Alex. Then I thought about it and wondered why this was such a big deal. But then I made the mistake of voicing my thoughts. Why is this such a bad thing? I asked. So we have to walk around one day advertising our weight. So what? She stormed over to me and grabbed my pajama top in her fists. So what? So what? This little forgetfulness of yours cost me two points. That may not mean much to you, but to me, it means I have to stay here an extra week. She let go of my top. Are you starting to get the picture? If it cost her two points, what had it cost me? Mr. Madsen had said I could earn the privilege of seeing my family. Would this keep that from happening? I stared at Alex as the seriousness of this infraction swept over me. Is there anything I can do to fix it? She glared at me. No. And right now, I don't even want to be around you. She turned her back to me and worked on getting ready. Feeling awful, I climbed out of bed and trudged down the hall to the bathroom, praying I wouldn't run into Beth on top of everything else. My one bit of luck for the day was that Beth was nowhere to be seen. I was able to get ready without incident. I made sure to weigh myself on the scale in the corner, the same kind of scale I had used in my house, before going back to my room. Alex was still there, and it was nearly time to go to breakfast. Then I realized I had forgotten to fill out my food journal again. I just need a few minutes to fill out my food journal, I said to her. Whatever, she said. I'm not waiting for you. I looked at her in surprise. And by the way, she added, you're not welcome at my table. Then she turned and left the room. 
Chapter 17 Panic slammed down on me as I realized I'd been banished from the only group that I knew. Who would I sit with? Would they accept me? They're not going to break me, I said through clenched teeth, my voice hitching as I tried to control my emotions. Not wanting things to get any worse, I made sure to fill out my food journal before folding it and putting it in my pocket. Then, making sure the lanyard with my weight attached, which felt like a lead weight, was hanging around my neck, I left my room and headed toward the elevators. No one else was waiting for the elevators, and I stood there facing the doors, alone. A group of girls walked up behind me, wanting to be invisible and just get through breakfast without anything else happening, I ignored them. It was not to be. Look who it is, a voice said. It's the new girl. I felt a tap on my shoulder and a shiver of fear charged up my spine. I kept my back to Beth and prayed she would leave me alone. Instead, she grabbed my shoulder and spun me around. Surrounded by her group of friends, she glared at me. These were not the kinds of witnesses I had hoped to have. She pointed at the card with my weight on it and laughed, then turned to her friends. What a loser! Then she turned back to me. I'll bet Alex was pissed at you today. How did she know? Then I realized everyone but me had probably seen this type of thing happen before and knew what the consequences would be. Well, she said, what do you have to say for yourself, loser? I didn't take the bait, but just stood there. I glanced at her group, but immediately saw I would get no help from them. What, she said, you suddenly can't talk? You had plenty to say yesterday when I told you to get out of my seat. She stepped toward me and I moved back a step, my back against the elevator doors. She got right in my face. It smelled like she hadn't brushed her teeth that morning. Ding! The elevator arrived. She smiled at me. You got lucky this time. The doors to the elevator opened, filled with people. I backed into the car, glad to be among other people, people who didn't know who I was and didn't care, and they didn't hate me. When we arrived at the cafeteria floor, I got off last, wanting to keep my distance from Beth and her gang. As I waited in line, I considered what I could do to fix what had happened to Alex. It was so unfair that she should be punished for my stupidity. When I reached the front of the line, I waved my card in front of the reader and deposited my food journal, then grabbed my tray. My appetite had diminished with the stresses of the morning, but as food was handed to me, my stomach let me know I had better eat. When I'd collected my last item, I turned to the room and looked toward the table where my group sat. I caught Piper looking at me, but as soon as our eyes met, she looked down. Now there were two empty seats at the table, mine and Harley's. What would happen if I went to the table and sat in one of the chairs? I didn't have the courage to find out. Instead, I stood there, searching the room for a place where I might be welcome. Besides my group, I only knew Harley and Kiera. Hopeful I could sit with one of them, I took a step forward, frantically hunting for a friendly face. After a moment, I found Harley, but there were no empty seats at his table. Then I saw Kiera. Miraculously, there was one empty seat, and it was next to her. Feeling optimistic, I moved in her direction, but when I was about ten feet away, a girl slid into the empty seat. My chance was lost. I glanced around. Too late, I saw I was standing next to Beth's table. Look, it's the loser, she said loudly enough for all in the immediate vicinity to hear. No one wants to sit with her. I couldn't help it. Tears sprang to my eyes. Blinking furiously as I walked away, I got my tears under control and went in a different direction, making sure to go nowhere near my usual table. Every table had at least two people. I stopped next to a table of two boys, hoping they would be nice to me. After all, it had been girls that had been mean to me so far. Do you mind if I sit with you? No, that's cool, one of them said. He glanced at the card hanging around my neck, then looked me up and down, but it wasn't in a mean way. He just seemed curious. You're in my English class, he said. I'm Todd. Overwhelmed with relief that someone was showing a hint of kindness, it was all I could do not to throw my arms around him. I'm Morgan. Darren, the other boy at the table said. As usual, I wondered what their story was. They were both built like linebackers. Was that a bad thing in this world? How long have you guys been here? Just a couple of weeks, Todd said. What about you? This is my third day. He nodded. Why aren't you sitting with your group? His question caught me off guard, and it must have shown because he quickly added, I mean, I just noticed that you usually sit with some other kids, but today... Who else had noticed this change? 
According to Kyle, there was room for 40 people on my floor, and there were four floors of kids, so potentially there could be 160 kids here. But if someone had been here a while, they would notice a change like the new girl wandering around looking for a place to sit when she'd been sitting with a certain group up to this point. I'd rather not talk about it, I said. What happened to your face? Darren asked. The swelling in my lip was pretty much gone, but I still had a nice-sized bruise on my face, one which I usually forgot about until someone mentioned it. I don't want to talk about that either. You're not very talkative, are you? Todd asked with a grin. I smiled back. It's been a rough morning. I started eating my breakfast, anxious to get out of the cafeteria as quickly as I could, confident that Kyle would have good news for me. As I worked my way through breakfast, no one talked to me, and I felt more alone than ever. When the two boys left, I was completely alone. I unwrapped my power bar, which did seem to suppress my appetite, and finished my breakfast. Anxious to talk to Kyle and see if he'd arranged for me to work outside, I pushed back from the table and stood, then looked in the direction of my old table and saw Billy and Piper looking my way. Alex and Cassidy seemed to be deep in conversation, their backs to me. Were they all mad at me? I had no way to tell. Sighing, I took my tray and dropped it off, then headed to the elevator, my mind on getting on the crew that worked outside and the opportunity that that would give me to escape this place. Chapter 18 The moment I reached my floor, I hurried to the supply closet slash office to talk to Kyle. He wasn't there. Disappointment shot through me. I gathered my supplies and headed to one of the bathrooms. I had to keep doing my best if I had any hope of Kyle recommending me for another job. I'd been cleaning for an hour when Kyle came into the bathroom. Next to him stood a heavy-set girl who looked shell-shocked. Had I looked as scared as she did when I'd arrived? It was weird how I felt like a veteran after such a short period of time. Morgan, Kyle said, this is Nicole. She's joining our little crew. I wanted to say, what about my transfer, but decided I should talk to him privately. Hi, Nicole, I said instead. Hi. Her voice was just above a whisper. I'll leave her to you, Kyle said, then he turned and walked away. You can put on a pair of these gloves. I handed her the box of disposable gloves. I already finished the mirrors and sinks, but the toilet stalls need to be cleaned. She held the box as if it contained poisonous snakes, but then she reached in and pulled out a pair and handed the box back to me. I set the box on the cart, then went back to scrubbing the shower stalls. I turned to see how she was doing and saw her just standing there. Are you just going to watch me work, or are you going to do your share? Irritation at her lack of help made my voice sharper than I'd meant it to be. She burst into tears. I felt like a monster for being so mean. After all, I knew how she must be feeling. Still, on my first day, I'd kept it together and done what needed to be done. Then again, I had plans to get out of this world. She was stuck here. Sighing, I grabbed some toilet tissue and handed it to her. Thanks, she said as she wiped her eyes and nose. I know this place sucks, but you'll be okay. Really? I knew no such thing, but if it would get her to stop crying so we could get our job done, then I could pretend. Yeah. I've just heard so many horror stories about places like this. After what I'd experienced the last two days, I was sure they were all true. Though curious about what she'd heard, I decided it would be best if I didn't know what other horrific things could happen to me. I was scared enough as it was. I couldn't bring myself to tell her the lie that what she'd heard couldn't be true, so instead I said, We have a lot of work to do still. We'd better get busy. Okay. She threw her tissue away and took out the toilet cleaning supplies. Relieved that she was going to be a help and not a hindrance, I went back to my scrubbing. When we finished that bathroom, we wheeled the cart to the next one. I got her started, then told her I had to talk to Kyle for a minute. Hurrying to the supply closet slash office, I hoped he would be there. He was. Morgan, how's Nicole working out? Fine. Great. I'll bet you're glad to have the help. Yeah. Had he forgotten about my request? Yesterday you said you'd put in a request for a job change. I remember. I was just wondering if you'd heard anything. Even though I would prefer to keep you on my crew, he said, I did as you asked. He paused, then smiled. I was able to get you on kitchen duty. The look on his face made it clear he thought this was a great win, but my heart sank. Kitchen duty wouldn't get me outside. I smiled back, pretending to be happy. That's great. Thanks. You'll start tomorrow morning at six. Six in the morning? This was just getting better and better. 
That's right, he said, as irritation crossed his face. Is that a problem? Forcing away my unhappiness, I smiled. No, it's great. Good. Today I need you to get Nicole up to speed, because she'll be on her own tomorrow. Sucks for her, but I was less than thrilled about my own job. He held out a sheet of paper. Here's your new daily schedule. The only difference will be your mornings. You'll have some extra time for homework after breakfast since your job starts early, and you'll eat breakfast an hour later. I took the paper from him and looked it over. Daily schedule from Morgan Campbell. 6 to 8, kitchen duty. 8 to 8.30, breakfast. 8.30 to 10, exercise or homework. 10 to 12, kitchen duty. 12 to 12.30, lunch. 12.30 to 2.30, kitchen duty. 2.30 to 3, homework. 3 to 5, classes. 5 to 5.30, dinner. 5.30 to 8, exercise or work on homework. 8 to 9, meet with counseling group. 9 to 10, exercise or work on homework. 10 o'clock, lights out. At least for one meal a day, I wouldn't have to avoid Alex and the rest of her group. Then I remembered my idea that maybe Mr. Madsen could do something about Alex having her points docked. Kyle, how can I set up an appointment with my caseworker? Why? He looked angry about my request. Are you going to complain about this change? No, no, I hurried to assure him. This has nothing to do with work. The angry look smoothed out. Okay, I'll email him and let him know you'd like to talk to him. Genuinely happy this time, I smiled. Thanks. You're welcome. Now back to work. I left the office and found Nicole busily cleaning the bathroom where I'd left her. I felt kind of sorry for her that she would be on her own the next day, but not enough to stay with her. Maybe I could work my way up the chain. Kitchen duty was a step up from bathroom duty, but what came after that? Chapter 19 At the end of my shift, I went to my room and worked on my English homework. I thought about how the teacher, the Grey Witch, according to Billy, had hit me with a book when I'd fallen asleep. I didn't know what she would do if I didn't have my homework done. When it was time for lunch, dread washed over me as I thought about facing a cafeteria full of unfriendly faces. But what could I do? I grabbed my card and left my room. Once I'd picked up my meal, tofu mixed with vegetables, I turned to the room and saw Billy, Alex, Piper, and Cassidy at their usual table. Gathering my courage, I wound my way through the tables and stopped next to Piper. Can I sit with you guys? Everyone's eyes shifted to Alex. This would be her decision. She looked at me with a scowl. I held my breath, waiting for her response. She looked me up and down, her jaw clenched, then she glanced around the room. I have to stay in this hellhole another week because of you. She narrowed her eyes as she looked at me. No. My shoulders slumped. I'd really thought she would say yes. Then I looked at Cassidy, Piper, and Billy, but they wouldn't meet my gaze. I turned away, loneliness pulsing through me. Then I walked away, looking for a place to sit. A few tables away from Alex, I saw Nicole, my new cleaning companion, sitting with another girl. I stopped next to their table. Mind if I join you? Yeah, sure, Nicole said. I set my tray on the table and sat down, feeling a mix of gratitude and self-pity. Morgan and I work together, Nicole said to the girl sitting next to her. The girl nodded and looked at me. I'm Susan. Hi. I picked up my spork and began eating my one large meal of the day. Even though I'd been getting hungry between meals, I thought the appetite suppressant and the power bars helped. I'm glad I don't have to clean those bathrooms by myself, Nicole said. The earnest look on her face made me feel guilty because she would be on her own the next day. I decided not to say anything yet. We still had to work together after lunch. Instead, I just nodded and continued eating. Just as I finished, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I turned to see Kiera. You requested to see Mr. Madsen, she said, and he has some time now. Oh, okay. I dropped off my tray and followed Kiera to the elevator. She didn't ask what I wanted to talk to him about, and I didn't tell her. We just went to the second floor in silence. When we entered the office, the same enforcer who had been there when I'd met with Mr. Madsen the day after my arrival was sitting behind the desk. He held out his hand and said one word, card. I handed him my card and he scanned it into his computer, then he handed it back to me and told me to sit. I'll come back for you when you're done, Kiera said, then she left. I wondered where Hansen was. He had shown up pretty quickly to help with my discipline in the gym the day before, so evidently he was here at Camp Willamaw sometimes. I dreaded running into him again. A few minutes later, Mr. Madsen walked into the reception area and I followed him back to his office. 
I sat in the same chair I'd sat in before, and he sat across from me. He glanced at the card in the plastic sleeve hanging around my neck. Looks like you've had a little trouble, Morgan. I nodded, thinking about all the things that had happened since I'd last sat in this chair. I reviewed your record, and it looks like you're having some issues with following the rules. If your rules weren't so ludicrous, I wanted to say, I wouldn't have any trouble at all. Instead, I said, I guess I just didn't understand what I was supposed to do. He sat back in his chair and sighed. We went over the rules two days ago. Was I unclear? This conversation wasn't going where I had hoped, and I tried to get it back on track. I guess I was just overwhelmed by everything. I promised to do better. But I want to talk about something else. About my roommate, Alex. His eyebrows went up. So you've considered Mrs. Reynolds' offer? He thought I was here to share some juicy information on Alex. Of course I've considered it. He sat up straighter in his chair. Have you now? But that's not why I'm here. The look of anticipation on his face was replaced by disappointment. Oh? No. I want to see what I can do to fix Alex's punishment for my mistake. He pointed to the card hanging around my neck. You mean that. You feel bad that she was docked points, too. Relieved that he understood, I nodded. Yes. Tapping one finger against his mouth, he seemed to be considering the situation. Finally, he looked at me, a sparkle in his eyes. I'll tell you what I can do. I can give Alex her points back and instead dock them from you, which will mean an extra week will be added to your stay here. My heart sank at his offer. But, he added, if you can bring me some useful information, then I will see to it that you are released a full month early. My mind whirled as I considered the ramifications of his offer. On the one hand, I could fix my problem with Alex. I pictured myself wandering from table to table at every meal like a nomad, never having a group of my own, and didn't think I could tolerate that much longer. On the other hand, I could potentially add another week to my own stay, but since I had no intention of being around that long, it was really a non-issue. I could agree to his deal, and it wouldn't really have an effect on me since I would be long gone before it was close to my release date. I wouldn't have to worry about ratting anyone out, because I didn't really care about how long they thought they would keep me here. I would be leaving sooner than they realized, and in the meantime, I would be a member of Alex's group. That was the key issue for me. I didn't want to be on my own while I was here, especially with a threat of Beth hanging over me. I'd like to accept your offer. A feeling of relief swept over me now that I knew everything would be okay. At least as okay as anything could be in this place. He grinned. Very good. One caveat, though, Morgan. Wariness replaced my relief. What? I need that information within one week. Otherwise, this offer is null and void. He paused. Agreed? The blood drained from my face. If I didn't come to him with some juicy information on someone in the next seven days... Alex would have a week added to her sentence, and I would be banished from her group. But if I didn't agree, I would remain banished. What choice did I have? Agreed. I felt like I'd just made a deal with the devil. Chapter 20 I waited in the reception area for Kiara to come and get me, and a few minutes later she did. As we walked toward the elevator, she said, I hope everything's okay. It was most definitely not okay, but there was nothing she could do about it. Plus, I certainly couldn't tell her or anyone else about my little deal with Mr. Madsen. Everything's fine. The lie tasted bitter. Good. She waved her card in front of the reader. I hear you're moving to the kitchen crew tomorrow. I was surprised she'd heard about it since I'd barely learned about it myself, but evidently she was privy to information that most people weren't. Yeah, it will be nice to not have to scrub toilets. We stepped into the elevator, and she pressed the number six. I worked in the kitchen for a while when I first got here. It wasn't too bad. Moments later, we were back to my floor. Kiara stayed on the elevator. See you later, Morgan. I stepped off. Bye. Then I went to the supply closet slash office and checked in. You met with your caseworker, Kyle said as I came into the room. Yeah. Were you able to resolve your issue? I wonder if he really cared, or if he was just hoping I would tell him what my issue was. Then again, he would probably find out soon enough if he didn't already know. For all I knew, Kyle was in on everything. All the staff probably were. Instead, I said, yeah. Good. Nicole has the card in bathroom four. You might want to start on the vacuuming. Okay. 
I pulled the vacuum out of the corner and rolled it into the hallway, then plugged it in and began working, glad that today would be my last day cleaning up after the other girls. When it was time for class, I stopped by my room and got my backpack, then went to the ninth floor. When I got to math class, I found a seat in the back and waited for the teacher to arrive. Like in all my other classes, he began by having us stand and say the pledge. Each time I said it, I hated it more and more. The words leaving my mouth sounded like a promise, but a promise that I would never keep. I made it through class without incident and hoped that in English I would have a chance to talk to Billy about everything that was going on with Alex. Maybe I could even tell him that I'd fixed everything. I just couldn't tell him about my deal with Mr. Madsen. When I got to class, Billy was already there. I hurried to the empty seat next to him, eager to share the good news about my meeting with Mr. Madsen. "'Hey, Morgan,' he said with a smile. "'Hi.' I hesitated, wondering how to broach the subject. "'So I guess Alex was pretty pissed at me.' He laughed. "'You could say that.' "'Well, I think I fixed it.' He tilted his head. "'What do you mean?' Pleased with my resourcefulness, I smiled. I talked to Mr. Madsen, and he gave Alex her points back. She won't have to stay an extra week. His eyebrows shot up. Really? They do that? Then he squinted at me. How'd you pull that off? Embarrassed to admit that I'd had Mr. Madsen dock the points from me, I just smiled and said, I have my ways. Skepticism was clear on his face. I've never heard of them doing that before. There must be some catch. He glanced away, then back at me. You'd better be careful, Morgan. I nodded. On the outside, I projected confidence, but on the inside, my stomach churned. How was I going to keep my end of the bargain? If I didn't, Alex would be angrier than ever. I got through class without falling asleep or having the gray witch hit me. When class was over, Billy and I walked to the elevator. Do you think Alex will let me sit with you guys at dinner? I don't know. He paused. Tell you what, come a few minutes late. I'll talk to Alex and see what she says. After you get your food, I'll give you a signal whether it's yay or nay. Okay. I lingered in my room for a few minutes, trying to give Billy time to talk Alex into letting me rejoin their group. Finally, with trepidation, I headed to the cafeteria. As I waited in line, I glanced Billy's way, but he was still talking to Alex. My nervousness about what Alex would say was so great I hardly noticed what food they gave me. When I reached the end of the line, I turned to the room and sought out Billy. He gave me a smile and waved me over. Relief crashed over me, and as I walked to the table, I mentally composed what I was going to say to Alex. When I reached the table, I hesitated a moment. Hey, Alex. She barely glanced at me. Hey. Since she didn't forbid me from sitting with them, I set my tray in the empty spot between Billy and Piper and sat down. No one spoke to me, so I decided to get the ball rolling. Guess what, Piper? Piper looked at me, a friendly smile on her face. What? Glad that she didn't seem to hold a grudge against me, I smiled. Tomorrow I'm going to be working in the kitchen. Really? She seemed genuinely pleased. Which shifts? I dug the paper Kyle had given me out of my pocket and handed it to her. She read it over. I'm in there before breakfast and lunch too, but not the after lunch shift. She handed me the paper. Cool. I'm glad I'll know at least one person in there. I picked up my spork and had a spoonful of soup. It was the same thing they served every night, but I was hungry, and it wasn't too bad. What kind of stuff do you think they'll have me do? The new kids always have to scrub the pots and pans, she said. Stuff like that. But eventually, you might be able to help cook the food. More scrubbing. Great. But it was still better than cleaning toilets. I hear the Saturday challenge is going to be intense, Billy said. I took another spoonful of soup. Saturday challenge? Yeah. Every Saturday, they break us into teams, and they have us compete against each other for points. This was the first I had heard of this. Does that mean we don't do our jobs that day? Alex laughed with derision. You don't get off that easy. Even though I heard an edge of contempt in her voice, at least she was talking to me. What do you mean? The Saturday challenge is in the afternoon, she said, so you'll participate during the time you would normally have classes. At least it gets us out of class for a day. I guess, she said, but sometimes you might wish you were in class instead. After my experience in the gym with Hansen and his enforcer buddy making me run on the treadmill, I could only imagine what they would have us do in this challenge. What kinds of things do they have us do? Depends on what they think will be the most entertaining. Alex paused. Entertaining to them, that is. One time, Piper said, they broke us into teams of six and had us do tug of war. That didn't sound so bad. But they always like to have a little twist, she continued. You know, to make it more interesting. 
She did air quotes as she said it. What do you mean? I asked. Well, there are always points involved, like the winner gets more points and everyone else is docked points. But for the tug of war, they had a trench between us, and in the trench they put dozens of snakes. She had to be yanking my chain. What? I don't think they are poisonous, but still. She seemed dead serious. What she described horrified me. What kind of place was this? Were all fat centers like this one? Come to think of it, Piper said, we haven't had a good game of tug of war in a while. Then something occurred to me. Where is the Saturday challenge held? They have an area outside just for the competition. Outside? That could be my chance. My thoughts must have been written all over my face because Billy said in a low voice, Don't go there, Morgan. I looked at him but didn't say anything. He leaned toward me so the others couldn't hear. I know what you're thinking. I'm not thinking anything. I didn't know if I could trust him with my desire to escape. He raised his eyebrows and went back to eating. Saturday was two days away. As I ate my power bar, I contemplated this unexpected opportunity. How well guarded was the Saturday challenge? Did the enforcers get distracted by watching all the fun? Would it be possible to slip away? Chapter 21 As I got ready to do my workout, I looked at the bright purple bruises on my legs and thought about what had happened the day before. Hansen must have enjoyed making me suffer, and I dreaded having to face him again. I checked in at the gym, got my towel, then stretched out in the warm-up area. As I began walking on the treadmill, I saw Mr. Muscles walking around, checking on what everyone was doing. Scared that he would harass me again, I picked up my pace. When he walked toward me, my heart rate escalated, but not from exertion. He stopped next to me and looked at his device, which I assumed told him my heart rate, compliments of the chip in my arm. Then he smiled. That's what I like to see, Morgan. It didn't matter that my heart rate had increased merely due to his presence, as long as it had increased. I gave him a partial smile, then focused on running, hoping he would go away and leave me alone. He stood there longer than necessary. At least, I thought it was too long. Then he finally walked away. As I went through my workout, which I was able to get through without being hassled, all I could think about was Saturday and a possible chance to get out of this place and back to the tunnel. This was only my third full day at Camp Willamos, but already I was so done with this place. After my workout, I showered, then headed to the ninth floor to meet with Mrs. Reynolds and the other delinquents who had to be re-educated. Today there was no scale in the middle of the room, just the circle of chairs filled with the other criminals in my group. Billy was there before me this time, and I sat in the empty seat next to his. Hey, Morgan, he said. How was your workout? It was okay, I guess. I paused. When do you work out? Before breakfast. My eyebrows went up in surprise. Aren't you the overachiever? He laughed. No, I just prefer to get it done first thing. He glanced around and whispered, Plus, Austin's not there that early. I can't stand that guy. Mr. Muscles? Who? I laughed at the confusion on his face. That's how I think of him. He grinned. Good call. I was surprised to know that Billy didn't like him either. I wondered what had happened to him, and I realized I still didn't know why he was at Camp Willowmoss. Obviously, he'd committed a crime of some sort. Why else would he be in the counseling session? But I wondered what it was. Mrs. Reynolds walked in wearing a bright smile. I didn't know why she always looked so happy to be here. Of course, she wasn't a camper, so that would help. Good evening, group, she said. It looks like everyone is here, so let us stand and begin with a pledge. We all shuffled to our feet and said the words along with Mrs. Reynolds. Very good. You may be seated. After we sat, Mrs. Reynolds looked at me and my heart kicked in my chest. Morgan, you may give that back to me now. She pointed to the card still hanging around my neck. I took it off and handed it to her. I hope you'll remember now to weigh yourself daily. I nodded. Of course I would. That was the purpose of the humiliation, to make sure I would never forget. Very good. Then she turned to Chad Beacon, the other new kid, and I sighed in relief. Mr. Beacon, tomorrow you may eat breakfast again. A tentative smile lifted his lips. She looked away from Chad, and I saw the relief on his face. I knew exactly how he felt. Today, she said, I want to talk about the value of putting the needs of others above those of your own. She looked directly at Billy, and he stared back. Billy, do you think there's value in that? 
I was impressed that he didn't seem intimidated. Sometimes, he said, but sometimes not. Explain, please. When he hesitated, she said, You know we value all opinions. That was news to me. When Chad had expressed his opinion, he'd been punished, and I was terrified to express mine. Maybe what she meant was all opinions were valued as long as they were the right opinion. If someone you care about desperately needs something, Billy said, but you know if you get it for them, then you could get in trouble, but you do it anyway. In that case, there is value in putting the needs of someone else above your own. Mrs. Reynolds pursed her lips. That's an interesting idea, Billy, but what about the importance of keeping the rules of society? Some rules have to be broken for the greater good. He stared at her, and I wondered if he wanted her to argue with him or punish him. The room was completely silent as we watched the exchange. I agreed with what Billy said and wished we could change the pledge to reflect his ideas. They made much more sense. The rules of this world were absurd, and it would be better for everyone if they were changed. Mrs. Reynolds stared right back at Billy. I guess she wanted to prove she was in charge, and eventually he looked away. I was glad when he did. As they'd engaged in their battle of wills, I was afraid of what punishment Mrs. Reynolds would come up with. Would anyone like to share their thoughts on Billy's comments? Mrs. Reynolds looked at each of us, but no one dared speak. Finally, she locked gazes with a chubby girl with beautiful auburn hair. Tracy, I haven't heard much from you. Tracy's eyes widened at the sudden attention. I'd like to hear your point of view on the value of putting the needs of others before your own. Oh, well, uh, I guess we need to think about what is best for everyone and not just for one person. And why is that? Mrs. Reynolds asked. Um, well, because it's selfish to always do what you want? To not think about everyone else? Mrs. Reynolds frowned at Tracy. Are you asking me or telling me? Telling you? Sighing, Mrs. Reynolds turned to her next victim. It wasn't me, and I hoped she would leave me alone. Finally, it was time to go back to our rooms. As we stood to leave, I glanced at Billy, wanting to talk to him about what he'd said. Was he talking from personal experience? Is that why he was here? Had he done something to help a loved one and gotten in trouble? Intrigued by the possibility, I followed him out of the room, but with the other kids around, I couldn't easily talk to him. We got on the elevator with several other kids, and Billy got off on his floor. See you tomorrow, Morgan. Bye. Disappointed that I hadn't gotten to talk to him, I headed to my room to get my homework done for the next day's classes. When I got there, Alex was absent. I sat at my desk and worked on my assignments until I was too tired to think. I got ready for bed, set my alarm for 5.30, then tried to use the last little bit of time before lights out to complete my food journal. If I waited until morning, I was sure to run out of time since I needed to get up extra early to begin my kitchen duties. Just as I finished, Alex arrived. Even though she wore shorts and a tank top, she didn't look like I did after my workouts, red-faced and coated with sweat. Maybe Austin was nicer to her since they worked together. As I pictured his face, I ground my teeth, angry at the thought of him. Alex closed the door and turned to me, a puzzled look on her face. Why'd you do it, Morgan? Why'd you have Madsen put my points back and dock yours instead? Are you crazy? So, she'd heard the details of what I'd done. Who had told her? Not that it mattered. The truth was, if I didn't get some information to tell Madsen within a week, it would be reversed. I guess I just felt bad that you were being punished for my stupidity, that's all. She shook her head. You'd better hope you earn some points in the challenge on Saturday to make up for it. If you lose, you'll get docked more points, and that means no family visits and a longer stay. No family visits? I hadn't considered that aspect of having points deducted. I'd only been thinking about the extension of my stay here, which didn't matter since I had no intention of being around that long, but short term I would be less likely to see my family. Crap! I turned away from Alex, suddenly upset. I could hear Alex opening her closet. I pictured the faces of my little brothers who so recently had gotten on my nerves. I would give anything now to see them and listen to their racket. And Amy... I wondered how her friendship with the girl she'd mentioned the other night was working out. I hoped she was making lots of friends. Then I pictured Mom and the worry she must be feeling with both Dad and me locked up. I had to push them out of my mind and stay focused on my goal of escaping this place and getting back to the tunnel. Back to my real home, where I would never complain about my life again, ever. 
As I climbed into bed, a dark cloud hung over me as I doubted my ability to escape this place in time. In my heart of hearts, I believed I would need to get to the tunnel on November 10th, the same day I'd left the other world. That was less than two months away. What would happen if I missed that date? Would I be stuck here forever? What about if I got there too early? Would the tunnel still take me home? In either case, I had to get out of this place and make my way to the tunnel. As I drifted off to sleep, I fantasized about escaping Camp Willamoss, making my way through the tunnel, and arriving back home to the arms of my family, my whole family, even Dad, who would be safe and sound at home, not locked up in some adult version of this horrible camp. Chapter 22 When the alarm went off, Alex was just getting up. I groaned as I stretched, wishing I could stay in bed longer, but knowing I didn't have a choice. Today I was starting my new job in the kitchen, and I didn't want my new supervisor, whoever that was, to hate me for being late. Throwing back the covers, I forced myself to get up. Oh, new job today, Alex said as she gathered her things. I forgot. Yeah, I wasn't much of a conversationalist when I first rolled out of bed. Good luck. See you at lunch. Okay. I watched her leave the room, and then I got ready, making sure to weigh myself on the bathroom. Then I headed to the elevator. Piper was there, too, and I smiled, glad not to have to go on my own. We made our way to the cafeteria on the fourth floor, and I followed her through a door marked staff only. She took me to an older woman who was wearing an apron. Mrs. Coleman, Piper said, this is Morgan. The woman smiled at me, and surprisingly it didn't seem fake. Good morning, Morgan. Welcome to my kitchen. Hi. As you can see, she waved her hand toward the large open space, we're quite busy getting ready for breakfast. Today I'd like you to wash the dishes in the sink over there. I looked where she pointed and saw a number of large pots and pans stacked next to an industrial-sized sink. Okay. Someone called to her and she hurried off. I looked at Piper, who shrugged. Have fun! Then she went to her workstation. As I walked to the sink, I reminded myself that this was better than scrubbing toilets. I had a feeling I'd be spending my whole shift washing dishes. Elbow deep in soap suds, I decided it really wasn't too bad, even though the dishes seemed to multiply. I was so focused on my task, I almost missed all the excitement. Evidently, a new shipment of power bars had come early that morning, and news spread that these ones had a more powerful appetite suppressant. Even more exciting to those of us on a reduced caloric intake, we were going to be given two at each meal instead of one. My stomach rumbled at the thought, and I remembered I would be eating breakfast an hour later than I had been, since my shift didn't finish until eight. I'd found the appetite suppressant and the power bars we'd been eating to be less than satisfactory, so I looked forward to these new ones and hoped they worked better. When my shift ended, Piper found me, and together we picked up our breakfast and went into the cafeteria seating area. With only those of us on kitchen duty using the space, the normally bustling room was subdued. Piper and I sat at a table with two other girls, and we enthusiastically ate our meals. "'I'm surprised they're giving us an extra power bar,' one of the girls said. "'I know, right?' Piper said. "'Usually they take food away from us, not give us more.' The other girl's eyes widened. "'You don't think they're going to take away any of our other food, do you?' "'I hope not,' Piper said as she unwrapped her first power bar. "'That would really suck.' I nodded, but didn't speak. Too busy eating a surprisingly tasty power bar." I swallowed then said, these taste better than the old ones. Piper nodded, yeah. We finished our meal then dropped off our trays. What do you have now? Piper asked as we waited for the elevator. I can work out or do homework until 10, then I have to come back here. Me too, she said. When I got to my room, I decided to get part of my workout out of the way and change into shorts then headed to the gym. Dreading what might happen today, I walked into the office to check in and found a familiar face. Hi, Alex. I'd forgotten she might be here. Hey, Morgan, how was kitchen duty? It was okay. Lots of dishes to wash. She smiled. I'll bet. Well, I said, I'd better get started. I have to be back in the kitchen at ten. Kay, have a good workout. Yeah, I thought, like that ever happens. I nodded, then went to get a towel. When I was halfway through my time on the treadmill, Mr. Muscles materialized next to the machine and stood there watching me. Not only was he a bully, but the way he stared at me really creeped me out. His gaze slid up and down my body. Looking good, Morgan. I suppressed a shudder as I glanced at him. Go away, I chanted in my mind. Go away, go away. But he just stood there, eyeing me. 
A few more weeks in my gym and you'll look really good. Was he coming on to me? Little did he know that I would be long gone from this place very soon. Finally, he walked away and I was able to finish my workout in peace. When I went back to the office to check out, Alex immediately asked, What was Austin saying to you? I remembered the way she defended him before and wondered if she had a crush on him, though how she could was beyond me. You know, I said, just telling me to go faster. She squinted like she didn't believe me and I wondered if he came on to a lot of the girls. I've got to get back to the kitchen, I said. I'll see you at lunch. She smiled, but it didn't reach her eyes. Bye. Great, that's all I need. Now she's going to be mad at me because the creepy Mr. Muscles is a pervert. When I got to the kitchen, boxes of food were stacked on the floor and one boy was putting them in a large walk-in refrigerator. Deciding it would be a nice break from doing dishes, I picked up a box and followed him into the cold space. I set the box on top of the one he'd carried in and turned to go. Whoa, who do we have here? Beth stood in the doorway, blocking my exit. Beth works this shift, I thought. Great. The boy had already left, and I anxiously glanced around, but no one was near. Beth followed my gaze. Who are you looking for? Hoping the boy would be back with another load, I faced Beth and pretended to be unafraid. If you'll excuse me, I need to get back to work. If you'll excuse me, Beth parroted, I need to get back to work. You're such a loser, Morgan. The cold of the refrigerator, combined with my fear, made me shiver. Beth noticed. What's wrong, Morgan? Are you cold? I pictured her closing the door and locking me in, and a wave of claustrophobia swept over me. Suddenly desperate to get out of the refrigerator, I stepped toward her. The move must have been unexpected because she took a step back, but not enough for me to get past her. Where do you think you're going? she asked, a malicious look on her face. Just then, the boy I'd followed earlier arrived, another box in his hands. Beth, he said, I need to get by. She stepped aside, and he walked past me and set his box down. Seeing my opening, I hurried toward the doorway. Beth moved back into place, again blocking the doorway. What are you doing, Beth? the boy asked as he approached her. Nothing, Josh. What are you doing? Josh glanced at me, then back at Beth. I'm trying to do my job, unlike you. I looked at the boy as he stood in front of Beth. He was taller and bigger than her and obviously not intimidated one bit. Sighing, Beth walked away. Josh turned to me. She doesn't like you. You think? I wanted to say, but just nodded. I'm Josh, by the way. Morgan. He held his hand out, indicating that I should exit the walk-in refrigerator first. Thanks. I went past him and headed to the sink, deciding that even though doing dishes was boring, at least it would be safe. Halfway through my shift, someone bumped into me, hard. My stomach jammed against the edge of the sink, and I dropped the pot I'd been scrubbing. It landed with a splash, soaking the front of my shirt. Someone laughed behind me, and I turned to see Beth, a grin on her face. Oops! Anger boiled inside me, making me bold. What's your problem, Beth? You are. I stared at her. Why? What did I ever do to you? She seemed surprised by the question, like no one had ever asked her that before. Nothing. I guess I just don't like you. The unreasonableness of her answer was so ridiculous that I stared at her. Deciding not to escalate things, I turned my back to her and picked up the pot I dropped. Tell you what, Morgan, she said. What? I didn't turn around. I'll make you a deal. I turned to face her. If you give me your power bars each day and don't report it, I'll leave you alone. Those power bars were what kept me from feeling famished each day. Without them, I wasn't sure I would have the energy to do everything that was expected of me. But if Beth kept her end of the bargain, maybe it would be worth it. I'll give you half of mine. She shook her head. Nope, I want it all. I'll bet you do, I thought. I need to keep a few, I said, or I'll be too hungry. She laughed. Why would you think I care? I felt stupid for even suggesting it. She must have taken my silence for refusal. If you'd rather not, she said, I understand. Then she jabbed me in the forehead with her finger at the same time that she stomped on one of my feet. Ow! I cried out. A few people looked our way, but Mrs. Coleman and the other adult supervisors were busy and hadn't noticed. Okay, okay, I'll give you four. She scowled. What are you, an imbecile? I was surprised her vocabulary included three-syllable words. It's all or nothing, Morgan. My foot throbbed, and I felt a small bruise forming on my forehead. I'd gotten nearly one bruise per day since I'd been at Camp Willamoss, and I had no desire to get any more. 
Plus, I was tired. Tired of constantly having to watch over my shoulder. Tired of being bullied. But I was also too tired to fight. Fine. My teeth clenched as I spoke. You can have them all. She smiled. Bring them to my room after dinner each night. I watched her turn and walk away. Feeling defeated that I'd let her win, I turned back to the sink and tried to put her out of my mind. But then a new worry filled my thoughts. What would my punishment be if they caught me giving away my food without reporting it? Chapter 23 At lunch, I sat with my group. As we ate, the two power bars on my tray seemed to mock me. I finished my meal, and the others ate their power bars, but mine sat untouched. "'Are you going to eat those?' Billy asked, pointing to the wrapped bars. "'Of course,' I said, "'but I'm saving them for later.' "'That's kind of frowned upon,' Cassidy pointed out. "'Why? I guess they don't want anyone to stockpile food. They want us to eat it when they give it to us.' I picked up both power bars and shoved them in my front pocket. They might get a little smashed in there, but I had nowhere else to put them. I think it would be better for me to eat after my workout, I said. Cassidy shrugged. I wanted to stash them in my room before going back for my final shift of kitchen duty, so I excused myself, dropped off my tray, and headed toward the elevator. I hurried to my room and put the bars under the clothes in my closet, then went back to the kitchen and started on the pile of dishes that had materialized since I'd stopped to take my lunch break. I got through the shift without incident and went back to my room, made sure the power bars were where I'd left them, then did a little homework before class. When I got to social studies, I decided to do a little test. I sat in the same seat I'd sat in before, the one Beth had claimed was hers, then waited for her to arrive. A few minutes later, she walked in. She glanced at me, then sat in another seat and ignored me for the rest of the class. Elated that she seemed to be keeping her end of the deal, I decided sacrificing some of my food was worth it. At the end of class, I gathered my things and went to science. Harley was already there, and the seat next to him was empty, so I hurried over and sat down. Ever since I'd found out that he used to sit at my table, I'd been wondering what had happened. Hi, Morgan. How's it going? Good. Any more trouble with Beth? I remembered Piper's warning to be careful what I told Harley. Not really. That's good. Now that I had the opportunity to talk to him... I didn't know how to broach the question of why he'd been banished from our table. How long have you been at Camp Willemoss? He looked thoughtful. About three months. Oh, how much longer until you can leave? Five weeks. I didn't have any more small talk, and I wanted to get to my question before class started, so I dove in. I heard that you used to sit at the table where I sit. Where'd you hear that? Obviously, he wasn't eager to talk about this. Uh, from Piper? Piper, huh? Yeah, is it true? Is what true? That you used to sit at that table. Why do you care? Never mind, I muttered, embarrassed now for prying when he clearly had no intention of spilling his secrets. He ignored me and began reading his textbook. I didn't want him to be mad at me. I had few enough friends as it was. I'm sorry I asked. It's none of my business. He looked up from his textbook and gave me a small smile. Then the teacher arrived and class began. At dinner, I put my two power bars in my pocket as soon as I sat down, so that it wouldn't be so obvious that I wasn't eating them. "'Tomorrow's the big day,' Billy said. "'Challenge day.' No one at our table seemed excited about it. Could it be as bad as they said, or were they exaggerating? "'I wonder if they'll let us pick our teams this time, or if they'll assign us,' Cassidy said. "'I'm not sure which is worse,' Alex said. Remember when they had us in groups of five, and they had four of us carry that huge tire over our heads with a fifth person sitting on top? Yeah, Piper said. Cindy fell off and broke her leg. I felt so bad for her, Cassidy said. I can still remember the sound of her bone breaking. Piper grimaced. Yeah, that was awful. Accidents can happen even if you're having fun, I thought, trying to reassure myself that the Saturday challenge wasn't as bad as they made it sound. It probably never would have happened, Billy said, if the enforcers hadn't sprayed that grease on the ground right in their path. When that team stepped on it, there was no way they could keep that tire up. The enforcers wanted them to fall? The idea horrified me, but when I thought of the discipline I'd experienced in the gym at the hands of Hansen and the other enforcer, the notion that they would purposely make people get hurt didn't surprise me. 
Suddenly, I was certain that the Saturday challenge was a lot worse than I had imagined. Anxiety surged through my veins, and I frantically tried to think of a way I could escape. I needed a way to get outside, and I needed to cut the chip out of my arm. Both things seemed nearly insurmountable. As horrible as it sounded, the idea of slicing open my arm, digging around until I found the tiny chip, then pulling it out and stopping the bleeding seemed easier than getting to the ground floor undetected and making my way away from this place. But both things had to be done if I had any hope of getting back to my home world. Trying to shove down the fear of what this Saturday challenge might be like, I focused instead on the opportunity it might give me to get away, or at a minimum, to scout out a possible way to escape. What do you think, Morgan? Piper asked. What? I'd been so absorbed in my thoughts I hadn't heard the question. Would you want to be on our team if we get to choose? Of course, I said without hesitation. Who else's team would I be on? Good, Piper smiled, and the feeling that this small group of kids was now my family grew. When I got to my room, I grabbed the two power bars I'd stashed after lunch and hurried to Beth's room. Afraid for anyone to see me there, I knocked softly. A moment later, the door opened. You got em? she asked. I only have the ones from lunch and dinner today. I held out the four power bars and she grabbed them from my hand and shut the door in my face. Irritated that I was the one taking the risk and she couldn't even bother saying thank you, I stood there for a moment, feeling helpless. Then I went to my room and put on a pair of shorts and a tank top and went to the gym. Chapter 24 Since I'd worked out for an hour earlier, I would only have to spend an hour at the gym. When I arrived, I didn't see Mr. Muscles. Maybe I would have a reprieve from his presence. I checked in, got my towel, then went to the warm-up area and stretched out. I got on the elliptical machine and began my workout, going the pace that I preferred. It was hard to focus on the workout since I found myself constantly checking to see if Mr. Muscles had shown up. After a while, I got into the rhythm of the workout and let down my guard. A few minutes later, I felt, rather than saw, someone standing next to me. Dreading the sight of Mr. Muscles, I slowly turned my head. My worry about seeing Mr. Muscles turned to alarm when instead I saw Hanson standing there, grinning. He wasn't wearing his normal enforcer uniform, but instead was wearing sweats and a t-shirt. For a split second, I thought he looked less terrifying, until I looked into his cold, cold eyes. You're not Mr. M- Austin? I blurted. No, I'm not. Unlike you, he gets to have a life, so I volunteer to cover his shift. My heart jackhammered against my ribs, and I looked away, hoping he would leave me alone. But like most things I hoped for in Camp Willamos, it didn't happen. You need to pick up the pace, Morgan, he sneered. You've got a lot of fat to burn off. Fury and fear mixed together, making me lose focus, but my hands tightened on the grips and I made myself go faster, terrified what would happen if I tried to defy him. He checked the small device in his hands, then looked at me. He stood there for several minutes, his eyes going back and forth between me and the device. Finally, he said, Good. Now keep that pace going for twenty minutes. He paused. I'll be watching. Then he turned and sauntered away. To keep myself going, I replayed the scene when I'd first arrived here, and I'd driven my knee into his groin and he'd collapsed to the ground. A small smile lifted my lips as I pictured the surprised expression on his face when it had turned out I'd been conscious the whole time and I'd bested him. I began my frequent fantasy about escaping this place and finding the tunnel that would lead me home, but I must have gotten too caught up in my musings and slowed down because I felt a sharp pain in the back of my right leg. Whipping my head to the side, I saw Hanson standing there, his baton in his hand. "'Didn't I tell you to keep that pace going?' His eyes were like chips of ice. When I tell you to do something, Morgan, I expect you to do it. Petrified to say or do anything that would anger him, I stared back. He held up his baton in a threatening manner. Agreed? Yes, I whispered as I moved my feet faster. He slammed the baton into his other hand with a whack. Then he smiled. Tomorrow will be your first challenge day. A look of anticipation lit his face. That's my favorite day of the week. When he walked away, I couldn't stop tears from filling my eyes. Blinking rapidly to clear my vision, I glanced at the kids nearby who seemed absorbed in their own workouts. Whether they really were, or whether they were just trying to stay out of my altercation with Hanson, I didn't know. 
Misery settled over me like a thick and suffocating fog, but I kept my feet moving, too afraid to do anything else. Though I wanted to lose myself in my escape fantasy, I kept my mind focused on my workout, not wanting to give Hansen another excuse to hit me. As much as I hated Mr. Muscles, at least he'd never hit me. Hansen had hit me twice now and had clearly enjoyed it. As I finished on the elliptical and moved to the weight machine, I tried to ignore the throbbing in the back of my leg and instead focused on getting through my workout. When I had fulfilled my workout hours, I checked out and hurried to the relative safety of my room. Alex wasn't there, and I allowed myself to sob quietly for five minutes as I mentally listed all of my woes. Stuck in this horrific world, imprisoned in this labor camp where I was beaten if I didn't exercise in a way that my tormentor wanted, only allowed limited food, bullied by other inmates, and forced to have a computer chip in my arm to track my every move. At the last thought, I rubbed the place where the chip resided until I felt the tiny hard lump, knowing I would have to jam a knife or some other sharp instrument into my flesh to dig it out before I had any hope of escaping this place. I wondered if I could get a sharp knife from the kitchen without anyone noticing. So far, I'd only been allowed to wash pots and pans. Someone else must be responsible to clean the knives, but I decided I would at least locate where they were stored. Feeling better, I showered and worked on homework until it was time to meet with Mrs. Reynolds and the rest of the criminals. When I arrived in the classroom, most of the other kids were there, including Billy. I sat in the seat next to him. Hey, he said as he smiled at me. Hey. I remembered what he'd said the night before about breaking the rules to help someone you cared about and again wondered what his story was. I didn't know how to go about asking him, so I just sat there and said nothing. "'Good evening,' Mrs. Reynolds said as she strolled into the room in her typical happy mood. After we recited the pledge, she looked at each one of us in her X-ray vision way, which always made me uncomfortable. Her gaze seemed to linger on me and Chad Beacon. "'As most of you know,' she began, "'tomorrow is Saturday Challenge. We have two new campers this week who have not yet had the opportunity to participate in our Challenge Day.' All eyes swiveled between Chad and me and my face heated." As those of you who have participated know, Saturday Challenge is all about teamwork. Not from what I'd heard. I kept my thoughts to myself, hopeful that the other kids had just been trying to scare me. Now, Tyler, Mrs. Reynolds said to a dark-haired boy, why do you think it's important to work as a team? I half listened to his answer as I imagined what the next day would bring. Hansen had seemed excited about Saturday Challenge, which didn't bode well for us campers. Any time he was having fun, we were bound to be suffering. Chapter 25 During my first kitchen shift the next morning, I kept an eye on the knives, who used them, where they were kept, and plotted how to take a small one. The adults in charge seemed to keep careful track of who was using the knives, and when they were done being used, they were hand-washed, not by me, obviously, since I only got to handle pots and pans, then put in a locked drawer. I knew it was locked because my supervisor, Mrs. Coleman, had a key in her pocket that she took out and used each time she opened the knife drawer. As I surreptitiously watched Mrs. Coleman, I knew I would have to distract her to either get the key or to take a knife. Maybe I would even have to get someone else to help. The only person I trusted was Piper, but I didn't know if she would help me. At breakfast, I put my power bars in my pocket and tried not to think about the competitions that would be taking place later that day. When I got to the gym after breakfast, I was almost afraid to go in, worried Hansen would be covering for Mr. Muscles again. Forcing myself to walk in, I glanced around but didn't see Hansen anywhere. But Mr. Muscles was there. I went about my business, hoping I could get through my workout without being harassed. After my warm-up, I started on the treadmill and tried to do what I knew was expected, but after a few minutes he came over. He seemed more cheerful than I'd seen him before. "'You excited about the Saturday challenge?' he asked. "'This is your first time, right?' So that's why he was in such a good mood. My anxiety over what happened in this competition went up a notch. If both he and Hansen enjoyed them so much, that could only be bad news for me. I nodded and kept jogging. I'll be watching you. Great. 
He finally walked away to bug someone else, and I finished my workout without him bothering me. During my pre-lunch shift, I was asked to help put together box lunches. Unfortunately, I wasn't given any sharp utensils to use, but rather just boxed up the food that others had put together. I stood next to Piper at a long counter. What's with the box lunches? At 12.30, she said, we're all supposed to meet in the cafeteria wearing our workout clothes, then everyone goes outside to eat. Then we'll begin the competition. 12.30? That was in 45 minutes. For some reason, I thought I had a few more hours. What about my last shift? I asked. Suddenly, I wanted to do dishes, if that would give me an excuse not to participate in the competition. Yeah, she said. At least you get out of that. Not what I wanted to hear. Oh. I kept one eye on the clock as we stacked the box lunches in large plastic containers that were then placed on carts, ready to be wheeled out. Okay, everyone, Mrs. Coleman said. You are excused to get changed. Then meet back in the cafeteria no later than 1230. The volume of chatter increased. Was that from nervousness or excitement? I followed everyone out of the kitchen into the elevators. Piper rode up to the sixth floor with me. Will you wait for me before you go back to the cafeteria? I asked as we got off. She smiled. Sure, I'll come get you after I change. We all usually meet up at our table anyway. Oh, okay. We split to go to our rooms, and I hurried and changed, trying not to think about what might be in store. A short time later, I heard a knock at my door. It was Piper. When we got back to the cafeteria, we headed to our usual table. No one was there yet, but a few minutes later, Alex and then Cassidy arrived. "'Has anyone seen Billy?' Alex asked. We all shook our head. "'What happens now?' I asked. "'Enforcers will come and get us and take us outside.' I hoped Hanson wouldn't be among them. Billy finally showed up. "'I was wondering if you're going to make it,' Alex said." And miss all the fun? No way. A few minutes later, a group of eight enforcers entered the cafeteria, and all the chatter among the kids stopped. It was eerie, like someone had hit the mute button. I scanned the faces of the men and was relieved that Hansen wasn't among them. I noticed each one had a taser on his hip, and I felt a twinge as I remembered the experience of being tasered twice. Everyone is here, one of the enforcers said. It was so quiet in the room, he didn't need to yell to be heard. Form four lines, one per elevator, and we'll escort you outside. I stayed with my group as we shuffled toward the elevator. They let five kids on the elevator at a time, with one enforcer per group, but then that same enforcer was still on the elevator when it came back empty. I couldn't imagine they were leaving us prisoners unsupervised once we got outside, so that could only mean there were other enforcers outside. Dread at seeing Hansen tightened my already taut nerves. When it was our turn to get on the elevator, the enforcer who got on with us waved his card in front of the reader. All the buttons lit up, even the one for the first floor. Then I saw one labeled B. That was the one he pressed. I assumed it meant basement. A moment later, the elevator door slid open. A short hallway led to a pair of double doors that stood open, and beyond those doors I saw a large expanse of grass and sunlight. This way, an enforcer who had evidently been waiting said as we walked out of the elevator. As he led our group toward the doors, I felt an odd mixture of elation at the opportunity to be outside and heavy trepidation at what was about to happen. When we stepped through the doors and into the sunshine, I closed my eyes, enjoying the heat from the sun. This was my fifth full day here, but the first time I'd been allowed to go outside. I'd missed the warmth of the sun. Keep moving, an enforcer who had been behind me said as he shoved me in the back. My delight evaporated, and I opened my eyes and trudged forward with everyone else. Piper walked next to me, and as we marched forward I took in my surroundings. There were several long ropes and several sheets of plywood lying on the ground. When we reached what seemed like a random spot on the grass, the enforcer told us to stop and wait there. Kids were standing around, and I saw way more enforcers than I'd seen in one place. I scanned their faces and stopped on one that was zeroed in on me, Hansen. At the look on his face, a chill raced up my spine. I shuddered. "'What's wrong, Morgan?' Piper whispered. Then she followed my gaze. "'Why is that enforcer staring at you like that?' I tore my attention away from Hansen and turned to her. "'He doesn't like me.' "'Why not?' "'I need him in the groin.' Her eyes went wide, then she laughed and glanced at him again. I looked at him. 
His stare had turned murderous, and I realized he must know that I had told Piper what had happened. That had been a mistake, and I knew he would make me pay for it. Stop laughing, I whispered urgently as a new level of terror slipped into place. Sorry, she got herself under control. What's so funny? Cassidy asked. When Piper opened her mouth to speak, I shook my head. I'll tell you later, she said. I hope they're going to give us some of those new power bars, Billy said. I'm craving one right about now. Me too, Cassidy said. They had us pack them in the lunches, I said. Good. The crackle of a speaker filled the air. Listen up, everyone. A tall, thin man wearing slacks and a button-down shirt held a microphone. Who's that? I asked. That's Dr. Tasco, Billy said. He runs the place. I stared at his bespectacled face and wondered if he knew that his enforcers hit campers with batons when they weren't going fast enough on the exercise equipment. The group you're with now, he said, will be your team. There were murmurs from the crowd, including our group. Some groups seemed happy and some seemed worried. I was glad I was with my friends. Quiet down now, he frowned as he waited for everyone to settle down. Before we begin, we will recite the pledge. We all stood and faced him, then as one we spoke, although I had trouble pushing the words past my lips. I pledge to always follow the rules and to take care of my body. I will strive to put the good of all above the desires of one. A healthy me is a healthy world. Very good, Tasco said. Two people from each group will come to the table and gather lunch for their group. On his next words, the volume of his voice increased. You will do this in an orderly manner. Billy turned to us. I'll go. Morgan, do you want to come? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Kids peeled away from their groups and headed toward the table, which was stacked with box lunches and water bottles. You get five water bottles, he said, and I'll get the lunches. Okay. As we approached Hansen and the other enforcers who stood near him, I studiously ignored him, not wanting to make him any angrier at me. As I walked next to Billy, I came within five feet of Hansen, and out of the corner of my eye I saw him standing with his arms folded across his chest. I could feel his stare burning into me. When Billy and I reached the table, I grabbed five water bottles and waited while Billy took a stack of five lunch boxes. Then we walked back to our group and handed them out. The five of us sat on the grass and ate. Everyone was quieter than usual. It almost felt like a last meal before an execution, and my anxiety notched higher. Between the hating stare of Hansen and the horror stories I'd been told about the Saturday challenge, my nerves were stretched tight. I'd eaten everything but the power bars, but then I realized I didn't have anywhere to put them so that I could give them to Beth later. I picked them up and held them, not sure what to do. Finally, I unwrapped the first power bar and took a bite. It tasted as good as I remembered, and I enjoyed eating it. When I began unwrapping the second one, I looked at the other campers and my eyes slid to Beth. She was glaring at me. Crap. But did she really think I could sneak these to her? I didn't have pockets in these shorts. Plus, it would be kind of hard to do these competitions in front of all these enforcers with power bars stuck in my waistband. Hoping the price she would make me pay wouldn't be too high, I ate the second power bar. As I waited for the competition to begin, I looked around, trying not to be too obvious, and made a mental inventory of my surroundings. Tall fence, topped by razor wire. Wow, this really was a prison. Enforcers everywhere, the back side of the building, the doors that we came through hanging open. I couldn't see past the sides of the building, and the grass was a long carpet of green that flowed off into the distance. Billy, I said, is this where you work? He nodded. Yeah, and out front. Out front? Was there a fence with a razor wire out there? Hopefully I could get on the yard crew soon and see for myself. How do you get out here? Do you get to go by yourself? He smirked. Come on, really? Of course I should have known they would never allow that. No, we all meet by the elevators on the third floor, and the enforcers take us down. Oh. Attention, everyone, Dr. Tasco said. Gather your trash and send one group member to throw it away. I'll do it, Alex said as she got up, and we handed her our trash. When she returned, the others stood, so I did too. Very good, Dr. Tasco said. Then he looked at each of the groups. Time to begin. Chapter 26 In today's competition, Tasco said, we will begin with everyone's favorite, dodgeball. I smiled. That didn't sound so awful. In my world, fewer and fewer schools allowed dodgeball, and it had been a long time since I'd played, but I didn't think it was too bad. 
There are 30 teams of five each, Dr. Tasco said. We will assign your team a number, and when we call your team forward, you will line up where directed. Someone came around and counted off the teams. Our group was Team 20. I glanced at my team members, but no one said anything. The first ten teams were called forward and lined up so that Team 1 was opposite Team 2, Team 3 was opposite Team 4, etc. Then enforcers set six red balls on the ground exactly between each team, six for each set of teams. They looked like the balls I'd always used when playing dodgeball. If you're hit, you're out, Tasco said. The team who eliminates all the players from the opposing team wins, or, at the end of three minutes, whichever team has the most players still in, wins. The members of the winning team will gain one point. The members of the losing team will be deducted one point. However, after the first round, the losers will play each other, and the winners will play each other. So in round two, you will have the opportunity to regain or lose more points. I watched the five games that were going on simultaneously. It was two wins out of three, so the first round for some teams lasted nearly ten minutes, but it didn't take long before the first group had completed its first round. Our team, along with nine other teams, was called up to play next. Remember, Billy said to us as we walked to our assigned position, we need to move fast to grab the balls when they blow the whistle. Then we need to work together to get the other team out, so Alex and I will work together to get out the people across from us, and the rest of you work together to take out the people across from you, starting on the right and working your way down. That way they won't be able to catch the ball. Hoping I understood his strategy, I nodded. Obviously, they'd played together before, but this was all new to me. We stood where the enforcers told us to, and I looked at the five people standing across from us. They didn't look very tough, and I hoped that meant we had a good chance to win this round. I watched as enforcers set six red balls on the ground exactly between us. When I looked at the referee, who lifted the whistle to his mouth, my heart lurched. What if I messed up and ruined it for our whole team? Would they hate me? Would I be banished from the group? The whistle blew and I shot forward, along with the nine others in our match. I reached for one of the balls, but someone on the other team grabbed it first. Rushing backwards, but making sure to stay within bounds, I frantically glanced at my teammates and saw they had managed to grab four of the balls. Balls started going back and forth. One flew right toward me. It must have been instinct that made me catch it, because I didn't really consider myself very athletic. "'Throw it, Morgan!' Piper shouted next to me. I heaved the ball at the person on the far right of the opposing team, at the same time Cassidy threw her ball. Our teamwork paid off because we hit the boy and he was out. Elated, I wanted to yell, Yes! My joy was short-lived as the ball struck me unexpectedly and I was out. Crap! I stepped out of bounds and watched as we took out two more members of the opposing team. Then Cassidy was hit, and she came over next to me. Secretly, I was glad I wasn't the only one on our team who'd been hit. The whistle blew. The three-minute match was over, and we'd won. We played two more matches and lost the second. I got taken out again, but so did Billy and Alex. In the third match, I managed to stay in, and we ended up winning. Overall, in the first round, our team had won... We went back to our place to watch the last ten teams finish off round one. When it was our turn to play in round two, we played a different team. It was tougher, but we managed to win two of the three matches. We're going to make things a little more interesting for the final round, Dr. Tasco said. We will extend the play time to four minutes, and you will now use basketballs. Oh no, Piper moaned. Not understanding the significance, I asked, what? "'Have you ever held a basketball, Morgan?' Cassidy asked. "'Of course. Don't you think they're just a bit heavier than a dodgeball?' Suddenly, I understood why Piper had sounded upset. If I got hit with a basketball, it would hurt. A lot. "'We will begin with the losing teams,' Tasco intoned. "'Who, by the way, are already down two points. But, to help them out, this round will be worth two points. Whoever wins their round will gain back the two points they've lost.' He smiled in the fake, creepy way that so many of the workers at Camp Willemos had. However, the losers will lose an additional two points, putting them four points down. He looked at all the teams. Let us begin. 
The first teams lined up, and the enforcer set six basketballs in a line exactly between each of the opposing teams. The whistle blew, and the team members raced forward. Balls flew through the air. I could tell when a kid had been hit just by listening. Before, they would shout, Ah! in disappointment. Now there were sounds of people having the wind knocked out of them. As I watched the matches and saw kids double over after being hit, it seemed the minutes dragged by. Finally, the first group of teams finished their matches and walked off the field. The ones who had lost had a strong look of defeat about them, but even the winners looked beat. The next set of teams had lost round one, but won round two, so their skill, or luck, was a little better than the last group. Once their match began, many of them seemed to throw the ball harder than they had before. When one girl was struck in the head, she dropped to the ground and began to cry. Her team members yelled at her to get out of the way, and she crawled off of the field. I turned away from her tear-streaked face and looked at the row of enforcers who were watching. None of them seemed disturbed by what was happening. My gaze settled on Hansen. He was vigorously chewing gum, a broad grin on his face, as he watched the misery of the kids who were playing. When the whistle blew, ending the match, a shiver of fear raced up my spine. It was our turn. I glanced at Piper, whose face had paled, then glanced at Billy. "'Stay sharp, Morgan,' he said with an encouraging smile. I nodded and walked with my team to our position. The other team lined up across from us. I looked at the faces of the opposing team and my eyes locked on Beth, who grinned at me. Was our deal still in play, or since she'd seen me eat the power bars at lunch, would she consider it null and void? I had no idea. Chapter 27 A pair of enforcers walked over with the basketballs, and as they set each one down, my pulse rocketed higher and higher. They stepped back and the whistle blew. I hesitated before moving and lost my chance to grab a ball. Backing up quickly... My eyes shifted from side to side as I tried to stay aware of everything that was happening. Morgan, Alex called out. In the split second that I had looked to my left, Beth had taken aim at me and thrown the ball. I dropped to the ground and heard the ball whoosh past my shoulder. I didn't have time to notice where it went after that because someone else on her team threw another ball at me. I saw it in time and actually caught it. Jumping up, I threw the ball as hard as I could toward the boy across from me, he caught it easily, then threw it back at me. Since I just caught it, I felt confident I could catch this one as well, but he threw it right at my stomach. I did catch it, but only because when it hit me in the gut, my instinct was to wrap my arms around my stomach, which kept the ball in my arms. Throw it, Morgan! Throw it! I wasn't sure who was yelling because I was so focused on trying to get my breath back after getting the wind knocked out of me. I looked up and saw Beth laughing at me. Anger welled up inside me, and using all my strength, which admittedly wasn't much, I hurled the ball in Beth's direction. To my utter shock, I actually hit her, and she was out. She scowled at me and left the field, but I knew better than to spend more than a split second savoring my victory. There were still four people trying to hit the five of us. Having one of their team members eliminated seemed to enrage the rest of Beth's team, and the two of them that held balls threw them at me at the same time. As the balls flew toward me, I avoided being hit by one of them, but couldn't avoid the other, and I was out. Panting, I walked off the field and watched the rest of the match. The other team took out Alex just before the whistle blew, and the game was over. We'd lost. We lined up for the next match, and I glanced at Beth, who glared at me. The enforcer set the basketballs between us, and the whistle blew. Determined to grab a ball, I shot forward, but Beth got there a fraction of a second before me. You're going down, she muttered. I jumped back and prepared for her throw. A second later it came. Ready this time, I caught it, my arms stinging as the rough surface slapped my skin. Focused on my task, I barely registered Cassidy's shout of pain next to me. Instead, I hurled my ball at the boy standing next to Beth. Watch out, Cam, she yelled, but it was too late and he was out. Feeling good, I watched as Beth picked up the ball that had taken out her teammate, but then a different ball hit me in the arm and I stepped out and went to stand next to Cassidy. She was rubbing her head and had tears in her eyes. 
We watched the rest of the match, and a few seconds later, Piper was hit in the stomach, and she collapsed to the ground, but lumbered over to us. Are you okay? Cassidy asked. I'll be fine, she wheezed. A moment later, it was over. We'd lost, but at least we didn't have to play a third match. Our team huddled together. Hey, Alex said. At least we won the first two. We didn't gain points, but we didn't lose any either. Whatever, Cassidy said. It still sucks. When Dr. Tasco announced that we were moving on to tug of war, I was relieved. Until Piper said, Great. I wonder what they have under those boards. I looked at the sheets of plywood that I'd noticed earlier. Before, I thought they were lying around randomly, but now I noticed there were four boards laid out in such a way as to accommodate four teams at once. Probably just a puddle of mud, Billy said. He was looking at me, and I wasn't sure if he really believed what he said or if he was trying to reassure me. I glanced at the others, but they didn't look like they believed him. We want to make this competition as fair as possible, Dr. Tasco said. So all the boys line up over here. He pointed to one side of the field. And the girls over there. We will choose a mix of seven boys and girls for each team. Billy walked away from us and joined the boys. The four of us stayed together, hoping they would keep us on the same team. A few minutes later, they had us organized into teams. I was on the same team as Cassidy, but Alex and Piper were assigned to another team. Our team consisted of Cassidy, me, two other girls, and three boys. Josh, from my kitchen crew, was one of them. Hey, Morgan, he said. Hi. With seven people per team, there were 22 teams, although four teams were short a person. No one seemed to say anything about the unfairness of it, but those teams looked worried, and I was glad I wasn't on one of them. The enforcers laid out four long, thick ropes, but they were nowhere near the sheets of plywood. Instead, they were in the same area where we'd had the dodgeball games. They called up eight teams at a time so that there were four games of tug-of-war going on at once. Each pair of teams played to see who could win two of the three poles. When the first group went, I watched carefully, trying to figure out if there was anything special they needed to do. But it was all brute strength and who could pull the other team over the line first. When it was our turn, our team got in a single-file line. Boy, girl, girl, boy, girl, girl, boy. I was the third from the front. The opposing team had four boys and three girls, but I was hopeful we could win. The other team lined up next to the opposite length of rope. Get ready, an enforcer yelled. We picked up the rope and held it taut. The enforcer blew a whistle and we began pulling. At first, there was no movement at all, but then we were tugged forward just a little bit. The boys on our team yelled to pull harder, and I pulled as hard as I could. My hands burned on the rope, but I kept pulling. Then we gave a final heave and pulled our opponents over the line. Exhilarated to have won, we jumped up and down and shouted. After a thirty-second rest, it was time for the next match. After some back and forth, the other team won. Come on, Josh said. We've got to win the next one. Two out of three. Come on. A minute later, we were pulling the rope again. It was obvious that the other team wanted to win as much as we did. We tugged and pulled but in the end they were a little stronger than us and we lost. Feeling deflated to be in the losers group, we walked to the sidelines to watch the last group of teams have their match. In round two, we were among the first groups to compete. This time, we were more evenly matched as the other team had four girls and three boys like we did. We won two of the three pulls, making us the winner. Yes, Cassidy said, high-fiving me. At the end of round two, Dr. Tasco spoke into the microphone, wasn't that fun? I nodded. It actually had been pretty fun. But when I looked at my teammates, they weren't nodding. In fact, they seemed wary. As you know, Tasco said with a big smile, we'd like to spice up our Saturday challenge. I thought about them changing the dodgeballs for basketballs and wondered how he would spice up this game. Several enforcers were moving the ropes we'd been using over to where the sheets of plywood were laid out, and I had a strong sense of foreboding. We have two types of motivations to win this next round. Tasco looked over to a large basket that an enforcer set on a table. First, the winners will receive their mail for the last week. A murmur went through the crowd and my heart leapt as I imagined being handed a stack of letters from Mom. I'd wondered why she hadn't written to me. I thought maybe she was mad at me for being so stupid about the cookies. 
but maybe she actually had written and they just withheld the letters. The losers will have to wait a while longer to receive their letters. And, a large grin split his face, the losers will have a little surprise when they're pulled across the line. He nodded toward the enforcers who stood next to the sheets of plywood. The men lifted, then moved the sheets to the sidelines. From where I stood, I couldn't see what had been underneath, but I heard a girl shriek and alarm bells clanged in my head. I want each and every one of you to be motivated, Tasco said, so please take a moment to peek at what's inside. I walked forward with my team. When the people in front of me got a look at Dr. Tasco's surprise, they gasped. As we got closer, I saw a shallow trench about four feet across and six feet long. But when I looked inside, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and I recoiled violently, running into Josh, who stood behind me. Chapter 28 Inside the shallow trench were thousands of spiders, black and brown, large and small, all trying to climb out from under the flimsy screen that was laid on top of them, keeping them from escaping. Several had made it out and were walking on top of the screen. I flashed back to my trip through the tunnel and the spider that had been hanging from the dirt ceiling. It had startled me so much that I dropped the lantern, which had plunged me into darkness. Abject panic swept over me. No, 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 I whispered as I backed up farther, forcing the people behind me to move. Get a grip, Morgan, Josh said through clenched teeth as he squeezed my arm. You're giving them exactly the show they want. His words penetrated my mind, and I looked at the enforcers who were watching us and saw the enjoyment on their faces. My eyes settled on Hansen, who was staring at me with an expression of absolute pleasure. I had to get it together. The people in front of me had moved past the trenches and back to the sidelines. I forced myself to follow them, avoiding looking into the trench as I passed. "'Are you okay, Morgan?' Cassidy asked, her forehead creased with concern. "'No, I'm not. I couldn't pretend in front of her. I was terrified of falling into that trench and having the spiders swarm up my legs and into my clothing, my hair, my mouth. The idea sent shudders rippling over me. "'Why do they do this?' "'Because they hate us,' she said." I don't understand this place, I whispered. I know, it's awful. I had meant this world in general, but Cassidy was right. Camp Willemoss, and I assumed all of the other fat centers, were meant to punish, not just to help us establish healthier lifestyles. Did the people outside know what went on here? Or, when it was time to leave, did the enforcers threaten to bring you back if you told? Or maybe people had told, but no one believed them. Who would? Our group stood the farthest from the trenches. I think they'd all noticed my reaction and were somehow trying to protect me. My gaze darted down the long, grassy area next to the building, and I wondered where it led. We'll begin in a moment, Tasco said into his microphone. But first, send one person from each team to get a bottle of water for each team member. I'll go, Josh offered. I watched as he and twenty-one other people walked to the table where bottles of water were set out. I couldn't help it. My gaze was drawn toward the trenches, and I squinted when I saw movement near the edge of the nearest one. A girl standing not far from the trench must have seen it too because she jumped back and pointed, and those around her backed up a few steps. Some of the spiders were crawling out of their trench. A pair of enforcers walked over to see what was going on, spray bottles in their hands. When they saw the spiders on the grass, they sprayed something at them and swept them back into the hole with their feet. Then they sprayed a fine mist over the first trench. I fervently wished it was some sort of lethal spray, but it was probably just something to keep the spider sluggish until it was time to begin the fun and games. I imagined what it would be like if I was pulled into one of the trenches, spiders crawling up my bare arms and legs, into my hair, down my shirt. How many of them would bite me? What if I wasn't able to get rid of them once I got out of the trench? Would they stay in my clothing? Horrified at the idea, the urge to escape became overwhelming. Looking around wildly, I saw several enforcers managing the spiders in the trenches, while others were watching the kids who were gathering the water bottles. Still others were moving the tug-of-war ropes so that they were lying on top of the open trenches. Taking a deep breath, my heart slamming against my ribs, 
I darted away from my group and toward the long stretch of grass shaded by the tall building. I didn't hear any voices yelling at me to stop. Had anyone noticed me running away? I kept running, staying in the shadow of the building, and after a moment I reached the end of the building and stopped. I peered around the corner, studying my surroundings. A path led from the large glass front door of the building to a gate. A pair of enforcers patrolled the area near the gate, but next to the gate was a parking lot, and beyond the parking lot, freedom. My heart pounded to be so close to a way out. I forgot about the spiders and focused on how I could escape. I would have to get past the enforcers, but if I managed that, I could get out the gate. "'Going somewhere?' a voice said behind me. Startled, I spun around. Hansen stood there, his lips pulled into a huge grin. My gaze darted behind him, but he was alone. He looked back the way he'd come. Nope, it's just me. Then his grin widened. Time for a little payback. He balled up his fist and slammed it into my stomach. Oh! I gasped as I doubled over, then fell to my knees. This was so much worse than when the basketball had been thrown at my gut. Then, I'd been able to catch my breath after a brief moment. Now, not only could I not breathe, I thought I was going to vomit. On my knees, I held one arm across my middle and pressed my other hand into the grass, desperately trying to draw a breath. You didn't really think we wouldn't notice you running off, did you, Morgan? Hot tears of defeat sprang to my eyes as I looked at the blades of grass inches from my face. Hansen pinched my upper arm hard. And with this little beauty tucked into your arm, we always know exactly where you are. The chip. I'd forgotten about the stupid chip in my arm. I'd been so panicked about the spiders that I hadn't thought things through. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Still kneeling on the ground, I stayed in place for another minute until I started to feel marginally better. Time to go back. Hansen grabbed one of my arms and pulled. I let him lift me up, but I couldn't stand straight because my stomach still throbbed with pain. You're such a wimp, he said. Work harder in the gym and maybe you'll toughen up. Was this supposed to be a pep talk? A way to motivate me? The only motivation I had was to get stronger so I could fight back. I imagined driving my knee into his groin again and my lips twitched with a suppressed smile. Chapter 29 Hansen kept a grip on my upper arm as we walked back to the field. All eyes were on me as we came into view. There she is, Dr. Tasco said into the microphone. Heat flooded my face and my gaze went to Billy. He was smirking, but he gave a slight nod like he approved of what I'd done. Somehow that made me feel better, even though I had obviously failed in my attempt. Hansen walked me up to Dr. Tasco, then held onto my arm as we stood there. "'What's your name?' Tasco asked, his hand over the microphone. "'Morgan,' I said softly. Tasco held the mic to his mouth. "'Morgan here doesn't seem to like our Saturday challenge.' He looked at me. "'Why is that?' It was then that it occurred to me that they didn't know my fervent desire was to escape this place— all they knew was that I had run off. They didn't know why. I could use that to keep them from knowing the truth. It's just the spiders, I said. I don't really like spiders. Tasco smiled. Ah, I see. He looked at the assembled group. Morgan doesn't like spiders. He glanced at me, then looked back at the group. Maybe we should let her sit this one out. Oh yes, I thought, my hopes surging. Please let me sit this one out. Who thinks it's fair to let Morgan not participate in the rest of our Saturday challenge? I frantically looked for raised hands, but not a single hand was raised. Sorry, Morgan, Tasco said into the mic as he looked at me. Looks like you'll have to join in, just like everyone else. No special treatment for you. My heart sank. Go join your team. Hansen let go of my arm, and I walked over to Cassidy, who squeezed my hand and then let go. Time to get started, Tasco said. As I looked at him, pure loathing washed over me. He was evil. He was in charge of this place, and he allowed his staff to treat us like prisoners. But you are a prisoner, I reminded myself. A criminal. They'll treat you however they want. Black despair sank into me, and I struggled to keep my composure. All I wanted was to curl up into a ball and disappear. 
The first team to compete will be Morgan's team, Pasco announced. Anxiety crept up my body and I couldn't move. The rest of my team had begun to walk toward the closest rope, but I was paralyzed with fear. Move it, an enforcer said behind me, giving me a shove. Forcing my feet forward, I caught up with my group and stood next to the rope, but in the position farthest from the trench. Another team lined up opposite us, and I saw Piper and Alex. We would be competing against them. On their team were two other girls and three boys, so at least we would be evenly matched. Six other teams lined up next to the three other ropes. This won't do, Tasco said, motioning with his head toward an enforcer and then toward me. The enforcer walked up to me and grabbed my arm. Come with me. What had I done wrong now? But the moment he began hauling me toward the front of my team, right next to the trench, I began panicking. Desperately trying to wrench my arm out of his grasp, I screamed, No! 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 You'll stand where I tell you to, he snarled as he yanked me forward, or I'll throw you in the ditch myself. With no doubt he would enjoy throwing me into the pit of spiders, I stood where he told me. My eyes met those of the boy in the first position on the opposing team. He didn't look happy to be there either. I worried that having me in the front would hurt our team. I thought the strongest people were supposed to be in front. But this wasn't about what was fair. It was about what would be most entertaining for the enforcers and Tasco. Using all my willpower, I refused to look at the spiders writhing in a heap in the trench three feet in front of me. This will be two out of three, Tasco said and each match won't be over until at least one person is pulled into the trench. Spiders aren't that bad, Josh muttered behind me. Snakes are worse. I found both equally repulsive, but I had a special fear of spiders. Trying to escape had been a colossal mistake. If I'd stayed calm and under the radar, I could have stayed at the back of the rope and been safe from this horror. Now, chances were excellent that I would fall into the trench at least once. Get ready, an enforcer said, and we picked up the rope and held it taut. The whistle blew, and I felt a tug as the other team pulled us forward an inch. Of its own volition, my gaze was drawn to the trench and the mass of swarming spiders. Morgan, Josh shouted, yanking me back to the task at hand. I leaned back and dug in my heels, pulling the rope as hard as I could. The boy across from me was looking at the spiders now, and I pulled harder, trying to take advantage of his inattention. I felt bad using his distractedness for my gain, but I had to use everything I could to keep myself from falling into the trench. My strategy worked. A moment later, we pulled their team forward enough that his foot slipped into the trench, knocking the screen out of place. The trench was about twelve inches deep, and his foot sank to the bottom, Spiders swarmed upward, desperate to climb out of the trench. The boy screamed and jerked backward, falling onto his bottom, but dozens of spiders were already crawling up his bare leg. He yanked his leg out of the trench and swatted at the eight-legged creatures, but that just moved them from his leg to his arm. Frantic now, he jumped up and shook his arms and legs in a dance of terror. I heard laughter and saw a group of enforcers pointing and laughing, Disgusted by their behavior, I ignored them and kept an eye on the spiders that had crawled out, careful that none climbed onto me. A few moments later, one of the enforcers came over with a bottle of spray and misted the spiders, then used a broom to push them back into the trench. He turned to the boy and sprayed the lingering spiders from his skin and swept them into the trench as well, then placed the screen back on top and set the rope in position for the next match. Chapter 30 the enforcer said something to the boy, and the boy scurried to the back of his team, to the position farthest from the trench. I gathered that once someone had fallen into the trench, they were allowed to move to the back, and someone else had to take the front spot. I looked at the person across from me. It was Piper. Pure terror radiated from her, and when our eyes met, the expression of pleading was clear. She wanted me to take the fall. My heart raced, and I imperceptibly shook my head. As much as I liked Piper, I couldn't help her, because that would mean allowing myself to fall into the trench of spiders, something I could not let happen. My gaze went from her face to the spiders and back to her, and as I imagined the sensation of hundreds of spindly legs touching my flesh, I shuddered. Get ready, an enforcer said. A fine sheen of sweat appeared on my body, making my hands slick. 
I wiped them on my shorts and picked up the rope and held it taut. The whistle blew. Desperately trying not to picture the boy who had slipped into the trench and the way the enforcers had laughed at him, I held onto the rope and pulled like my life depended on it. For all I knew, it did depend on it. What if there were poisonous spiders in there? The thought made me pull harder, but my feet were moving closer to the trench. The other team was tugging us, inch by inch, closer to their side. Come on, I said through clenched teeth. Then, as I slid inexorably closer to the trench, I looked at the opposing team and saw Hansen standing at the very back, his hands wrapped around the rope. He was helping the other team. I couldn't stop the forward momentum, and my feet moved closer and closer to the trench. I pulled with all my might, but it was hopeless. My toes hung over the lip of the trench. It was four feet wide, nearly too wide for me to step over. But as my left foot began to slip inside, I stretched my right leg over the pit and touched the other side. Hope surged through me, but then I saw Hansen let go of the rope. The slack was just enough to allow my team to pull me backward, knocking me off balance. Both of my feet were slipping, one on each side of the trench. I held onto the rope as if it would somehow save me. Then Hansen picked the rope up and yanked, jerking me forward. I let go of the rope, my arms pinwheeling in the air as I desperately tried to catch my balance. The earth gave way under both of my feet as I slid into the pit of spiders. The screen bent downward. Dozens of spiders swarmed up my legs. I could feel every spider crawling on my bare skin. Screaming in horror, I leapt out of the trench and swiped at the hideous creatures. At that moment, I didn't care if Hansen and the rest of the enforcers were laughing at my expense. All I cared about was getting the horrid creatures off of my body. Frantically brushing the spiders off of my legs, I stomped on any that I could, crushing them. After what seemed like an eternity, the enforcer with a spray bottle came over and removed the remaining spiders off of my legs. He told me I could go to the back of my team. I fled from the trench, my heart kicking against my ribs and my body trembling. I stopped behind the last person on my team. Desperately trying to gain control over my racing heart, I bent over, placed my hands on my knees, and dragged in breath after breath. This was the most horrific experience I had ever had. Trying to tear my attention away from how nauseous I felt, I looked at the other three matches that were still in progress. Two people were trying to dislodge the spiders from their legs. Then I looked at my teammates. Cassidy mouthed, It's okay. I nodded, then realized tears were streaming down my cheeks. I wiped them away and saw that Josh was now at the front of our line. Piper was still at the front of hers. I didn't wish for either one of them to have to suffer what I just suffered, but with me as the anchor of our team, it seemed likely that we would lose. A moment later, the enforcer said, Get ready. I was nowhere near ready, but I had no choice but to force down my anxiety and get in the game. Everyone on our team picked up the rope and held it taut. The whistle blew, and I pulled as hard as I could. I couldn't let my team down, even if that meant Piper had to step into the trench. At first, neither side moved, but after a moment, our team pulled the rope in our direction. From where I stood, I couldn't get a clear look at Piper's face, but I could only imagine the horror she was feeling as she edged closer to the trench of spiders. We continued to tug and pull, and after a short while, our team moved backward. Suddenly, Piper's head dropped from view, and she let out a blood-curdling scream. We had won heartfelt regret that I had helped make my friends suffer, mixed with elation that I would receive letters from my family. I dropped the rope and saw Piper struggling to get the spiders off of her legs. Without Hansen's help, their team would have lost the second match and I never would have fallen in the pit. White-hot hatred for Hansen burned within me. Including the times at the gym, he'd hit me three times now, the worst today, when he'd punched me right in the stomach. Then he'd guarantee that I would fall into the trench with a mass of writhing spiders, knowing that I had a fear of them. The man hated me, that much was clear, but how far would he go? It seemed he was becoming more brazen about hurting me. There hadn't been a consequence for what he'd done so far, so what would stop him from doing worse? My eyes went to Hansen, who stood on the sidelines. He was looking at Piper, a grin on his face. 
I had to find a way out of this place before it broke me. Chapter 31 Visualizing the layout by the gate, I wondered if I could cause some sort of distraction for the enforcers guarding the entrance and get past them. Of course, I would have to be outside to make that happen, and I would need to dig the chip out of my arm first. As I considered all the obstacles, I frowned. How could I possibly make this happen? There had to be a way. Let's go, Morgan, Cassidy said to me as our team walked to the sidelines to watch the rest of the matches. We stood on the edge of the field and watched the rest of the teams go through their matches. I noticed some kids who fell in their respective trenches didn't seem to be bothered by it, which kept the enforcers from laughing. If only I'd had that much self-control, but my reaction had been visceral, instinctual, and there was nothing I could have done to stop it. Finally, all the teams had gone through their matches. Thank you for participating in our Saturday challenge, Tasco said, as if we had done it willingly. You will be escorted back inside. If you find yourself with free time this afternoon, use the time to catch up on homework or to get in an extra workout. I'm sure you could all use it. When he smiled, anger bloomed inside me. The way he treated us, like we were worthless, just because we were a few pounds overweight, made me livid. He's such a jerk, I said to Cassidy. Shh, she said as she shook her head. Several enforcers were coming our way to escort us back inside. Why, I asked. It's true. Are we not allowed to speak the truth? You just need to keep it down, she said. Before long, we were back on the sixth floor. Piper and Cassidy came to our room, and the four of us sat on the beds. I wished Billy could be there with us, but no boys were allowed on our floor. What did you think? Alex asked me. You guys weren't exaggerating when you said this Saturday challenge was only for the entertainment of the enforcers. I know, right? Piper said, and those spiders. She shuddered. Trying to forget the whole experience, I nodded. What was up with that enforcer who helped our team, Piper? Alex asked. Piper glanced at me. I think he doesn't like Morgan. Everyone looked at me, obviously expecting an explanation. Yeah, I said. I shoved my knee into his privates on the night he brought me here. They all laughed. The guy holds a grudge, Alex said. You have no idea, I wanted to say, but decided it was best to keep it to myself. There was nothing they could do about it, and if word got out that Hanson had punched me, and then he somehow got in trouble, I had no doubt he would come after me even worse. We were all quiet for a moment, lost in our own thoughts. So, Morgan, Piper said, what did you do? To be sent here, I mean. I know you have to go to counseling, so I know you're here for more than weight loss. I hesitated. What would they think of my crime? After another moment, I decided I would tell them. Let me see if I can remember how they put it when they picked me up. I paused as I recalled that night less than a week before. They said I was distributing high-calorie items to minors. I did air quotes as I said it. Oh, Cassidy said, that's pretty serious. Was it on school grounds? That was serious? I almost laughed at the absurdity. Instead, I nodded. Yes. I looked at all of their faces. Don't you guys think the rules are ridiculous? I mean, come on. I guess I hadn't really thought about it, Cassidy said. It's just the way it's always been. Of course it had, for people who'd always lived in this world. For me, it was craziness, but since they had no basis for comparison, they seemed to have a harder time seeing that. I agree, Alex said. Some of the rules go a little far, but that's what everyone seems to want, and there's not much we can do about it. Do you think people outside know what goes on here, I asked, like in the Saturday challenge? I doubt it, Cassidy said, but to be honest, I don't know if they would care if they did know. Besides our families, that is. I mean, most people hate people who are overweight, so they probably think we get what we deserve. Alex and Piper nodded. I wished I could bring my new friends back to my world where people could choose what to eat and not be punished if they were overweight. Then it occurred to me that maybe these friends existed in the other world. What a crazy thought. It looks like you got the two points back, Morgan, Alex said. What two points? Cassidy asked. Alex told them what I'd done to make up for my mistake. I can't believe you did that, Piper said. Now that you've gone through a Saturday challenge... Would you take that chance again, to extend your stay? I glanced at Alex. I don't know. 
Though I wanted to escape, I hadn't figured out how I would do it. There was a real danger that I would actually have to stay here for my entire sentence. I don't think I could do that, Cassidy said. Piper shifted in place. I can't wait to get out of here, she said, urgency in her voice. I know, Cassidy said. No, Piper said. I mean, I can't wait. I've got to find a way out of this place. Everyone stared at her in stunned silence. She looked at us. After today, I can't take it anymore. I can't stay here for another three months. I have to find a way out. Alex glanced toward the door, then back at Piper. Be careful what you say. I'll help you, I blurted without even thinking. Chapter 32 All eyes shifted to me, but Piper shone with happiness. Really? she asked. You do that? Shocked that I'd said that out loud, I nodded. I don't think I want to be part of this conversation, Cassidy said as she stood. Alex nodded. Yeah, I'm out of here in a few weeks. I don't want to make anything worse. I understand, Piper said. You guys go. Morgan and I will stay here. Alex and Cassidy hurried out, obviously not wanting to be part of anything that could cause them trouble. As soon as the door closed behind them, Piper turned to me with an expectant smile. Do you really mean it? You'll help me escape? Now that I'd said it out loud, I couldn't take the words back, so I decided to tell her what I really wanted. I don't just want to help. I want to escape, too. Her eyes shot open. Really? I nodded. I hoped telling her wasn't a mistake. Then again, maybe with two of us we would have a better chance. Two heads were better than one and all that. Yeah, I said. I've got to get out of this place, too. There was no way I could tell her that I needed to get to that tunnel so that I could cross back into my own world. She would think I was insane and would probably turn me in to get points. But it didn't seem she needed that information. Just getting out of Camp Willamos was reason enough to plot an escape. I've been thinking, she said. There are two parts to this. One, the escape, which will be hard enough, but then two, where to go after. They will hunt us down, or at least try to, so that they can bring us back and make us suffer even more. So, I began, you'd have to stay in hiding for the rest of your life? Well, she said, you would too. Of course I wouldn't, not if I succeeded in getting home, but I couldn't tell her that. Right. What if I failed? Was I prepared to be a fugitive for the rest of my life? Do you know if people have escaped before? They don't exactly broadcast that kind of information, she said, but there's got to be people who have gotten out of here. She paused. In fact, I remember hearing about some kind of underground organization that helps people who escape. You know, they keep them in hiding, especially kids. I thought about Mom and the worry she would face if I was missing. What about the families? What do you mean? Does someone tell them that their kid is missing? She shrugged. I don't know. We didn't know much about what would happen after escaping, but I was pinning all my hopes on getting back to the tunnel. If I succeeded, none of the things in this world would matter. So, Morgan, do you have any ideas on how we can get out of this place? I thought about Hansen and how he'd pinched my arm right where the chip was. Do you think we can get a knife? Piper looked startled. For what? I patted my arm. We'll have to cut the chips out of our arms. Her face paled. I forgot about that. Was she going to back out now? As much as I feared slicing into my flesh and digging out the chip, I saw no other way to make this work. So, can you get a knife? Mrs. Coleman watches the inventory pretty close, she said, but I might be able to. A small one would be better. I paused, but it needs to be very sharp. She nodded. Okay. We'll need a first aid kit, too, to care for the wound. Right, yeah. Do they keep one in the kitchen, I asked? Yes, it's above where they keep the knives, actually. Okay, I paused. Do you think we should try to get the knife and first aid kit right away, or right before we leave? I mean, if those things disappear and we're still around, they might find out we took them. I'd rather be long gone before they notice. Yeah, she said, but when are we leaving? We haven't even figured out how we can get out of this building. We can't even get to the first floor, or the second floor for that matter. The second floor was where I'd met with my caseworker. I remembered the enforcer who'd been sitting behind the desk. How many other enforcers worked on that floor? The gym's on the third floor, I said. 
What if we could get some rope and somehow climb out the window? She shook her head. The windows on that floor don't open. They're also shatterproof. Is that even legal? I asked. What if there was a fire? Then I smiled, an idea forming. Wait, what if there was a fire? They'd have to evacuate us, right? Piper's eyes lit up. I like it. In all the confusion, we could slip away. I nodded. Why hadn't I thought of this before? How could we start a fire, I asked, and where is the best place? What if we started several fires at once, she asked, maybe in the supply closets. There are cameras in there. I remembered seeing them. The bathrooms don't have cameras, she said. I nodded. What could we burn, though? What about our school books, Piper said. Great idea. We could rip out the pages and burn them. But if we do it in the bathroom, would that set off the fire alarm? We'd have to prop the door open, she said, so that the smoke goes into the hallway. We should do it at night, I said, my mind racing ahead, when everyone is asleep and it's less likely that someone would be in the bathroom. It would work better, she said, if we could have fire start in bathrooms on all the floors. It would cause more confusion. We can't even get to the other floors, I pointed out. Plus, we'd have to get other people involved. I didn't like that idea. The more people who knew, the greater the chance that someone would tell. Okay, she said, maybe not all the floors, but more than just ours. Do you have someone in mind, I asked, someone you can trust? A slow smile spread across her face. Billy. I nodded. I'll talk to him after our counseling session tonight. Great, she said. Sudden pounding sounded on our door and we both jumped. Certain they'd been listening to our plans the whole time and were now going to drag us to some awful punishment, I said. Who could that be? Piper's eyes were round with fear. I don't know. I walked to the door, my heart racing, then opened it. An enforcer stood there, a scowl on his face. Your caseworker wants to see you. I glanced behind me at Piper, then looked back at the enforcer. Okay. Now. Chapter 33 I followed him out of my room and down to the second floor, trying to come up with an explanation as to why Piper and I had been talking about starting a fire. The enforcer left me sitting in the same chair I'd sat in before, but a different enforcer sat behind the desk this time. A moment later, Mr. Madsen led me back to his office. Have a seat, Morgan. I did, my heart throbbing painfully. I understand you had a bit of difficulty in the Saturday challenge. What was that about? My mind went back to the horrific experience I'd had an hour before, slipping and sliding closer to the pit of spiders and finally falling in, spiders swarming up my bare legs. I shuddered in memory. Morgan? As I looked at his face, I wanted to slap it. Why did he think I had difficulty? Because the people who worked here, including him, were insane. I decided to play dumb. What do you mean? He sighed, like he expected me to know what he was talking about. You ran off the field, and Officer Hansen had to retrieve you. Is that what you call it? I wanted to shout, when an enforcer who outweighs me by a hundred pounds, most of it muscle, punches me in the stomach, then drags me back to a bizarre game of tug-of-war that's retrieving? My hands fisted, my nails digging into the tender flesh of my palms as I tried to keep control of myself. I just don't like spiders. I managed to say through nearly clenched teeth. Ah, he said, we all have our fears. What was he afraid of? I pictured him falling into the trench, spiders crawling all over his body, then him dancing around in terror. The image made me relax just a bit. I spoke to your mother today, he said, his face serene. The shift in conversation caught me off guard, and I gasped. He talked to mom? What did she say? I blurted the question and knew I'd exposed a weakness. She said she can't afford to pay for you to be here, so you'll have to stay longer to make up for it. My mind galloped at the implications. What would they do to mom if I ran away? Would they punish her? Would they even tell her that I'd escaped? What if Piper and I failed and I had to stay here longer than my six-month sentence? Could I survive that? What are you thinking about, Morgan? 
My gaze went to Madsen's face, and I stuttered a response. I, I, is it possible for me to help on the grounds? He seemed surprised by my response. I didn't know you were interested in working outside. He squinted. There are spiders out there, you know. Not piled in trenches I would have to step in, I thought. Maybe that would help me overcome my fear. I'll have to think about it. He made a note on his notepad, then looked at me. When we met two days ago, we talked about you bringing me some information. How is that coming along? I'm still working on it. He nodded. I see. He reached behind him and picked up an envelope from his desk. As promised, as a member of a winning team, here is a letter from home. Eager to read Mom's words, I took it from him. We will meet again in three days, on Tuesday. At that time, I expect you to have made significant progress on your information gathering. He smiled his fake, creepy smile. In fact, if you have information by then, I will guarantee you a place on the grounds crew. My thoughts churned. If Piper and I weren't able to put our plan in motion by then, this could be my plan B, which meant I would have to come up with something to tell him. I nodded. Okay. He stood, a wide smile on his face. Good. Relief swept through me. Obviously, he had no idea about the plans Piper and I had been making. I followed him out of his office into the waiting area. A short time later, I was escorted to my room. No one was there. I ripped open the letter from Mom and read her words hungrily. Morgan, I hope you're doing well. I miss you. Your brothers and sister miss you too, but we know you'll get the help you need there. I stared at her words. I couldn't believe what she was saying. Get the help I need? I didn't need any help. Upset that she thought I had problems that needed government intervention at a federally assisted thinning center, help she couldn't afford, which meant I would have to stay imprisoned longer, I read on, my elation at getting a letter dampened. You know I love you and support you, it went on, and want you to be healthy. Please follow the rules so that you can come home. I love you, Mom. I turned the sheet of paper over, but that's all there was. Disappointment shot through me, and I folded the paper and put it in the desk drawer. Pushing thoughts of my family, who obviously thought I deserved to be here, out of my mind, I stared at the blank wall and wondered what I should do next. I had over an hour until dinner. Normally, I would have classes right now, but they weren't held on the weekend, so I decided to go to the gym and get some of my workout done. I'd never gone at this time of day and wondered if Mr. Muscles would be there. When I arrived, the gym had more kids than normal. Evidently, everyone's schedule was a little different on the weekend. I checked in, got my towel, then went to the warm-up area. It was crowded, but I found a small spot where I could stretch out. After I warmed up, I walked into the main area to find an unoccupied piece of equipment. Someone was just getting off a treadmill, and I quickly took the girl's place. I started at a fast walk, then moved into a jog. I was hating jogging less, although I would never admit that to anyone here. Halfway through my workout, I saw Mr. Muscles harassing a girl who he seemed to think wasn't working hard enough. When he sped up the treadmill and she tripped, then began crying, I felt awful for her, but there was nothing I could do. I'd been there myself, and I knew how she felt, but I was helpless to stop her pain. After a moment, he hauled her up and made her keep running as tears rolled down her face. I thought about the plans Piper and I had made. Could we pull it off? I frowned. We had to. We had to make it work. I had promised Piper I would talk to Billy that night and see if he would help us, but as I pictured myself telling him, I got nervous. What if he turned us in to help himself? Would he do that? What would happen to us if he did? Chapter 34 I finished my workout, then went to dinner. Everyone seemed more subdued than normal, and I understood why. After the Saturday challenge, there was no doubt who was in charge, and it wasn't us. We were at the mercy of the enforcers and Tasco. Hey, Billy said as I sat next to him. I smiled. Hi. No one else had arrived at our table yet. You survived your first Saturday challenge. Barely. I glanced around, wondering if I should broach the subject of helping Piper and me escape. My worry over telling too many people kept me from coming right out and asking, 
but I decided some well-placed questions could give me an idea of what he thought. How did your team do? We lost, he sighed. That's two more points down for me. That sucks. I stabbed a cooked carrot with my spork. Does that mean you'll have to stay longer? Potentially, but what are you going to do, right? I swallowed the carrot. If there was some way to get out earlier, would you do it? He leaned close to me, his eyes narrowed and whispered, What are you saying, Morgan? Our eyes met and I stared at him as I gauged his trustworthiness. I decided to take a chance. Piper and I are making plans. I had spoken softly, and when he didn't react, I wondered if he'd heard me. Then a slow grin lifted his lips. Is that so? I nodded. Hey, guys, Alex said as she, Cassidy, and Piper joined us. Startled, I jerked away from Billy, but he was as cool as ever. Hey, he said as he picked up his spork and ate. I glanced at Piper, and she gave me a knowing look. I had to admit, it felt good to be working with Piper. Even though I couldn't tell her the truth about where I was from, we had the same goal, get out of this place as soon as possible. If Billy signed on with us, all the better. I ate my food and enjoyed the company of my friends. I definitely like these new power bars more than the old ones, Cassidy said as she opened her second one. I know, right? Piper said. I can't believe you're not eating yours, Cassidy said to me. I'm saving them for later. I set them on my lap so it wouldn't be so obvious that I wasn't eating them. When dinner was over, Piper and I walked together to drop off our trays. So, she asked, what did Billy say? I didn't get that far yet. She looked disappointed. I'll see if I can talk to him tonight. We took the elevator to our floor and separated. I decided to go to the gym to complete my required two-hour workout, but first I had to bring Beth my power bars. I had four, two from breakfast and two from dinner, and hoped she wouldn't make a big deal about not getting the two from lunch. I stopped by my room and changed into my workout clothes, then went to my hiding place to get the two power bars from breakfast. They weren't there. Alarmed, I tried to figure out who would have taken them. Would Alex do that? Fearing Beth's reaction to only getting two, I searched my room but couldn't find them anywhere. Worried now that someone had found them, I stood there for a moment and stared at the wall. Then, not knowing what else to do, I took the two from dinner and walked to Beth's room. I knocked on her door, and a moment later she opened it. About time! She held out her hand, and I set the two power bars in it. She scowled at me. Where are the rest? That's all I have. You're a fat slob and a liar! Even though I knew what she said wasn't true, her words still stung. I had two more in my room, but I can't find them. You don't want to keep our deal? Fine. She began closing her door. Wait. She opened it back up. What? What if I can get extra tomorrow? She seemed to consider this. How would you do that? That's my problem. She grinned. Yes, it is. If I can, then will you still keep your side of the deal? She paused. Yeah, sure. Then she shut the door. Angry that I was allowing myself to be bullied, I went to the elevator and waved my card in front of the reader. How was I going to manage to get extra power bars? And what if I couldn't? Would I be able to handle best bullying? Feeling overwhelmed, I clung to the hope that soon Piper and I, and hopefully Billy, would be able to escape this place and I would be able to get back to my world. The elevator doors slid open and soon I was walking into the gym. After my warm-up, I found an empty elliptical machine and got started on my workout. Five minutes later, Mr. Muscles appeared next to me. Inwardly groaning, I ignored him but picked up my pace. He stood there and stared at me, making me feel extremely uncomfortable. You always use the same equipment, Morgan. I felt his eyes roving over my body and wished I could do or say something to make him stop, but I would only be punished for defending myself. Why is that? he asked, loathing him with every fiber of my being. Although I hated Hansen more, I glanced at him but didn't speak. I asked you a question. Knowing I was helpless here, I glared at him. I choose the equipment I like. He's such an idiot. Why else would I choose the machines I choose? I want you to try something else. Of course you do. I try to keep my expression neutral. I mean now. 
I couldn't believe that he felt the need to make me get off the elliptical and get on some other machine just because he felt like it. Vividly recalling my experience a few days earlier when Hansen and his partner had made me run on the treadmill for 30 minutes, I got off of the elliptical and stared at Mr. Muscles. Obviously enjoying the power he had over me, he grinned. Follow me. As we wound our way across the room, I noticed that no one made eye contact with me. We stopped next to a stair-stepper machine. I hated those things. They made my leg muscles ache. I knew it would be a good workout, but I hated that I couldn't choose what machine to use. Twenty minutes, he said. Then you can go back to what you want. For a moment, I considered refusing. Evidently, he sensed my resistance. Do it, Morgan. His voice was soft, but I heard the threat beneath it. My nostrils flared, and I bit my lip, trying to keep from telling him where to go, but I climbed on the machine. He pressed some buttons. I'll be watching your heart rate. He smiled, but it didn't reach his eyes. Don't disappoint me. I forced my feet to move, fury growing inside me with every step, but I kept going. I had zero choice in this place, and the people here reinforced that idea at every turn. Soon, sweat began dripping down my neck. Though I knew these workouts were good for my body, I couldn't allow myself to appreciate that because my rage at being forced to do them overrode any other feeling. When the twenty minutes were up, I used my towel to mop the sweat off of my face and neck. I was able to complete the rest of my workout in peace. After a shower, I lay on my bed and stared at the ceiling, imagining how my escape would play out. When everyone was sleeping, Piper, Billy, and I would set the fires. We would be forced to evacuate, and when we were outside and everyone was distracted, we would make our move and run out of this place. We would need to cut the chips out of our arms right away. I felt a little tremor of fear as I imagined the pain. But then we would be free. I would find the tunnel, and I would get back to my world fantasizing about walking into my house in my world, and the relief I would feel to be in a normal place made the anger and frustration of this place recede just a little. When it was time to meet with my counseling group, I actually looked forward to it, but only because of the conversation I would have with Billy afterwards. If he joined us, our chances of success would increase. When I told him before dinner that Piper and I were making plans, he would seemed very interested. I hoped that I hadn't misread him. Chapter 35 Billy was already in the classroom, and I sat in the empty seat next to him. Hey, Morgan. Hey. How's Piper? He grinned when he said it, and I hoped that meant he was interested in helping us with our plans. She's great. Such a planner, you know? He smirked. That's what I hear. He glanced around, then his voice dropped to a whisper. I'd like to know more about those plans. My heart leapt at his obvious interest. When can we talk? Come early for dinner tomorrow. Good evening, everyone, Mrs. Reynolds said as she walked into the room. I nodded at Billy, then faced our counselor, my mind racing ahead to our meeting the next day and what his reaction might be. Mrs. Reynolds sat in her chair and held up her tablet. We all scanned in our cards, then sat. As always, we begin with a pledge. All arise. We stood, and when we spoke, I said the words without thinking, my mind on the escape plans. Be seated, she said. Now, as you all know, we've been given the privilege of receiving new power bars. I want to know what you all think of them. Do you like the flavor? Does the appetite suppressant work well? Most of the kids nodded. It tastes better than the old ones, one kid said. Several of the kids nodded in agreement. And are you all making sure to eat your two power bars at each meal? Reynolds asked, her eyes meeting those of each person. When she looked at me, my stomach lurched, but I told myself that no one knew I had been giving my power bars to Beth. I nodded, along with everyone else. She pulled two power bars out of her bag. Someone here is lying. The blood drained from my face, and I knew I'd been caught. Those had to be the bars that were missing from my room. Would that person like to confess now? Her gaze probed each person's face and finally stopped on mine. My tongue seemed to be glued to the roof of my mouth. Finally, I was able to loosen it, and I spoke. I... I was saving them for later. What do you mean, Morgan? Why do you need them for later? What happens then? In case I get hungry. 
You stupid girl, don't you understand the concept of appetite suppressants? Shocked that she had called me stupid in front of everyone, I didn't know what to say. For the next two days, you will only receive your two power bars at each meal, no other food. You must eat them before leaving the cafeteria, understood? Alarmed that I would have zero bars to give Beth, I nodded. I knew she wouldn't care that I'd been caught, and I feared what her reaction would be. I was certain that she would say the deal was off. When the counseling session was over, and for me these sessions were more like punishment meetings than any kind of counseling, I went to my room and got ready for bed. Alex wasn't there, and I wondered where she was and if she would receive the same meal restrictions as me. If so, she would be pissed at me again. As I lay under my covers, waiting for sleep to overtake me, all I could think was that I was glad this horrible day had finally ended. I woke early the next morning and went down to the kitchen. Even though it was Sunday, the meal still needed to be prepared and the dishes still needed to be washed. As I stood in front of the sink, elbow deep in hot soapy water, I felt a sense of calm to be doing something that wouldn't get me in trouble or cause someone to hurt me. Between Hanson punching me, falling into the pit of spiders, and being punished for hiding the power bars, the day before had been the worst day yet. Things would only look up from here. They had to. At the end of the first shift, I was starving, but as promised, all I got were two power bars, although they did allow me to wash them down with skim milk. Piper and I sat together at a table, away from the other kitchen workers. So, she began, as soon as we sat down, did you talk to Billy? We're going to meet before dinner. I eyed her egg-white omelet and fruit. My mouth watered. Should I come? she asked. Let me talk to him alone first, you know, see what he says. But if he agrees, we should all definitely get together. Okay. She put a slice of cantaloupe in her mouth. I unwrapped my first power bar and took a bite. As I chewed, I thought about Beth and what I would tell her. She wouldn't care what excuses I had, only that I wasn't giving her my power bars. As I ate the second one, I hoped that the appetite suppressant was all that it was advertised to be. Otherwise, by lunch, I would be famished. How come you only have power bars? Piper asked. I don't really want to talk about it. She shrugged. Okay. After we'd eaten, we rode the elevator to our floor. Hey, Piper said, I'm going to work out. Do you want to come too? I had always been on my own before, but I liked the idea of working out with a friend. Sure. Okay, get changed, then come to my room. When I got to her room, she was ready, and we headed to the gym. Before walking in, I stopped and looked around. Who are you looking for? Piper asked. Mr. Muscles. Who? Oh, yeah, Austin. She laughed. He's probably off with Alex somewhere. My head jerked toward her. What do you mean? Like getting clean towels or something? She grinned. Or something. I remembered how Alex had defended him when I'd said he was a bully, and I had wondered if she had a crush on him. Then I thought about her reaction when he'd come on to me the other night. She had seemed jealous. Why would she do that? I asked. Isn't she afraid she'll get caught? I guess she's blind when it comes to Austin, Piper said. When I thought of the two of them together, I had to stop myself from gagging. Pushing the image away, I focused on the positive. If he was with Alex, he wouldn't be here to harass me. But then I saw Hansen walking around in a pair of sweats and remembered that he had covered for Austin before. Two peas in a pod. They were so much alike they must be best friends. Great, I muttered. What? Piper asked. I motioned with my head toward Hansen, who hadn't seen me yet. Oh, maybe I should come back later, I said. But then Austin would be there. I didn't know which of them was worse. Then I realized I did. Hansen. Definitely Hansen. Piper grabbed my arm as I began to turn away. No, please stay. She paused. You can't let him stop you from doing what you need to do. I hesitated. If I didn't give him a reason to bother me, maybe he would leave me alone. Okay. Piper smiled. Good, now let's warm up. After we stretched out, we got on adjacent treadmills. As I jogged, I glanced in Hansen's direction, but he hadn't noticed me yet. There were a lot of kids working out, and I hoped he would be too busy bothering them to see me, but my hope was in vain. Look who we have here, he said a few minutes later as he stopped beside me. 
I glanced at Piper, who had a look on her face like she was sorry she'd made me stay. I was sorry, too. Hansen followed my gaze, then looked at me. Nope, your friend can't help you. White-hot hatred pulsed through me, the intensity of it taking me by surprise and making me bold. Why do you hate me so much? He looked as surprised by my question as I felt. Because you're a fat slob who took advantage of one second of my inattention, that's why. I'm really sorry that I hurt you, I lied, knowing I would do it again in a heartbeat. I was just scared. Uh-huh, he stared at me. How'd you like the spiders? A ripple of revulsion rolled through me at the memory. He laughed, then walked away. I watched him retreat, glad he hadn't done anything worse than taunt me. I hated that he had the power to do even that, but at least he hadn't hit me or worse. I turned the treadmill down to a slower pace and looked at Piper. I'm done. I'll come back later. She nodded. Okay. When I got back to my room, I still had an hour until I had to be in the kitchen, so I used the time to finish homework that was due the next day. As I worked, I wondered why I was even bothering. With any luck, I would be gone soon. But the way things had been going, chances were that I would get in trouble for not having my homework done long before I could escape this place. Chapter 36 When I got to the kitchen for my second shift, Beth cornered me right away. Remember your promise. Hopeful I could steal a few power bars to give her, I nodded. Halfway through my shift, Piper stopped by the sink. Hey, she whispered. I think I might be able to get a knife today. Can you cause a distraction? Maybe drop a bunch of pans on the floor or something? I just need Mrs. Coleman to lose track of what she's doing for a minute when we're putting the knives away. Yeah, okay. Just watch for when we're putting the knives in the drawer. She walked away, and I got back to work. I kept looking her way, watching for the right moment. Finally, when there were about ten minutes left in our shift, I saw Mrs. Coleman unlock but not open the knife drawer. I shoved two large pans off of the counter and they clattered on the concrete floor. All eyes shifted my way, including Mrs. Coleman's. I made sure not to look at Piper, not wanting to draw any attention to her. I'm so sorry, I said, bending to pick up the pans. You scared the crap out of me, one girl said. Sorry, I muttered as I set the pans back on the counter. Mrs. Coleman shook her head, then turned back to the knife drawer. I was afraid she would notice a missing knife, but I didn't know how they were arranged and hoped Piper had been able to get a small one that wouldn't be as obvious if it was gone. When our shift ended, we got in line behind everyone else at the lunch counter and collected our meal. Well, everyone else collected a meal. I collected two power bars. The appetites of Preston had actually worked pretty well. I was hungry but not starving, and I found myself actually craving the bars. Piper stood in line behind me, and we went to our usual table. The rest of our group wasn't there yet. Eager to know if my distraction had worked, I asked, Did you get it? A smile slowly blossomed on her face. Yes. I smiled back. Awesome. I paused. Where are you going to put it? Can you keep it in your room, she asked. I would, but they searched my room yesterday, and I'm afraid they might do it again. Why'd they search your room, she asked. I have no idea. How do you even know they searched it, then? You know how I'm only getting power bars to eat? Yes. It's my punishment for saving them, I said. Last night at the counseling thing, Mrs. Reynolds called me out on it. They found two power bars in my room that I'd stashed there. I paused. That's how I know they searched my room. Oh, she said. Well, I guess I'll keep the you-know-what in my room, then. Probably a good idea, I said. A few minutes later, the rest of our group was there. I looked at Alex, thinking about her and Mr. Muscles, unable to believe she would take a risk like that over him. He was so not worth it. Then I noticed that she had her regular meal. Surprised that she wasn't being punished, too, like when I'd forgotten to weigh myself, I unwrapped my first power bar. "'Where's the rest of your food?' Cassidy asked. I glanced at Billy, who had been a witness to Mrs. Reynolds announcing my punishment, but he ignored me. "'I just love them so much,' I said. "'It's all I wanted to eat.' "'Oh.' Cassidy looked confused, but she let the question drop and went back to her meal. I looked at Alex, wondering what she was thinking, but she seemed to be in her own world. Probably thinking about her nasty boyfriend, I thought with disgust. 
It didn't take me long to finish my lunch, and I watched my friends eat their tofu and vegetables. Even though I liked the power bars, and they did a good job of keeping me feeling full, having the same thing at every meal was less than satisfying, and I wished I could have some tofu, too. How are things in the gym? I asked Alex, wanting to see her reaction. I wasn't disappointed as her cheeks flushed, pretty much confirming what Piper had told me. Great, she said. It's a good job. I'll bet. I wondered how often she and Austin slipped away. How long have you been working there anyway? About two months. She took a bite of cooked carrot, a smile on her face. How many people knew about her secret? Then it occurred to me that this was a very juicy bit of information that Mr. Madsen would no doubt be interested in, and it would get Mr. Muscles in big trouble. But if I told him, Alex would get in trouble too, which would defeat the whole point. What were Alex's plans with Mr. Muscles when she got out? Were they still going to see each other? Probably not. She might believe they were, but I would bet she was just a nice distraction for him, and once she was gone, he would move on to another girl. Just the other day, he'd come on to me, so maybe he was already looking for his next victim. One thing was for sure, it wouldn't be me. As the end of lunch approached, Piper stood. I have to run up to my room. You want to come, Morgan? Obviously, she wanted to hide the knife. Sure. Chapter 37 She dropped off her tray. I hadn't bothered to get one. Then we took the elevator up to the sixth floor. We hurried to her and Cassidy's room, and once we were inside, she stopped and looked around. Her room looked just like the one I shared with Alex. What about under the mattress, I said. She seemed to consider the suggestion and said, I have a better idea. She got on the floor next to her bed and reached under the box spring. Curious, I got down next to her to see what she was going to do. She pulled the knife out of her waistband and showed it to me. It was a small paring knife and looked very sharp. I imagined using it to slice into my arm to dig out the chip and hoped I would be able to go through with it. It was going to hurt, bad, but I didn't see any way around it. Next, she used the knife to cut a tiny slit in the gauzy fabric under the box spring, then pushed the knife through the opening and set it on the closest wooden slat. Admiring her ingenuity, I said, Nice! Unless you knew to look there, you wouldn't know anything was amiss. Besides, there were several other places where the fabric was a little ragged or torn, so no one would suspect a knife was concealed there. She stood, pride on her face. That should do it. Now we need to get matches and a first aid kit. Do you think Mrs. Coleman will notice that a knife is missing? I asked. She might, but it was way in the back, so it might be a while before she notices. Where can we get matches? I asked. We'll have to look around the kitchen and see if we can find any. She paused. See what Billy says, too. Right, I said, assuming he wants to be part of this. Yeah. Well, I said, I'd better go. I went back to the kitchen. Piper didn't work in the kitchen again until dinner, and immediately started on the dishes. Twenty minutes after I got there, Mrs. Coleman came by and asked how I was doing. Good, I said. I wondered why she was asking me. She hadn't shown any interest before. Had she noticed the knife was missing? Glad to hear it. You're a hard worker. I can do other things besides dishes if you want. She smiled. I'll keep that in mind. She walked away, and I went back to my soap-filled sink. An hour later, she asked me to help Josh carry boxes into a large storage room. Evidently, a new shipment of food had arrived. Eager to do something besides wash dishes, plus wondering if I might find matches, I hurried over to the boxes stacked in a corner. Hey, Josh said. Hi, I pointed to the boxes. Where do we take these? Grab one and follow me. I picked one up that was marked power bars and followed him to an open door on the other side of the room. He set his box on top of another and told me to do the same. I noticed an open box of power bars and hesitated, remembering my promise to Beth. We've got a lot of boxes to move, Josh said. I turned away from the open box and followed him back to the stack. We made several trips back and forth, back and forth. I purposely lagged behind him so we wouldn't always be in the storage room at the same time. When I got to the room just after he'd left, I hurried over to the open box of power bars and grabbed four, shoving two in each pocket. I pulled my shirt down to hopefully disguise the bulge, then went back to help Josh finish carrying the boxes into the storage room. 
On each trip, I tried to check a different part of the room, looking for matches, but I didn't see any. How were we going to start a fire without matches or a lighter? I felt our plans to escape slipping away. Thanks for helping, Morgan, Josh said as we set the last boxes in the storage room. Any time. I went back to my sink and washed dishes until my shift was over. Not wanting to get caught stashing power bars again, I went to Beth's room to bring her the bars, but no one answered. I brought them back to my room and used Piper's idea to hide them inside the box springs. I lay on the floor next to my bed and looked underneath, but it was hard to see, so I reached up and felt around until I found a place where the fabric was torn. I set the four power bars on a wooden slat, feeling confident they would stay safely hidden until I could bring them to Beth after dinner. Since it was Sunday, there were no classes, leaving me over two hours of free time. Well, it wasn't really free. I had to get in my two hours of exercise. But at least I didn't have to go to school. I decided to take the chance that Mr. Muscles would be in the gym instead of Hanson, and changed into my shorts and t-shirt, then went to the gym. When I went to check in, Alex was sitting behind the desk. Hi, I said, happy to see a friendly face in this place. Hey, Morgan, how's it going? Living the dream, right? She gave me a half smile. Right. I stretched out in the warm-up area and saw Alex's boyfriend wandering among the kids who were working out. Ever the optimist, I hoped he would leave me alone. I did 30 minutes on the elliptical in peace, but 10 minutes after I began jogging on the treadmill, he stopped next to me. Hi there, Morgan. His eyes roamed over my body, and I forced myself to suppress a shudder. Every time you come in here, you're looking better and better. I knew what he was doing, grooming me to take Alex's place. The idea repulsed me more than stepping into the pit of spiders. Ignoring him, I continued jogging. I can help you, Morgan. I can make your time at Camp Willamoss more pleasant. My eyes shifted in his direction, but then I stared forward again. Or... I can make it hell on earth. It's up to you. I couldn't believe he was so blatantly threatening me. Until I remembered the order of things, I was the prisoner and he was not. My gaze cut to him and I said, I know about you and Alex. Chapter 38 The look of stunned surprise on his face almost made me laugh until his hand shot out and gripped my upper arm, making me lose my balance and almost fall. He squeezed until I cried out, Stop! You're hurting me! I used my free hand to press the button to slow the treadmill so I wouldn't fall. He leaned in close enough that I smelled the onion he must have had at lunch. You listen to me, you fat loser! He spoke in a soft but deadly voice. If you know it's good for you, you'll keep that to yourself. Got it? My heart pounded in terror, as I had no doubt he wouldn't hesitate to follow through on his threat. Yes, I managed to say through my suddenly dry mouth. He let go of my arm. Speed up that treadmill, or I'll get your favorite enforcer to make you speed up. I immediately pressed the button to make the belt go faster. Obviously, he was aware of the hate-hate relationship I had with Hansen. He grinned, making it clear he knew that I knew he was in charge. When you're done on the treadmill, spend 15 minutes on the stair stepper. When I didn't answer, he reached toward my arm. Okay, I said in a loud voice. He withdrew his hand. Good. When he walked away, a mix of relief and fear remained. Relief that he was not standing next to me, but fear that he would do something to me because he knew I knew about him and Alex. I should never have said anything. I had hoped that if I told him I knew a secret that he would leave me alone. That had backfired, spectacularly. I finished on the treadmill, then, like an obedient child, went to the stair-stepper. I knew better than to defy him, but the anger at being forced to do something I didn't want to do filled my veins with a cold fury that I hoped I could draw on when it was time to face the difficulties of escaping this place. Ten minutes into my stair-stepper workout, Alex came over to me. Her eyes narrowed as she glared at me, and with a venom I'd never heard before, she said, I hate you. Then she walked away. My feet kept moving on the stairs, but my mind had trouble grasping what had just happened. What had brought that on? What had I done? I finished my workout, only half of my mind on what I was doing, then went to my room, hoping to speak to Alex. She wasn't there. I showered, then went to the cafeteria to meet with Billy before dinner. 
It was twenty minutes before dinner and Billy wasn't there yet. Hoping no one would make me leave, I watched the elevators. The only other people there were the pre-dinner kitchen crew who were getting things set up. I waved to a couple of kids who worked the after-lunch shift with me, but no one bothered me. A few minutes later, one of the elevators opened and Billy waltzed out, looking unhurried. Anxious to hear his response to the plans Piper and I had made, I willed him to walk faster, but it did no good. Finally, he reached my table. About time! He grinned and sat in the seat next to me. What's the rush? Do you have somewhere you need to be? I couldn't help but laugh. Just waiting on you. I see. You don't like me to keep you waiting. You know we don't have much time until the others arrive. He nodded and leaned closer. So what's going on? What are these big plans you and Piper are making? I glanced around, though no one was anywhere close, then spoke in a whisper. We're getting out of this place. He looked skeptical. Is that so? And how, may I ask, are you going to do that? I hesitated at his obvious doubt. If he didn't think we could do it, he wouldn't want to join in. And if he wasn't going to join us, I certainly wasn't going to give him any of the details. Maybe you're the wrong person for me to talk to, I said. Oh, yeah? Who should you be talking to? Cassidy, who's afraid of her own shadow? Or maybe Alex, who's set to leave in a couple of weeks? He was right, of course. There was no one else I trusted who had any motivation to attempt an escape. Look, I said, I don't want to tell you everything unless you're going to join us. He sat back a little. What makes you think I'd be interested in joining your little adventure? How much longer until you get out of this place? I asked. Just under a year. A year? I had no idea it was that long. What did you do anyway? That's not relevant to this conversation. Okay, fine. But wouldn't you like to get out now? Of course I would. That's a stupid question. Then will you join us? He was quiet for a minute. Before I decide, I'd like to hear how you plan on getting out of here. Fair enough, I thought. We're going to set fires. He laughed out loud. What? My face reddened, and I wondered if it was a dumb idea. Wait, he said. You're serious. Well, duh, you asked, and I told you. He nodded. Okay, interesting idea. Tell me more. After everyone's asleep, Piper and I will start a fire in two of the bathrooms on our floor using our textbooks as fuel. There aren't any cameras in there, so they won't see it happening. We'll leave the doors to the hallway open so the smoke will set off the alarm, and the confusion of the evacuation will slip away. He tilted his head. Not bad, Morgan, not bad at all. Pride flared inside me. What about the chips? He patted his arm as he asked. We've already gotten a knife that we can use to cut them out. We still need matches to start the fires and some first aid supplies to take care of the wound. He nodded. I like it. So will you join us? A grin lit his face. Absolutely. Yes. My smile matched his. Will you start a fire on your floor? Makes sense. More floors with fires will cause more confusion. Exactly. He was thoughtful. I think I can get my hands on some matches. Really? Where? They keep all kinds of crap in the sheds outside. I'll dig around and see what I can come up with. Great. I'll work on getting the first aid supplies. He leaned close and I could feel his enthusiasm. Sounds like we have ourselves a plan. As soon as we have all of our supplies, I said, we can set the date. Right, he paused. Have you guys decided where you're going to go once you get out of here? Not really, I hedged. Of course, I knew exactly where I was going, to Fox Run and then to the tunnel that would lead me home. Piper talked about some groups that help people like us who have escaped from fat centers. Oh, yeah? Elated that he was in, I nodded. The noise in the cafeteria was beginning to increase, and I saw kids getting in line. Looks like it's time to eat. He frowned. Sucks that you only get those power bars. Just one more day, I said, and they aren't too bad. I know, but still. He glanced at the kids getting their food. Why'd you really hide those power bars? Is it to take when we escape? Still embarrassed that it was due to best bullying, I nodded, not seeing a good reason to tell him the truth. Yeah. Well, don't worry about it. I'm sure we can find food once we get out, especially if we hook up with one of those groups you mentioned. I smiled. Let's get in line. I saw Alex, Cassidy, and Piper in line ahead of us, but because cutting was deeply frowned upon, Billy and I went to the back and waited our turn. 
After we got our food, we walked toward our table. I was worried about Alex and what she would do. After all, an hour earlier, she'd straight up told me she hated me. Whatever had upset her was surely still on her mind. Her back was to Billy and me as we approached. Piper looked at me, glanced at Billy, then raised one eyebrow in question. I gave an imperceptible nod, and she smiled. "'Hey, guys,' Billy said as he set his tray on the table next to Alex. Alex turned and saw me. Her eyes were like ice. "'You!' she glared at me. "'Sit somewhere else. You're not welcome here.' "'What did I do?' Panic clawed its way up my throat. I vividly remembered wandering from table to table the last time she'd banished me. At least before I knew what I'd done, now I had no idea. Just get out of here, Morgan, before I do something I might regret, and I do mean might. I glanced at Piper, whose eyes were wide as they went back and forth between me and Alex. Then I turned away, my two power bars and bottle of skim milk in my hands, knowing once again I was on my own. A moment later, I was shocked to hear Piper call out to me to wait. I turned and saw her and Billy coming toward me, their trays in their hands. Warmth towards them radiated in my chest, and I knew we were going to make a great team. They were sticking by me, even if that endangered their status at Alex's table. I glanced at Alex, who did not look happy, then smiled at Piper and Billy. "'Let's sit over there,' Billy said, motioning with his head toward an empty table." As the three of us sat, I said, "'What's wrong with Alex? Do you know why she's mad at me?' "'I don't know why she blames you,' Piper said. "'But apparently Austin told her he doesn't want to have anything to do with her anymore.' "'Oh. What's the deal, Morgan?' Piper asked. "'Why is she mad at you over that?' "'I kind of told Austin that I knew about the two of them,' I said. "'He must have panicked and dumped her.' "'Oh, crap, Morgan,' Piper said. "'No wonder she hates you.' He's just using her anyway, I said, as if that mattered to Alex. Enough about Alex's love life, Billy said. Let's talk about what's important. He leaned in and whispered, like getting out of this place. Piper and I both nodded. I told Morgan I think I can get matches, he said to Piper. Assuming I can get those in the next day or two, when do you guys want to do this? Piper's eyes widened. Uh, wow, really? You're not backing out now, are you? Billy asked. Well, no. "'But I guess I didn't think it would be so soon.' "'That's kind of the idea,' he said as he ate his food. "'I'd finished one power bar and momentarily considered saving the other one for Beth "'so that I would have five to give her, "'but I had such a powerful craving to eat it "'that I decided not to worry about Beth just then and opened the second one. "'I know, I know,' Piper said. "'Let us know when you've gotten the matches, and then we can decide exactly when, okay?' "'Okay.' I half listened to their conversation as I savored the power bar. I was beginning to understand why Beth wanted extra. They were so good. Chapter 39 After dinner, I went to my room. Alex wasn't back yet. I got on the floor and retrieved the four power bars I'd stashed earlier, prepared to take them to Beth. As I stared at the colorful wrapping, I couldn't help it. I opened one of them and gobbled it down. I wiped my mouth, then abruptly felt ashamed for my weakness. Now I would only have three to give Beth. Sighing, I carried the three bars to Beth's room and knocked. This time she answered. Hey, loser, she said. I only have three. That's the best I could do. I held them out to her. She snatched them out of my hand. Where'd you get them? I saw that you didn't get any regular food today and that you ate the power bars they gave you. Why do you care? She grinned. I don't. I just wanted to see if you'd say. Then she laughed and closed the door. Ecstatic that she didn't punish me for only getting three, I walked back to my room. As soon as I opened the door, I saw that Alex was inside. Now that I knew why she was mad, I hoped I could do something to fix it. "'What do you want?' she sneered. "'Look,' I said. "'I didn't mean to cause trouble between you and Austin, okay?' "'No,' she said. "'It's not okay. "'He dumped me because he was afraid you'd rat on us.' "'Well,' I said, "'I won't.' "'Doesn't even matter. "'As long as he thinks you might, "'he won't have anything to do with me.' "'Why are you even with him?' I asked. "'If you get caught, "'you wouldn't get out of here when you're supposed to.' 
tears sprang to her eyes, which shocked me. I know, okay, I know it's stupid, but I love him. Yuck. I was completely revolted by the idea. Thinking about the way he'd come on to me, I asked, what do you think will happen with the two of you once you get out? He promised we'd keep seeing each other, she said. I softened my voice. Do you believe him? Yes, he told me he loves me too. Though I knew he had to be flat out lying to her, it was also obvious that she believed it, and that was all that mattered. What if I talk to him, I said. I'll let him know I won't tell anyone about you guys. Would you really, Morgan? The idea of having to talk to him face to face on purpose made me nauseous, but I nodded nevertheless. She walked over to me and threw her arms around me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Despite the task I had just promised, I smiled. You're welcome. She let go of me. Will you do it now? Now? I asked. Like, right now? Yes, please. I sighed. Fine. Then I paused, wondering if there was something she could do for me in return. Alex, if I do this, will you do something for me? Of course, she said. Anything. I wasn't so sure she would feel that way after I made my request, but I pushed onward. When I need you to, will you borrow his electronic keycard for me? Her head jerked back. This is for you and Piper, isn't it? The less you know, I said, the better. She stared at the wall behind me, then her eyes met mine. I don't know, Morgan. You can tell him you need to borrow it, that you need to get outside for some fresh air and you'll give it back. Better yet, just take it and don't say anything. He could get in a lot of trouble if he doesn't have it. Like I cared. If you want me to do this favor for you, I said, I need you to do this for me. When do you want me to get it, she asked. I'll let you know. She hesitated, then smiled. Okay. I hoped she would follow through and wasn't just telling me what I wanted to hear, but what could I do? Thank you. You're welcome, she said. Now, will you go talk to him? I'd better act like I'm going to work out, I said. Good idea. I changed into my workout clothes, then headed to the gym. I wasn't sure that Billy, Piper, and I would need Austin's key card, but it seemed like a good idea to have on our escape night, just in case. When I got to the gym, I went past the office where I usually checked in and stood in the entrance to the workout area. I saw Austin. He was talking to a girl on a treadmill and she was smiling at him like she was flirting. I almost turned around and left, knowing in the long run I'd be doing Alex a favor if they stayed apart, but Austin turned his head and saw me looking at him. He squinted in my direction. I guess he was trying to figure out why I was there. Then he said something to the girl and headed my way. My heart jackhammered as he approached. I didn't relish being anywhere near him, but being Alex's messenger girl made me even more uncomfortable. Morgan, he said as he stopped in front of me. I forced a smile on my lips. Back for another workout? No, I'm actually here to talk to you. His eyebrows rose. Really? I nodded. Let's go into my office where we can have some privacy. When he winked at me, then walked toward his office, I had to force my feet to move, though what I really wanted to do was turn and run. He held the door to his office open for me, and I went inside. My eyes were immediately drawn to the yellow vinyl couch along one wall. He must have noticed me looking at it because he said, Sometimes I need to take a nap. I tore my gaze away and looked at him, wondering if he did anything else on that couch. He motioned to one of two chairs facing his desk. I sat, and he went around to the other side and sat in his chair, which was a relief. For a moment, I'd been worried he was going to sit right next to me. What did you need to talk to me about, Morgan? I hated the way he said my name, like he knew me, like we were friends, which we most definitely were not. About Alex. He frowned. What about her? She's really devastated that you broke up with her. What do you mean, broke up with her? You make it sound like she was my girlfriend. That sort of a relationship is completely inappropriate. Clearly, he was covering for himself. Can we drop the act? He stiffened. Excuse me? Though he made my skin crawl, and I really didn't want to have this conversation, I was only doing this for Alex, and for the insurance that she would get me his keycard when I needed it. 
I care about Alex, I said, and I don't want to see her upset. He laughed. What do you want me to do about it? She'll only be here for a couple more weeks. I promise I won't tell anyone about you guys. Of course you won't, because little Miss Alex would get into way more trouble than I would. Will you give her another chance? He seemed to consider it, then his eyes drilled into mine. On one condition. What? When she leaves, you take her place. I felt myself about to recoil and had to force myself to stay in my seat when I so desperately wanted to leap up and flee. I don't understand. He grinned. Oh, I think you do. What if I say no? Then Alex's heart will be broken. And as for you, how much longer are you going to be here? Not long, if all went as planned. Six months? Six months, he echoed, staring at the ceiling. Then he looked at me. There's a lot I can do to help those six months pass more pleasantly. I doubted that. Or I can make them the worst six months of your life. It's really up to you. And if I agree? Apparently thinking he'd won, he grinned. Then you can go tell Alex that she can forget what I told her today. Why was I doing this? Did I really care so much about Alex's happiness? Or was it because I was certain that our escape plan would succeed? But what if it didn't? What if I really was here for six months? Then what would I do? I thought about Mr. Madsen and how he was dying for some juicy information. Maybe after Alex was safely gone, only then would I tell him about Austin and what he was doing. Morgan, do we have a deal? I looked at his disgusting face and held back a shudder. Okay. He stood. I look forward to it. When he opened the door, I bolted through it and hurried to the bank of elevators. On the ride to my floor, I thought about the deals I had made. With Beth, to keep her from bullying me, with Mr. Madsen, and now with Austin, to keep Alex from hating me. As the elevator door slid open on the sixth floor, I walked toward my room and knew I was only doing what I had to do to get by. But I fervently hoped our escape plan would come together, and soon. I couldn't keep on living this way. The moment I walked into our room, Alex leapt from the bed. So? What did he say? He said to tell you to forget what he said today. Her face lit up and she hugged me. Thank you so much, Morgan. I pulled away, hating her for putting me in this position. Remember you're part of the deal? Yeah, of course. I worried that she was only telling me what I wanted to hear. I'm off to the gym, she said with a smile. After she left, I decided to see if Piper was in her room. I wanted to talk over our plans some more. I knocked on her door, and Cassidy answered. Hey, is Piper here? Hi, Morgan, Piper called from within the room. Come on in. Piper was sitting at her desk, working on homework. I'll see you guys later, Cassidy said, right before she walked out the door. Piper dropped her pencil and turned around. Any news? I sat on her bed. I think I'll be able to get us a key card that can get us to the first floor. Her eyes widened. Really? I nodded. Yep. How'd you do that? Then she shook her head. No, I don't want to know. Maybe the deal I'd worked out with Alex and Austin wasn't so bad after all. Not if it meant extra insurance on getting out of here. Chapter 40 We talked about how we hoped everything would happen on our big escape night. We would wait until everyone was asleep, then Piper and I would each start a fire, and Billy would start a fire on his floor. When the alarm rang, and we were evacuated, we would slip away. The slipping away part was a little fuzzy, since we didn't know how many enforcers would be around, but with the added insurance of Austin's key card, I ended up telling Piper about my arrangement with Alex. We believed we would find a way out. The only thing that makes me nervous, Piper said, is that we're dependent on Alex to get that key card, and we don't know yet if Billy can get matches. I know. Not liking to hear my own fears vocalized, I frowned. But Billy thinks he'll be able to find something to start a fire with, I said. What if someone comes in the bathroom while we're trying to start the fire, she asked. Everyone will be asleep. I didn't like the way she kept putting obstacles in our way. This had to work. Don't you ever have to get up at night to go to the bathroom, she asked. Well, yeah, but we'll time it right. 
What if we can't stop the bleeding when we cut out the chip? Or what if we get an infection? We could die from those things. I gave her a stern look. Piper, stop. That's not going to happen. But it could. It won't. You don't know that, Morgan. You're just hoping. Of course she was right, which didn't help. Think about what it will be like once we get out of here, I said. No one will make you exercise if you don't want to, or eat those power bars all the time. I happen to like those power bars, she cut in. So do I, but you know what I mean. And no one will make you fall in a trench full of spiders. She grimaced. That's true. We chatted about other things until it was time for me to go to my counseling group. I got there before Billy, but when he arrived, he sat next to me. How's it going? he asked. Good. I leaned close to his ear. I should be able to get a key card for us to use. He looked at me, his eyebrows raised in question. Pleased with my ingenuity, I just nodded, a sly grin on my face. When Mrs. Reynolds arrived, she had a guest, Dr. Bradley, the same doctor who had inserted the chip into my arm without my permission less than a week before. After we said the pledge, Mrs. Reynolds explained why Dr. Bradley had joined our little group of delinquents. Dr. Bradley will be drawing blood from each of you this evening. We looked at each other, alarm on everyone's faces. Mrs. Reynolds must have sensed our anxiety because she said, Nothing to worry about, it's all routine. I leaned toward Billy. Have they ever taken blood before? He shook his head. Not since I've been here. Dr. Bradley was setting up a small table in a corner of the room. When I call your name, you'll go to Dr. Bradley's station and she'll take care of you. I'll bet, I thought, remembering how she had taken care of me when I'd first arrived. The first three kids had their blood drawn without incident, but the fourth kid refused to go. Now, Thomas, Mrs. Reynolds said, don't be such a baby. But I hate needles, he said, his eyes bulging. That's the only way to get the blood out, Mrs. Reynolds said. He crossed his arms over his chest. I won't do it. Mrs. Reynolds stared at him for a moment, then typed something on her tablet. Less than thirty seconds later, two large enforcers burst into the room and dragged Thomas, who kicked and screamed, over to Dr. Bradley. One of them held him in the chair, and the other pinned his arm to the table while Dr. Bradley jabbed the needle into his vein. None of us could tear our eyes away, and when Thomas let out a blood-curdling scream, I grabbed Billy's arm. He glanced at me, and I quickly let go, embarrassed by my reaction. It's just a little prick, he said. That kid's just making it worse. I could see that, but that didn't help calm me. When Dr. Bradley was done with Thomas, the enforcers let him go. He walked back to his chair and sat down, whimpering the whole time. Even though I didn't think it could be as bad as Thomas made it out to be, I still didn't like the idea of them getting any of my blood. What were they going to do with it, anyway? "'Morgan Campbell,' Mrs. Reynolds said. My heart stopped for a moment. Of course I would have to go after the hysterical kid, and while the enforcers were still there. At least Hansen wasn't one of them. Pretending not to care, I stood and walked over to Dr. Bradley, ignoring the enforcers who stood nearby. Aware all eyes were on me, I sat in the chair and rested my arm on the table. Dr. Bradley tied a piece of rubber around my upper arm, tapped on my inner elbow, wiped a spot with a pad of alcohol, then poked a needle into my vein. Blood flowed into a glass tube, and a moment later it was all over. She put a band-aid on the spot where the needle had been and smiled at me. I couldn't bring myself to smile back, but stood and walked back to my seat, glad my turn was over. The rest of the kids went through the motions without incident. As Billy was having his turn, it occurred to me that it was odd that this was happening now during our counseling group. Were all the kids at Camp Willa Moss getting their blood drawn, or just us? Chapter 41 When I got back to my room, Alex wasn't there. She was probably off with Austin. So I got ready for bed and decided to write a letter to Mom. Dear Mom, I got your letter. Thanks for writing to me. I'm learning a lot here, but I miss you guys and wish I could be there with you. I set my pencil down and wondered what else I could say. I was certain my letter would be read before it was mailed, assuming it was even sent, so I couldn't tell Mom the truth about anything. Exhaling softly, I picked my pencil back up. 
I've made some friends here and have done a lot of exercising. I've lost weight, which is good. I want to be healthy, and I hope that when I get home, I'll be able to continue the healthy habits I'm learning here. Love, Morgan. I reread the last paragraph and snickered. What a load of crap. But if Mr. Madsen read it, maybe he would actually think I meant it. I folded it up and tucked it in the drawer, then filled out my food journal. It was pretty easy, since all I had to do was write down how many power bars I'd eaten. Of course, I didn't mention the one I'd stolen for Beth, but I'd eaten myself. As I thought about the power bars, I felt a craving for them and looked forward to getting my two at breakfast, especially since that was all I was getting. A few minutes later, Alex came through the door, a big smile on her face. I could only imagine what put it there, but didn't want to think about her and Austin. She gave me no choice. I'm so happy, she said as she spun in a slow circle. Then she stopped and looked at me. Have you ever been in love, Morgan? I thought about Connor and my one date with him. He hadn't even bothered to write to me since I'd been in here, and I wondered who he was dating now, though it didn't matter any more. No, not really. Just wait. It's amazing. I wasn't in the mood to hear about her and Austin and how much they loved each other, especially since I knew he was just using her as a diversion until something better came along. I'm sure it is, and I'm glad you're happy, but I'm really tired, so I'm going to bed. She frowned. Already? It's only 9.30. I climbed under my covers. I have to get up early, don't forget. Okay, okay, good night. When I woke the next morning, I realized that one week earlier I had been dragged out of my house and brought to this place. The bruise on my face had faded, but the bruising to my spirit was fresh and tender. As I dressed, I noticed the band-aid on my inner elbow from where Dr. Bradley had drawn blood, and again wondered what that was all about. I tore it off and threw it away, then headed to the cafeteria to begin my pre-breakfast shift. Toward the end of my shift, I started feeling lightheaded and my stomach rumbled. I could hardly wait until I could tear open my two power bars. I even stepped away from the sink of dishes and walked toward the pantry where I knew the power bars were kept, tempted to go in and eat one right in the middle of my shift. But as I approached the open door, I saw one of the adult workers inside organizing boxes. Disappointed, I went back to the soapy water and scrubbed dishes without thinking about what I was doing. My mind was on eating my power bars. Finally, it was time to have breakfast. Piper and I walked together to get our food, then sat at a table by ourselves. I devoured both power bars, a feeling of satisfaction washing over me as they filled my stomach. Can I have one of yours? I asked Piper, pointing to her power bars, which she'd set aside to eat last. She put her hand over them protectively. No! I tried to hide the frown that was trying to push its way onto my face, then found myself looking forward to the post-breakfast shift. I would try to find a way into that pantry to get a few extra bars to eat later. After all, I hadn't had anything to eat but power bars in over twenty-four hours. It was no wonder I wanted some so badly. Working to take my mind off the strong craving, I thought about our escape plans. Do you think Billy will be able to get matches today? Maybe we can put things in motion tonight. Can you imagine? Maybe tomorrow at this time we'll be free. Stop it, Morgan. I don't want to talk about that right now. I looked at her in surprise. What's wrong? She shook her head. Nothing, okay? Something was obviously bothering her. No, it's not okay. We have plans. It was your idea, remember? Her eyebrows tugged together. I know, but maybe I made a mistake. Piper, what's going on? She sighed. I just keep thinking about all that could go wrong, and it freaks me out. She stared across the room, then looked at me. Maybe it's not so bad here. What? Are you serious? Have you already forgotten about the pit of spiders? Well, no, but besides that, it's not so bad. I mean, we get three meals a day, we have time to exercise, we keep busy. I couldn't believe what she was telling me. Those things are all true, but you've forgotten one little detail— we have no choice in the matter. We are forced to exercise. We are forced to keep busy by working these jobs that they assign to us, and we're forced to eat the foods that they decide we get to eat. She stood. I don't want to talk to you about this right now. One other thing, I said. She stopped. What? I pictured Thomas being held down and blood forcibly removed from his arm the night before. What about being forced to have your blood drawn? She frowned at me. 
what are you talking about? Didn't you get your blood drawn yesterday? I asked. She looked at me like I was crazy. No. So it really was just the criminals. Well, I did, along with everyone in my counseling group. She laughed. You're just making that up to try to change my mind. I held out my arm and showed her the tiny pinprick on my inner elbow. Oh, then she smiled. I still think it's not so bad here. Worried how her change in attitude would affect our escape plans, I watched her walk away. Chapter 42 During my second shift, which was right before lunch, I kept one eye on the pantry. I waited until I was sure no one was near it, and I hurried over to the door and glanced inside. No one was there. I raced over to the boxes of power bars, thrilled to see a box standing open. I grabbed four and stuffed them into my pockets, then went back to my station. No one seemed to have noticed what I'd done, and I smiled as I set the next pot in the hot water. As I leaned against the sink, I could feel the bulkiness of the bars in my pockets and looked forward to eating them later. It was only after a few minutes that I realized I hadn't even considered giving them to Beth. Feeling torn, I wasn't sure what to do. I needed to give her something so she would leave me alone, but I really wanted to keep them for myself. Maybe I could keep these and then steal a few more in my last shift to give to her. Problem solved, I thought, as I dried a clean pan. At the end of my shift, I rushed up to my room, hid the four power bars in the box springs, then went down to lunch. I got in line, received my allotted food, two power bars and a box of skim milk, then went to my table. Everyone was already there. Where'd you go? Piper asked. I looked for you after our shift, but you'd already left. Oh, I said. Uh, I forgot something in my room. She looked confused, but didn't ask anything more. I watched the others eat their veggie burgers and vegetables, but oddly, I didn't even want any. I just ate my power bars and felt my craving for them lessen, and the thought of the four hiding in my room comforted me. At the end of the meal, when Alex, Cassidy, and Piper left, Billy moved to the seat next to mine. Any luck getting first aid supplies? I'd been so focused on getting the power bars I'd forgotten about my assignment. Not yet. Yeah, I haven't gotten the matches yet either, although I think I know where I can find them. I just need a chance to get in and take them. Good. I thought about what Piper had said. I think Piper might be backing out. Why? What happened? I told him what she'd said. It's kind of weird. I mean, it was her idea in the first place. I didn't mention that I'd been thinking about escaping since I'd arrived. Huh. Well, what about you? You still want to do it, don't you? I pictured the tunnel that would take me home. Yes, absolutely. Good. He stood. I'd better get back to work. I'll see you in class. After he left, I went back to the kitchen for my final shift. The power bars I'd eaten at lunch had slaked my craving, but I still needed to get a few to give to Beth. Giving her the ones I'd taken earlier was out of the question. I also needed to get first aid supplies, but I worried that my luck wouldn't hold out and that I would get caught if I tried to take more things. I knew a first aid kit was stored in a cabinet near where the knives were kept, I guess in case someone sliced off a finger, and that area usually had people around preparing food. Maybe if I needed to use the first aid kit, I could take some of the supplies. I would wait until the next day, when things were really busy, before purposely hurting myself. I would also need something sharp to cut myself on. I considered using the knife Piper had taken, but I would probably need to show Mrs. Coleman what had cut me, so that wouldn't work. Then I remembered that there was one pot that had a small piece of metal sticking out. I'd almost cut myself on it the day before. The next day, I would set that pot aside and wait for the right moment. Caught up in my plans, I'd forgotten to try to take some power bars for Beth, and when I looked in the pantry, several people were in there organizing the shelves. My shift was ending, and I had failed to get the bars. I had two choices. One, I could give her the four bars hidden in my box spring, or two, I could not give her anything and see what happened. Not sure what to do, I decided to wait until later to make a decision. When my shift ended, I went to my room. I had half an hour until class started. As soon as I made sure I was alone, I reached into my box spring and pulled out one of the power bars, then held it to my nose and took a long moment to relish the lovely scent. I unwrapped it slowly, 
forcing myself to enjoy the anticipation, then I took a small bite. Even though I wasn't even hungry, the appetite suppressant worked remarkably well, I still craved the stupid things all the time. It was almost like I was addicted to them. Ignoring the warning bell that rang in my head, I took small bites, savoring each one, until the power bar was gone. As I stuffed the wrapper in my backpack, I didn't want anyone to find it in the trash, I realized that now I had fewer bars to give Beth, assuming I decided to give her any, which was doubtful. When I got to math class, I felt really sleepy and had a hard time staying awake. In English class, it was even worse, but since the teacher had hit me with a book the last time I'd fallen asleep, I forced my eyes open even though they were drooping. Finally, it was time to go to dinner. Billy walked with me to the elevators. Are you feeling okay, Morgan? Yeah, just tired. I paused. Any luck with getting it? He would know what I meant. Not yet, but soon. What about you? I have an idea how to get it tomorrow. Good. We dropped our backpacks off in our rooms and met up again in the cafeteria. The gang was all there when I got to the table. I set my two power bars and bottle of milk on the table and slid into the seat next to Piper. Tomorrow you get to eat real food, right, Morgan? Piper asked. Yeah. I looked at their bowls of soup, and though I looked forward to eating something besides the power bars, I hadn't minded my limited diet the last two days. After dinner, Piper and I went up to the sixth floor. She had homework, as did I, but I had to get in my workout. I changed into shorts and a t-shirt, stopping to have one of the three remaining power bars. It would be good for my energy, I told myself, then headed to the gym on the fourth floor. After my warm-up, I got on the elliptical, and as I moved my body, I felt pretty good. Better than I'd felt before. I wished I could listen to music while I worked out. As I sped up, I thought about some of my favorite songs and closed my eyes as I heard the songs playing in my mind. "'How's it going, Morgan?' Austin said as he stood next to the elliptical machine. I opened my eyes, but for some reason I didn't feel panicked at seeing him. It was like it didn't even matter. I enjoyed the mellow feeling and smiled at him. My smile must have been inviting, although I didn't mean it to be. He smiled back. "'I'm looking forward to Alex getting out of here, aren't you?' I knew he was referring to my promise that I would take her place, but the thought didn't even bother me. I shrugged, and a smile grew. I knew something was wrong with me, but I couldn't seem to control my mood. I just didn't seem to care one way or the other about Austin and what the future held. When you're done here, I want you to spend thirty minutes on the stair-stepper. Okay. I had no fight in me. I was surprised at how fast I'd agreed, but I couldn't seem to work up any concern at my change of heart. What's wrong with me? Then, as a vague idea of the cause of my indifference slowly came to mind, it drifted away before I could grab hold of it. Almost immediately, I'd forgotten what I'd been worried about and changed my focus to the music inside my head. After my workout, I took a quick shower, then headed to the counseling session. My mind seemed a little clearer than it had been in the gym, but I still felt much mellower than I usually did at these meetings. I sat next to Billy, but before we had a chance to talk, Mrs. Reynolds arrived. After we said the pledge and sat down, she smiled at us. Everyone's blood work came back with the expected results, so all is well. I wondered what that meant. What was expected? No one asked, and I didn't want to call attention to myself, so I kept quiet. Then she looked at me, which sent my heart slamming against my ribs despite my previously calm mood. You've been eating your power bars, haven't you, Morgan? Yes. I nodded vigorously, but didn't mention that I'd had more than what they'd given me, courtesy of the kitchen pantry. Very good. Tomorrow you can go back to your regular meals, and you'll only get one power bar per meal. Only one? My eyes widened at my outburst. I hadn't meant to be argumentative. I'd seen often enough that that was a bad idea when it came to Mrs. Reynolds. Is that a problem? Well, no, I guess not. She smiled, but something about it bothered me, like she knew it would be difficult for me to cut my intake in half but was happy about it. As we went through the rest of the meeting, I only half listened, obsessed with how to get more power bars to make up for the forced cutback. I knew I would have to steal more from the pantry, but I worried that I would eventually get caught. What would they do if that happened? Not let me have any? That wasn't acceptable either. Chapter 43 
After the counseling session, I went back to my room, and as I worked on homework, someone knocked on my door. I opened it and found Beth standing there. You have something of mine. Her arms were folded across her chest, and her voice was laced with anger. I wasn't able to get any extra today, I lied, thinking about the two power bars stashed only feet away. So our deal is off then? The corners of her mouth lifted like she was all too happy to cancel the deal. Her pronouncement, plus the expression on her face, reminded me of why I'd made the deal in the first place. No, I shook my head. I just have to get some. I promise I'll bring you some tomorrow. This is your last chance. Don't disappoint me. I won't. I watched her walk away, then closed the door and sat on my bed, inches from the two power bars I'd hidden. Why not just give her the two I have, I thought. Because I want them, I argued. As I considered my change of heart, a few days ago I'd made this deal and didn't care about not having any power bars, but now I was desperate to get more. I wondered what it was about them that had made me change my mind so drastically. Exhaustion washed over me as I thought about all the bad things happening to me. I would think about the power bar situation in the morning. When I got to the kitchen the next morning, I reminded myself that I needed to try to get first aid supplies. Even so, I kept thinking about stealing more power bars for both Beth and myself. At one point, nobody was near the pantry, so I walked over there, but when I glanced inside, I saw two of the adult workers in there. I was about to walk away when I overheard one of them. "'Why don't we ever have any of these power bars?' the younger of the two women asked. "'That would be a bad idea.' Intrigued, I knelt like I was tying my shoe. "'Why? The kids really seem to like them.' The older woman laughed. "'Of course they do. They made the bars that way on purpose.' "'What do you mean?' "'This new kind has something a little extra. Well, two extra things, to be precise.' "'I don't understand,' the younger woman said. "'I probably shouldn't be telling you this.' "'Now you have to. You've got my curiosity piqued. "'Okay, but you have to keep it to yourself.' "'Of course.' "'The government added something to these new ones that makes the kids crave them "'and something to make them more compliant. "'I finished retying both shoes, but I was so stunned by what the woman had said "'that I couldn't drag myself away. "'The bars were addictive? Now it all made sense.' The women continued talking, and I listened. "'How can they tell if it's working?' the younger woman asked. "'It's a little early. They only introduced these new ones last Friday, but I heard they're doing blood work on some of the more troublesome kids, you know, to see how much of the chemicals are in their system. Oh, well, that's good. That should make the kids easier to deal with.' I stood and walked to the sink, my thoughts tumbling around in my head. I'd eaten nothing but those drug-laced power bars for the past two days. Not only that, I'd eaten more than I was supposed to. I thought about the evening before, when I'd been in the gym and had felt so mellow and even kind of foggy-minded. Now it all made sense. I was under the influence of some government-sanctioned drug. What kind of effect was a drug having on everyone else? And why were they cutting back my power bars? Was it to see if I went through withdrawals? My blood work must have shown a really high level of the drug since I'd eaten nothing but the power bars on the day of the blood draw. Anger at the inhumane treatment we were getting washed over me. Then I thought about what the woman had said. Only the more troublesome kids had had blood drawn. Obviously, I fell into that category. Was that why Alex wasn't punished like me? Because she wasn't a criminal and they just wanted to use us for testing? Even though Alex hadn't been forced to only eat the power bars, I was still worried about the effect the drugs had on her and my other friends, especially Piper and Billy. What would the drugs do to them? I needed to convince them to stop eating their power bars before they became addicted. But would they believe me? I felt even more urgency to escape this place. Between drugging me, making me participate in bizarre games, hitting me when I didn't exercise right, and treating me like a criminal— this place was no camp for overweight kids. It was just a government-run prison. I reminded myself that fat stood for federally assisted thinning, but the only thing they assisted in was cruel and unusual punishment. Chapter 44 Wanting to do everything I could to accelerate my escape, I scrubbed the pots and pans, waiting for the pot that had a jagged edge. 
When it finally arrived, I set it aside. Ten minutes before the breakfast crowd arrived, our busiest time, I sliced my hand on the jagged edge of the pot. Sharp pain made me cry out, and I dropped the pan back into the sink. Blood dripped onto the floor as I called to Mrs. Coleman. I cut my hand! She glanced my way. Oh, dear! She looked at the chaos around her as everyone scurried around, getting the food finished and set out. Then she did something I had only dreamed of. She said, You know where the first aid kit is. Get your cut cleaned up. Relief blossomed within me. Finally, finally, something was going my way. I hurried over to where the first aid kit was stored and pulled it out, then took it over to a corner well away from all the activity. I ripped open a package of gauze and pressed it against my hand, then grabbed antiseptic, alcohol wipes, more gauze, and several large bandages and stuffed them in my pockets, making sure my shirt covered the bulkiness. Only then did I clean my cut and put a band-aid across it. After throwing away the trash, I closed the first aid kit and put it away. Are you okay? Mrs. Coleman asked. Yes. Good. I'll have Sadie do the dishes the rest of today, and you can take her place. Okay. Sadie was only one step up from me. Her job involved getting things for the people who were cooking, cleaning up after them, stuff like that. Still, it was better than washing dishes, and most importantly, I'd gotten the first aid supplies. After my first shift, Piper and I picked up our food. In addition to my one power bar, I got a bowl of oatmeal and some fruit, and sat at a table by ourselves. Guess what? I asked her. What? I got the first aid supplies. Her eyes grew wide. Really? You didn't actually think I accidentally cut myself, did you? I don't know. I guess I thought you did. No, it was on purpose. That was smart. It also hurt. It's going to be hard to cut out the chip. She frowned. Are you still planning on doing that? Of course, aren't you? I told you, she said. I'm not so sure now. I might have been a little hasty in saying I had to get out now. It's really not so bad here. I thought about what I'd overheard about the power bars and wondered if they were affecting Piper, making her more compliant, making her not want to leave now. I watched as she picked up one of her power bars and began unwrapping it. I reached out and put my hand on hers, stopping her. What are you doing, Morgan? Don't eat that. She laughed. Why not? It's good. My mouth watered as I thought about eating one myself, but I willed the thought away. There's something wrong with them. She pushed my hand away and continued unwrapping it. What are you talking about? They're delicious, and they keep me from feeling hungry. Plus, I really want to eat it. So do I, I thought, and found my hand reaching toward my one power bar, but then picked up my spork instead and stabbed a piece of cantaloupe. Piper, listen to me. She took a bite of the bar. What? I leaned close so I could lower my voice. I overheard two of the women talking, and they said there's something addictive in those bars and something that makes us obedient. She shook her head. Why would they do that? That doesn't even make sense. It made perfect sense to me. Create something that we crave, which will guarantee we eat it, add a pinch of behavior control, and voila, zombie kids who will do whatever they're told, especially the troublesome kids like me. Yeah, I could totally see why the workers would like the idea. Piper, I'm not making this up. I heard them. She finished the first power bar and began opening the second, she looked at me and shook her head. Even if I believed you, which I don't, what am I supposed to do with the food I don't eat? Throw it away? And what would I put in my food journal? You know there are consequences for not eating the food they give us. They've selected the exact foods that we need to be healthy. Then she smiled at me. A healthy me is a healthy world. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. She really seemed to believe what she was saying. I've got homework to do, I said. I'd better get going. Aren't you going to eat your power bar? I picked it up and put it in my pocket, which didn't have much room with the first aid supplies stuffed in there. Of course, I said. I want to be healthy. She nodded. Okay, I'll see you later. I left her to finish her meal and went to my room. Alex wasn't there, probably off with Austin. I put the power bar in the box springs with the two from the day before. At least I would have some to give Beth. I took the first aid supplies out of my pockets and set them on my bed. There were squares of gauze, antibiotic ointment, alcohol wipes, and several band-aids. I hoped that would be enough to get us through this. Us. Which us would it be? 
It sounded like Piper wasn't going to try to escape after all. I fervently hoped that Billy was still in. What would I do if he backed out too? If I didn't have any matches, I couldn't start a fire. Plus, I thought it would be easier if I had someone to help me cut the chip out of my arm. I wasn't sure I could do it myself, but if Billy could do it for me, then I could do it for him. Then I thought about the knife nestled in Piper's box springs. Now that she changed her mind about leaving, would she turn the knife back in? Even worse, what if she told someone about our plans? Maybe her caseworker had made a deal with her. If she turned over some information, she would get her time reduced. Quiet panic began to fill my chest. I had to get that knife from Piper. Even more, Billy and I needed to move on our plans sooner rather than later. We had to escape before our secret got out. Chapter 45 I had to turn my thoughts away from the escape, which was really stressing me out. So I focused on doing something I could control. Sitting at my desk, I opened one of the textbooks I would be all too happy to burn and worked on my assignment. Half an hour later, I started feeling shaky. A bead of sweat appeared on my upper lip, though I wasn't feeling hot at all. In fact, I felt chilled. Were these symptoms of withdrawal? I hadn't had a power bar since the evening before. If I'd kept the pattern of the last two days, I would have had two or three by now. It seemed my body was telling me that it needed more of whatever drug the government had put in those delicious brown rectangles. Not sure what to do to get through this, I wondered if I should eat just one to ease the symptoms, or maybe half a bar. But no, I couldn't take the chance of my mind getting foggy. I would just have to suffer through it. After another ten minutes, I started to feel worse. I curled up on my bed, trying to think of something besides the power bars that were hidden directly below me, seeming to call to me to have a bite, just one small bite. I shivered and climbed under my covers, desperate to get warm, but that didn't help. I had never felt so sick before in my life. They must have put something potent in those bars for it to have such an effect on me after only having them for a few days. True, I had had only power bars for the last two days, and more than I was supposed to, how could I have been so stupid? But that was what they wanted, for us to become addicted to these things. These people were evil, plain and simple. The insanity of this world continued to shock me, and I feared what else they might do. I wondered if the other kids were feeling the effects as much as I was. Of course, they had other foods with their power bars, so the strength of the drug had probably been diluted. As I lay there, feeling awful, the desire to eat one of the power bars stored directly beneath me became overwhelming. Without conscious thought, I crawled onto the floor, reached under the bed, and pulled out one bar. I ripped open the packaging and took a large bite of the soft bar, hardly chewing before swallowing. Frantic for the sick feeling to go away, I gobbled down the rest of it and waited for relief. A few minutes later, the terrible sickness I'd been feeling began to ease. Extremely grateful to feel better, but deeply disappointed that I couldn't resist. Tears filled my eyes and ran down my face. I hated the people in this world for what they were doing to me. The tears streamed down my cheeks for several minutes until I was able to get myself under control. Then the other drug, the one that controlled our behavior, must have kicked in because I began to feel calmer. Worried that my mind would become foggy or that my emotions would be blunted, I decided I had to control myself and not eat another power bar ever. I grabbed the other two that were stashed under my bed, shoved them in my pockets, and went to Beth's room. There was no answer when I knocked, but I had to get rid of these bars or I feared I would give in to temptation and eat them later. I went into the bathroom and pulled open the drawer where Kiera had shown me the supplies were kept. I opened one of the toiletry bags and placed the bars inside, then zipped it closed and put it in the very back of the drawer. Yes, I would know the bars were there, but I would also know that if I wanted to get them, I would have to come into the bathroom, and hopefully that would prevent me from doing it, at least until I could give them to Beth. With no idea what else to do, I tried to forget they were there and went back to my room to work on homework until it was time for my next kitchen shift. I worked my shift, and when lunchtime came, I was anxious to talk to Billy to see if he'd had any luck getting the matches. Even more, I was eager to hear his commitment to our plan. After getting my food, I wanted to refuse when the worker placed the power bar on my tray but was afraid the worker would report me. 
I went to our table. Everyone was there, and I sat in the empty seat next to Cassidy. Impatient to talk to Billy, I tried to catch his eye to see if he would give me some indication of whether or not he'd gotten the matches, but he ignored me. After several minutes of this, I finally said, Hey, Billy, how's it going? He looked at me. Okay. I'll bet it's nice to work outside, you know, out in the sunshine. Yeah, I like it. When he said nothing more, I decided to wait until everyone else had left to ask him. Obviously, he didn't want to give me a hint right now. What happened to your hand? Cassidy asked, pointing to the bandage. She cut it this morning, Piper said, then giggled. I noticed she'd eaten her power bars before starting on the rest of her meal. Worried that she would give something about my plans away, I changed the subject. Did you guys get all your homework done? Alex and Cassidy glanced at each other, then looked at me. Yeah, Alex said. Why? I noticed Billy smirking as he focused on his food. He was smart enough to figure out that I was trying to steer the conversation in a different direction. Just wondering, I said. I didn't, Piper said, a look of worry on her face. I should probably go and do it right now. She picked up her tray, her food only half eaten, except the power bars which she'd eaten first, and left our table. That was weird, Cassidy said as we all watched Piper walk away. I glanced at the puzzlement on my friends' faces. I think you guys should know something. Cassidy shifted in her seat. Is this something I'm going to want to hear? Did she think I was going to tell them my escape plans? This affects all of you, I said. So yes, you'll want to know. Okay, Cassidy said, though she seemed uncertain. This morning, I said, I found out that the power bars have drugs in them. Alex's eyes widened. What? What are you talking about? Cassidy asked at the same time. Billy squinted. Does this have anything to do with them taking our blood the other night? I nodded. Take your blood? Cassidy asked. When did this happen? During our counseling session, Billy said as he pushed his empty plate away, his two power bars still on the tray. Yeah, I added. They took a blood sample from every one of us. So, Alex asked, what's this about drugs? This morning, I said, I overheard two kitchen workers talking, and they said the power bars have something in them that makes us addicted to them. Even more, there's a second drug that makes us compliant. Alex looked shocked, but Cassidy shook her head. That's ridiculous. Come on, Cass, Alex said. Just before we came in here, you said how much you wanted one of those bars. So, she said, just because I crave something good to eat, I'm suddenly addicted to it? I believe you, Billy said, looking directly at me. Pleased by his support, I smiled at him. What are they doing here? Cassidy asked, looking at several enforcers who were circulating among the diners, stopping at different tables and talking to the kids who were eating. I don't know, Alex said. A few minutes later, we found out, as one of the enforcers came to our table, You guys need to finish up and make sure to eat your power bars. A chill danced up my spine at his command, and I glanced at Billy, who was staring at the enforcer. You got a problem, Foster? The enforcer said to Billy. No, sir. Billy looked away. Good. A moment later, he went to the next table with the same message. How weird was that? Cassidy said. I gave her a meaningful look, trying to say, I told you so. Do you believe me now? I guess, Cassidy said as she unwrapped one of her power bars and took a bite. I leaned toward her and whispered urgently, Then why are you eating it? What am I supposed to do? He said we have to. I glanced at the enforcer who had come to our table. He wasn't watching us, but as I looked around the room, I saw that others were. Why do you think they're suddenly making sure we eat them? I asked. Maybe it's not working as fast as they thought it would, Cassidy said, and they want to make sure everyone is eating them. I thought about my horrible experience earlier that morning and knew the bars were working fine when they were the only things you ate. Did they have plans to take away the rest of our food so that the power bars would be the only thing we ate? Yeah, Alex said as she ate hers. That could be. As I stared at my power bars, thankful I only had one instead of the two everyone else had, I felt conflicted. On the one hand, I really wanted to eat it and rationalized that if I did, it wouldn't be my fault because I would be punished if I didn't. On the other hand, I was terrified of giving in to my desire and having more of those drugs coursing through my veins. Billy unwrapped one of his bars and I looked at him. He frowned and shook his head slightly, then he took a large bite. 
I wasn't sure what he was trying to tell me, then realized he probably didn't want to draw the attention of the enforcers by not eating the bars. Knowing I faced the same danger, I unwrapped my power bar and took a bite. Despite my intention to not have any more ever, I enjoyed every bite and finished it quickly. I'd better get back to work, Billy said. He stood, then looked at me and gave a slight lift of his chin. Yeah, me too. I stood and walked with him. I'm going to try to get the matches this afternoon, he said in a near whisper as we carried our trays. I got the first aid supplies this morning. That's awesome. Immensely proud of myself, I smiled broadly. What should we do about Piper, he asked. We dropped off our trays, and I walked with him toward the elevators. I don't know. I think she's out. Yeah, I'd definitely say she's not on board. We stopped next to an empty table, far enough away from the other kids and the enforcers to not be overheard. What about the knife? It's in her room, right? Yeah, I paused. I'll see if I can get it from her. Okay, see you at dinner. I watched as he walked away, then I went to the kitchen for my final shift. Chapter 46 During my classes that afternoon, I had a hard time paying attention. My thoughts were on Billy, and if he was having any success getting the matches. When dinner time rolled around, I went to the cafeteria and got my food. The portion sizes seemed smaller than usual, then went to our table. Alex, Cassidy, and Piper were there. Billy was not. "'Why are all these enforcers here?' Piper asked. I scanned the cafeteria. There were as many as had been there that morning, and I felt a strong sense of worry that this was also about to become the new normal. "'Oh, yeah,' Cassidy said. "'You left lunch early.' "'Yeah, so?' Piper said. "'They're probably here for the same reason they came at the end of lunch,' Cassidy said. "'To make sure we eat our power bars.' "'Oh!' Piper shrugged like it didn't matter to her. I wondered why she seemed to be more affected by the compliance shrug than the rest of us, but decided everyone could be affected differently. I knew from personal experience that if I had too much of the drug, I definitely had a reaction. Maybe she was a rule follower by nature, and the drug just magnified that. I wonder where Billy is, Alex said. I was wondering the same thing. He was never this late. Worry gnawed at my gut. Had something gone wrong with his attempt to get the matches? Is something wrong, Morgan? Cassidy asked. I hadn't eaten any of my food, and I'd been staring at my plate. I glanced at the nearest enforcer, but he wasn't looking at me. No, I said. I'm fine. I picked up my spoon and scooped up some soup. As dinner time came to a close, Billy still hadn't shown up, and my worry had ratcheted up until I was weighed down with anxiety. I tried to think of reasons Billy would have missed dinner, but nothing good came to mind. The enforcers walked among the tables, evidently making sure everyone was eating their power bars. Reluctantly, I ate mine, but I noticed many other kids, including Piper, ate theirs with enthusiasm. Alex and Cassidy seemed less eager to eat theirs. They must have believed what I told them about the bars being laced with drugs. After dinner, I went back to my room and changed into my workout clothes. Then, before heading to the gym, I stopped by the bathroom. No one was there, and took out the two power bars I'd stashed in there earlier and walked to Beth's room. She answered right away. I held out the bars. She took them eagerly. I'm not sure how you managed to get these with those enforcers hovering over us, but I have to tell you, Morgan, I'm impressed. Though I didn't feel any joy, I smiled. Even though Beth was a bully, I felt kind of bad giving her something that I knew was bad for her. I almost told her these would be the last I would be giving her. I wasn't going to steal any others, and I doubted I could put mine aside for her. But I decided not to say anything. Maybe she was eating enough of them to put herself in a haze and she wouldn't even notice that I wasn't giving them to her. For all I knew, I was just one of her suppliers. When I got to the gym, Austin was talking to a girl on a stationary bike. I checked in and warmed up, then went to a treadmill as far from him as possible. It didn't work. A few minutes later, he stopped next to me wearing a broad smile. Hey, Morgan. Good to see you. As I thought about the promise I'd made to him, a wave of revulsion crashed over me. What if my attempt to escape failed and I was stuck here? 
What would I do when Alex left and Austin expected me to take her place? I didn't know what the two of them did together, and I didn't want to know, but I feared it would be something I would not want to do. I glanced at him but continued jogging. He finally walked away, and the vice that had gripped my chest loosened. Austin left me alone for the rest of my workout, though I noticed him talking to several other girls, and I was able to finish in peace. After a shower, I went to the ninth floor to meet with my counseling group, anxious to see if Billy would be there. I was one of the first people there, and Billy hadn't arrived yet. A few minutes later, he walked in, and I gasped. His right eye was swollen nearly shut, and a purple bruise covered most of his cheek. As he walked toward me, he moved slowly, as if in pain. The other kids stared at him, but he ignored them. When he sat next to me, I was desperate to ask him what had happened, but I knew this wasn't the right time, not with everyone's attention glued to him. He smiled at me, maybe trying to reassure me, and I managed to give him a small smile in return. Mrs. Reynolds arrived a moment later, and our counseling session began. After saying the pledge, which I hated more and more, she asked, "'How are you all feeling today?' What was the subtext of her question? Certain she wanted to know how the drugs and the power bars were affecting us, I answered, "'Fine,' just like the rest of the kids. "'And Morgan?' she said, her laser-light gaze zeroing in on me, making my heart pound. "'How are you feeling?' Good. I didn't know what answer she had been hoping for. Maybe that I'd been in a cold sweat that morning when I'd tried to stop eating my power bar's cold turkey, but she seemed slightly disappointed by my one-word response. You felt quite normal all day? No, I thought. This morning I felt sicker than I've ever felt. Yes! Her disappointment seemed to deepen, and I knew they were using me like a guinea pig, experimenting on me. She reached into her bag and pulled out four power bars, then held them out to me. You've been deprived these treats today, Morgan, so I want to give them to you now. I'm also giving you one extra to make up for your lack today. I stared at them. I didn't want to touch them. Come on now! She shook them in my direction. Here you go! I didn't have a choice, so I stood and took them from her, then sat back down. I know you must want to eat them right now, she said with a fake smile. And even though it's rude to eat in front of others, I would like you to go ahead and eat them. She glanced at the others, who were watching our exchange in silence. It's only fair, since the rest of you ate all of yours today and Morgan's only had three. It's okay, I found myself saying. I can eat them later. Her smile vanished. No, eat them now. Chapter 47 My mind spun as I tried to calculate what so much of the drugs at once would do to me. I'd already had one bar at dinner, but it had been a couple of hours. How much of the drug was in my body now? What would happen when I more than quadrupled that amount, which I was about to do? The day before, I'd eaten three bars close together, and my mind had become very foggy. I thought about how I'd swayed to the music in my head while I'd been working out and now I was supposed to eat four at once? What was she trying to accomplish? What would she do if I refused? But why would I refuse? No kid here would. They all love the power bars. Refusing would only raise her suspicions that I suspected something was wrong. Go on, Morgan, we don't mind, she said, her lips turning up in a smile. I unwrapped the first bar and began eating, trying to keep my bites to nibbles. Maybe I could pretend to eat the bars while breaking pieces off and hiding them in my pockets, but she kept one eye on me, making that impossible. By the end of the session, I'd eaten all four. I started to feel super mellow and had trouble grasping the thoughts that tumbled around my head. When we were dismissed, Billy walked with me. "'What happened to you?' I asked, laughter in my voice. "'You look bad.' "'Morgan,' he said, "'quiet down.' Why? I said in a stage whisper. Is someone listening? He gripped my arm as we walked toward the elevator. We got on, no other kids got on with us, and he helped me wave my card in front of the reader, then he pressed the button for my floor. When we reached my floor, he gently pushed me out. Aren't you coming? I asked, a strong sense of disappointment washing over me. You know I'm not allowed on this floor. 
No, I don't. I stood in the doorway of the elevator, preventing the door from closing. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? He paused. You'll be better then. I'm fine right now. He looked sad as he watched me, but I didn't understand why. Go to your room, okay? I shrugged. Okay. I watched the door slide closed, then I turned and walked down the hall. For the life of me, I couldn't remember which door was mine, so I knocked on the first door I came to. A girl I didn't know opened it. What do you want? she asked, not unkindly. Is this my room? She frowned. No. Where is it? I don't know. Okay. I went to the next door and knocked, but no one answered, so I moved on to the next door. Fortunately, the girl who opened the door knew which room was mine and steered me toward it. I knocked on the door she led me to, and a moment later Alex opened it. Morgan, why are you knocking? Hi, I said, a goofy smile on my face. What is wrong with you? She pulled me inside and closed the door. I'm so glad you're my friend, Alex. I threw my arms around her, but after a moment she peeled my arms off of her shoulders. I'm glad you're my friend, too, she said as she led me to my bed. Why don't you sit down? Okay. I plopped onto my bed and smiled up at her. Did you have fun with Austin today? Her face reddened. Why? He wants me to be his girlfriend when you leave. The embarrassed smile vanished, replaced by anger. What are you talking about? She was furious, but I couldn't understand what was upsetting her. I was only telling the truth. A warning bell rang somewhere in the recesses of my mind, but I was too far gone to capture the importance of it. He told me himself. He said, Morgan, I can't wait until Alex leaves so you can be my girlfriend. I smiled at her, waiting for her approval that I had answered her question so well. So when she slapped me, I was stunned. My hand flew up to my stinging cheek, and I looked at her with confusion. You're lying, she said through clenched teeth. Austin loves me. Why was she upset? I didn't know, but I did understand that I should go along with what she said, so I nodded. What, she said, you agree that you're lying? I nodded vigorously, my hand still held against my cheek. The anger on her face began to melt, and she laughed a little. You were just playing a joke on me, right? Relieved that she wasn't angry with me any more, I nodded again. That was mean, Morgan. I'm sorry. Just don't do it again. Okay. Exhaustion swept over me, and I climbed under my covers, fully dressed, and closed my eyes. When I woke the next morning, I didn't feel well at all. I rubbed my eyes, then climbed out of bed and made my way to the bathroom. I stared at myself in the mirror. There was a faint impression of a hand on my face. Bits and pieces from the night before came back to me. I clearly remembered Mrs. Reynolds making me eat four power bars during the counseling session, but after that things were hazy. For some reason, Alex had slapped me, but I couldn't recall why. I splashed cold water on my face, then weighed myself like I did each morning. I'd been at Camp Willamas eight days, and in that time I'd lost four pounds. Not surprising considering the drastic changes that had taken place, but I wasn't happy about it. If I'd wanted to lose weight, and I hadn't felt I needed to, this was not the way I would have done it. Being forced to exercise and being forced to eat drugged power bars was not the way to help someone improve their health. I went back to the room I shared with Alex, but she'd left long before I'd gotten up. I looked at the clock. I'd overslept, and I'd completely missed my first shift in the kitchen. Panicked, I threw on some clean clothes, then rushed to the elevator and went to the cafeteria. Chapter 48 As I stepped out of the elevator, the usual noise of the full cafeteria hit me as I saw everyone eating breakfast. I hurried into the kitchen, but Sadie was already at the sink. Was I supposed to do her job again so the cut on my hand could continue to heal? There you are, Morgan, Mrs. Coleman said. I'm so sorry I'm late. It's okay, she said. I narrowed my eyes at the unexpected answer. Your caseworker told me you would be late today and that your tardiness was to be excused. How did Mr. Madsen know I would be late? You'll do Sadie's job again today. Okay. As I worked, my mind was in a whirl. Had Mrs. Reynolds told Mr. Madsen that she was going to give me all those power bars and he had figured it would be like getting me drunk? 
or had it been Madsen's idea in the first place? And why did they tell Mrs. Coleman I should be excused for being late? Did they expect I would oversleep because of the drugs and didn't want to make a big deal about it? At the end of my brief shift, Mrs. Coleman told me that Mr. Madsen wanted to talk to me and that someone would come and get me. Worried about why he wanted to see me, my thoughts flew in several directions. Was I in trouble for oversleeping after all? Or was he going to make me eat more power bars to see how many it would take to make me sick? A few minutes later, an enforcer told me to follow him. We walked through the cafeteria to the elevator. To my surprise, I wasn't hungry, until I thought about how much appetite suppressant I must have consumed the night before. The enforcer led me into the elevator, and when the doors closed and it was just the two of us, I felt a moment of panic. What if he hit me like Hansen had done? But he barely acknowledged me as he waved his card in front of the reader. Every button lit up, including the first floor. A wave of jealousy washed over me. It wasn't fair that he could walk out of this place if he wanted to. A moment later, we arrived on the second floor, and he led me to the chair I'd become familiar with. Wait here. As I sat, I tried to pretend the enforcer sitting behind the desk wasn't there. I closed my eyes and imagined my house in Fox Run. I pictured the nearby forest with a little wooden hut, the one with a secret tunnel that had brought me to this awful world. I imagined exiting the hut and running back to my house and finding my family inside all so happy to see me. The idea intoxicated me and my desire to leave this place hammered inside me. I have to get out of here. After several moments, I opened my eyes. The enforcer was staring at me. A blush rose on my cheeks under his attention, and I looked past him to the wall. A cheerful poster showed an image of the globe, with children circling it, their hands clasped. In bold letters it said, A healthy me is a healthy world. When I thought of the rest of the pledge, I felt sick. How could anyone pledge to follow the rules in this world? They were terrible, not in the best interests of the citizens. Of course it made sense to take care of our bodies, but why should we have to make a promise about it? And if putting the good of all above my own desires involved drugging unsuspecting people to make them easier to control, I could not get behind that idea either. What was taking Madsen so long? As I waited, I realized I hadn't eaten anything since the night before when Mrs. Reynolds had made me eat the four power bars. As I thought about eating those bars, I unconsciously licked my lips, a sudden craving for a bar sweeping over me. A small bead of sweat formed on my upper lip. I wiped it away and squeezed my eyes closed, willing my body to reject this desire for the drug. Opening my eyes, I looked at my hand and noticed a small tremor. Then I vividly recalled my reaction the day before when I tried to avoid eating the power bar I'd been given. My heart rate sped up and I found it hard to breathe. Fearful I would hyperventilate, I leaned over and tried to breathe slowly and deliberately. I could feel the eyes of the enforcer on me, but I didn't care. All I cared about was how awful I was feeling and a desire to get relief. Morgan, Mr. Madsen said. I lifted my head and saw him grinning at me. If I hadn't been so focused on feeling like crap, I would have wanted to wipe that smile off of his face. Follow me. When I stood, a wave of nausea crashed over me, and I thought I was going to vomit right there in the waiting area, but I swallowed the urge and walked behind him to his office. He gestured for me to sit, which I did. He sat behind his desk this time. Maybe he was afraid I would hurl all over his neatly pressed clothes. He smiled at me. You don't look very good, Morgan. Is everything okay? I shook my head. What seems to be the problem? He reached into his desk. I believe you haven't had a chance to eat breakfast. Would this help? He held out a power bar. Loathing him for offering me more of what was making me sick, but knowing a small amount would help me feel better, I snatched the bar from his hand. A satisfied smile lifted the corners of his mouth. Though I wanted to pretend I didn't really care about eating the bar, desperation to have my withdrawal symptoms ease pushed me to rip open the wrapper and take a large bite. I tried to ignore the look of pleasure on Madsen's face as I wolfed down the entire thing. Isn't that better, he asked. I didn't answer. I didn't want to confirm his certainty that I was addicted to the drug they put in the bar. 
There are more where that came from, Morgan. In fact, I'll give you as many as you want. My heart leapt with happiness at the promise, though my mind knew it was a bad idea. All you have to do is keep up your end of our deal and share our information with me. If he only knew the information I'd gleaned, Alex and Austin's little friendship, the escape plans that Billy Piper and I had cooked up, Beth's intimidation tactics to get more power bars for herself, but I would never tell. I refused to give him the satisfaction of winning. I began to feel better, thanks to the small dose I'd just downed. I'm still working on it. He frowned. I'm disappointed in you, Morgan. I thought you would have come through for me by now. He tapped a finger against his chin. I seem to recall your desire to work on the grounds crew. He tilted his head. Is that something you'd still like to do? I nodded. Yes, I would. Very good. Today is Wednesday. You have until tomorrow morning to give me some information. If you don't, all of these offers will be revoked, and in their place will be, shall we say, another incentive. At his pronouncement, a chill raced up my spine. I didn't want to think what other awful things he had in mind. Instead, I pictured the tunnel that would take me out of this world and back to my home. Do we have an understanding? he asked. Though I had no intention of doing anything to help him, I nodded. He stood. Good. He led me back to the waiting area, and a few minutes later, an enforcer brought me back to my floor. I had an hour until my second shift, so I stopped by Piper's room. I still needed to get the knife from her. I hoped that not only could I get it from her, but that she wasn't so far gone that she would report me. Chapter 49 When Piper let me in her room, I could see she'd been working on her homework. Did you do your homework, Morgan? I sat on her bed. Not yet. You should do it. Why? I put my hand on the covers just above where I'd seen her hide the knife. Because we're supposed to. Her statements continued to astonish me. This was not the same girl who, just days before, had said with firm determination that she had to get out of this place. Why did the drug affect her like it did? I thought about it a moment. Maybe because she was just the type of person who usually followed the rules and the drug just reinforced her natural desire to please the people in charge. She sat at her desk and continued working, ignoring me. I moved to the floor, resting my back against the bed. Then, reaching one hand underneath, I felt around for the small tear in the fabric of the box springs. My fingers slid into the space and I felt around for the knife, but felt only the wooden frame. Scooting over, I continued to hunt for the knife, but it didn't seem to be there. Anxiety crept over me. Had Piper turned it in? Desperate to find it, I knew there was no way for me to get another one. I lay on my back and didn't even try to hide the fact that I was searching for it. It's not there, Morgan. Piper had turned around in her seat and was staring at me. I sat up. What? The knife, silly. I know that's what you're looking for. Where did you put it? She slid open a desk drawer, reached in, and pulled out the knife. It's right here. Why did you move it? Aren't you afraid someone will find it there? I'm going to give it back to Mrs. Coleman. Forcing myself to remain calm, I asked, Why would you do that? I promised to follow the rules, and stealing is breaking the rules. With every word she said, my opportunity to escape was slipping away. Were you going to tell Mrs. Coleman? I'm going to tell her I'm sorry that I took it. But what about when she asks why you took it? I'll tell her that we were going to run away, but that I changed my mind. Panic tightened my chest. No, you can't do that. Why not? I promised to follow the rules, and lying is breaking the rules. I couldn't believe how pliable she was, how easily the drugs had changed her. But then I reminded myself that she wasn't at Camp Willamos because she had broken any rules, but because she was overweight. She wasn't a criminal like me. For all I knew, she had always been obedient and had just briefly lost her mind on Saturday after slipping into the ditch of spiders. How about I give the knife to Mrs. Coleman, I said. But I'm the one who took it. I should give it back. It's okay, I said. I'll do it. You should let me help you. I paused. You should put the good of all above yourself. It will make me happy if you let me. She held it out to me. Okay. I took it from her. Thank you, Piper. You're a good friend. She beamed, then turned back to her homework. I stood and tucked the knife into my waistband. 
I'd better go do my homework, too, I said. I'll see you later. Okay, bye, Morgan. She didn't even look up when I left. I hurried back to my room. Alex wasn't there, so I pushed the bed away from the wall. Then, on the far side, I slipped the knife into the box springs. All during my second shift, I kept an eye on Piper, nervous that she would say something to Mrs. Coleman about the knife. But she never did, at least that I could tell. When the shift ended, and it was time for lunch, I waited for her, and we walked together to pick up our meal. "'What did Mrs. Coleman say when you gave her the knife?' Piper asked. "'Ah, uh, she said thank you.' "'Did she ask why you took it?' "'No.' "'Oh. I guess she didn't care,' I said. "'Okay.' We picked up our trays and slid them along the rails, and I hoped that would be the end of talk about the knife. After we were given our food, we went to our table. All three of our friends were there. When Piper saw Billy's face, she gasped, "'Billy, what happened to your face?' He glanced at me as I slid into the seat next to him. I fell. Does it hurt? Piper asked. No, it's fine. Piper began eating, and I looked at Billy. How are you feeling? He asked in a low voice that only I could hear. Okay, now, I said. I took a bite of the vegetables. What really happened to you? I kept my voice low, too. I guess some people don't like it when they think you're taking something that doesn't belong to you. My heart sank. Oh... But luckily, he said with a smirk, I used a little something called misdirection. Wait, what are you saying? I'm saying I got them. I couldn't hold back my smile. Yes. With a gleam in his eyes, he said, After I pocketed the matches, I heard someone coming, so I acted like I was going to take one of the tools. They caught me stealing the tool, roughed me up, then told me not to be stupid. Why didn't you come to dinner? As you can imagine, I felt like crap, so I stayed in my room. Oh, I took a bite of my liver, then leaned close to him and whispered, I got the knife from Piper. That's great. What are you two talking about over there? Piper asked. Billy looked at her. Nothing interesting. Piper frowned, like she knew we were lying, but didn't know how to say it without sounding rude. Turning back to me, Billy said, We have everything we need. When are we going to do it? This was actually going to happen. I was actually going to get out of here. A tingle of anticipation radiated through me. The sooner the better, I said. Let's meet before classes and talk some more. I have some time then, do you? I thought about my schedule. Yeah, I have half an hour between my final kitchen shift and class. Okay. We finished our meal without talking about our plans. I noticed Alex glancing at me throughout lunch and wondered what had happened the night before. I must have said something to upset her. I remembered her slapping me, but I had no idea what I'd said. The enforcers wandered among us, making sure we were eating our power bars. I'd been given two, which I hoped meant they were done playing with me and how my body was reacting to their drug. I feared my mind wouldn't be as sharp as it needed to be, and it needed to be very sharp if Billy and I were going to pull off this escape, but I didn't know how I could get away with not eating the drug-laced bars. I just had to hope that since I was also eating regular food, the effects of the drug would be diluted. After lunch, I went to the kitchen to work my final shift, but all I could think about was our imminent escape. Eager to talk to Billy, the moment my shift ended, I hurried to my room and got my school things, then went to the classroom floor. As promised, Billy was there. We found a quiet spot in a corner to talk about our plans. I think we should do it tonight, he said. The idea both thrilled and terrified me. Me too. I'm worried about Piper. She knows our plans, but that compliance drug has really gotten to her. She was talking about how important it is to keep the rules. She even wanted to get the knife back to Mrs. Coleman and tell her why she'd taken it. Oh, that's just great. I know. I convinced her to let me turn it in. I just hope she believes my lie that I did and doesn't ask Mrs. Coleman if she got it. Yeah, and since I got caught trying to steal something, some of the enforcers are keeping a closer eye on me. I nodded. I'm scared, Billy, but the longer we wait, the harder it will be. So, what's the plan? I think everyone's sound asleep by midnight, so what if we start the fires then? Okay. Where do you want to meet after we're evacuated? And when should we cut out the chips? I don't know. What do you think? We don't know where they'll take us when we evacuate, so we'll have to play it by ear. I don't want to cut the chips out too soon. 
I don't know if there's an alarm or something that goes off if it suddenly goes offline. Then again, we don't want to wait too long because they'll be able to track us. My anxiety shot up several notches as he laid out all the complications we were sure to face. If we were caught, I could only imagine the horrible punishment we would have. The more I thought about it, the more I began to get cold feet. There are so many things that can go wrong, I said. I'm really scared. I know, me too. But think of the alternative. Do you want to stay here? There was more truth to his statement than he knew. If I didn't get to the tunnel by November 10th, I would be stuck in this world for good. I still wasn't certain it would work to go to the tunnel early, although I was willing to try. I wasn't even certain that November 10th was a magic date. I only assumed it was because when I had come from my world to this one, I'd gone back in time to the beginning of September. It was like November 10th was a cutoff, and if I didn't get to the tunnel by then, the window to my world would be closed. No, I said, of course I don't want to stay here. For just a moment, I was tempted to tell him the truth, that I'd come from a parallel universe where it was okay to be overweight, and I was trying to get back there. But as I played the words in my head, I knew the craziness of it would just confuse matters, and we needed to stay focused on our task. So it's on, right? he asked. Tonight at midnight? A shiver went through me. I wasn't sure if it was from fear or elation. Yes. Chapter 50 During class, I hardly listened at all, my mind on all the things that could go wrong. I was extremely excited that freedom was finally so close, but also terrified. Several times during class, my anxiety levels skyrocketed as I pictured us being caught and dragged back to be beaten and humiliated in front of everyone. As the images paraded across my mind, my hands shook and I kept them balled in my lap. During English, Billy sat near me, and one time I turned to him and almost said to forget the whole thing, but when he looked at me, and I saw the anticipation on his face, I couldn't back out. I smiled and turned to the front and tried to only think positive thoughts. At the end of class, Billy walked with me to the elevator. "'You okay?' he asked. "'Just nervous.' "'Me too.' He smiled and nodded. "'Hang in there. Let's meet again before counseling.' "'Okay.' At dinner, I kept thinking about how the next day at that time I could be back in my home world, eating dinner with my family. The thought kept me going. When I stood to leave, Alex touched my arm. I need to talk to you. Meet me in our room in a few minutes? Okay. I dropped off my tray and went to our room. After changing into my workout clothes, I sat on the bed, intensely curious about what Alex wanted to discuss. A few minutes later, she arrived. Hey, she said as she closed the door. What's up? I've been thinking about what you said last night. I had no clue what I might have said and decided I should make that clear. Yeah, so I wasn't exactly myself last night. You did seem a little out of it, she said. What was that all about? In my counseling session, they made me eat four power bars. She looked confused. So? You know how I told you there are drugs in them? She nodded. Well... Oh, her eyes drifted away from mine as she processed that. Wow, I guess I didn't really get it. Her gaze came back to my face. And I'm eating that stuff at every meal. We all are, I said, glad she was finally catching on to the seriousness of it, but disappointed it had taken her so long. Although I had to admit, if I hadn't experienced the effects firsthand, I wasn't sure I would have really understood it either. So, she continued, like I said... I was thinking about what you said last night. Alex, I don't remember what I said. A blush rose on her cheeks. You said Austin told you he was waiting for me to leave so he could be with you. The blood drained from my face. I'd said that out loud to her? No wonder she'd slap me. And then you acted like you were just joking. But please, Morgan, tell me the truth. Trying to read her thoughts, I stared at her. Did she really want to know the truth? Or did she just want me to tell her that I'd made the whole thing up? As I looked at her, I knew she deserved to be told the truth. He really said that. Her shoulders slumped and her face seemed to sag. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it! She spun around and began pacing. You tried to tell me before, but I wouldn't listen. But you're right. I know you're right. I see him flirting with girls in the gym all the time. She stopped pacing and stood in front of me. I was blind before. 
but now that I know the truth, I'm not going to let him use me any more. Thrilled that she didn't blame me and glad she had faced the truth, I asked, what are you going to do? She pursed her lips, then after a moment of thinking, she grinned. I'm going to get him back, that's what. How? She began pacing the small space again. I don't know yet. Then she whirled back to me. Help me think of something, Morgan. You hate him, right? You told me so. Well, yeah, but then help me come up with something good. I thought about our plans to escape that night. Was there some way I could use this to help us? Then an idea sprang to mind, an idea that would alleviate some of the risk. I didn't know for sure what Austin and Alex had been doing, but I needed to make a guess. Alex, don't be offended, but if you were to tell Austin that you were pregnant, would he believe you? Her face went crimson. I was right. Yeah, she said, why? What if you told him you thought you were pregnant and you needed his help to get out of this place and get checked out? Would he help you? Wait a minute, she said. Is this about the... She glanced at the door, then dropped her voice to a whisper. The escape you and Piper talked about? Was my suggestion that obvious? Piper changed her mind, I said. But yes, it has something to do with it. Her eyebrows shot up. You're doing it on your own? I wasn't about to confess that Billy was involved. Yes. Wow, you're really something, Morgan. You surprise me. I would never be that brave. Come on, Alex. You broke all kinds of rules when you spent time with Austin. That takes courage, too. She smiled. Yeah, I guess you're right. You didn't answer my question. Do you think Austin would fall for it? She laughed. He'd freak if he thought he'd gotten me pregnant. I think he'd do anything, I asked. My hopes vaulted through the ceiling. If we could get Austin's unwitting help, our chances of success would increase dramatically. What did you have in mind, she asked. Tell him you need his key card right away and that you need him to make sure you can leave tonight at midnight without anyone noticing. Have him make sure the enforcers aren't monitoring the cameras at that time. Promise him you'll come right back, but that you know someone who can fix things. I paused. He can take that to mean whatever he wants as long as he helps you get out. I stopped as I thought of one more thing. Mention the chip in your arm and that you're worried they'll know where you've gone. He won't want anyone to know either, so he ought to make this work somehow. You're devious, Morgan, she smiled. I like it. She was quiet for a minute. But what if he wants to go with me? As I tried to anticipate how Austin would respond to Alex's request, I chewed on the inside of my lip. He seemed like the kind of person who only cared about covering his own butt. Tell him it would be safer for him to stay here, that it would be bad enough if you were caught, but that if he was with you, he would really be screwed. She laughed. <laughs> that should scare him away. She was quiet for a minute. What about you? What are you going to do? Are you really going to leave? I'm going to try. She sighed. I'll miss you, Morgan. I smiled. That's assuming I actually make it out of here. Yeah, she said. I had hoped for a more positive answer from her, but I knew she was just being realistic. I stood. I need to do my workout. I thought about her task. When do you think you'll get the key card? I'll see if I can get it before lights out, she said. Hope and fear flared in my chest as the reality of my escape plan came into sharper focus. Good. I left and went to the gym. As I began my workout, Austin came out of his office. I thought about the news Alex would be telling him in the next couple of hours and had to hold back a grin. His world would be shattered, but it served him right. Of course she wasn't really pregnant, at least I hope not, but the idea of him believing it made me happy. He deserved any stress this would give him after all he'd done to the kids here. Naturally, he came over to talk to me when he saw I'd arrived. Hey, Morgan. Hey, I panted as I jogged on the treadmill. You're getting better at these workouts. Thanks. Stop by my office when you're done. A lazy smile lifted his lips. I need to talk to you. His demand startled me. Besides, at one time I'd come by to talk to him, he'd never asked me to come to his office. What was it about? What would happen if I didn't go? Uh, okay. He nodded, then walked away. For the rest of my workout, I fretted over what he wanted to talk to me about and considered not going. 
but I didn't want to do anything that would put a spotlight on me, not on the day I planned to escape. Chapter 51 After I cooled down, I headed to his office. His door was closed. I listened, but didn't hear any noise coming from inside, so I knocked. When I heard footsteps approach, my heart pounded. The door opened a few inches to reveal Austin's face. "'What do you want?' he asked. "'You told me to stop by?' He looked confused for a moment. "'Oh, yeah.' He glanced behind him. "'This isn't a good time.' "'Okay.' I caught a glimpse of the back of Alex's head as she sat in one of the chairs. He shut the door in my face, and a large smile lifted my lips. It looked like Alex was sharing her news, and Austin was taking it about as well as we'd predicted. Pleased that my plan seemed to be working, I went to my floor and showered, then hurried to the classroom floor so Billy and I could finalize our plans. When I thought about getting back home, I became giddy and could hardly contain my happiness. Billy and I met in the same place we talked earlier. When I saw his bruised and swollen face, I flashed back to the night just over a week before when I'd been dragged out of my house and brought here, then body slammed to the ground by Hanson's enforcer partner. If Billy and I were caught trying to escape, the consequences would be severe. Suddenly, I was terrified to even try it and understood why Piper had backed out. The drugs in her system didn't help, but she didn't have as much motivation as I did to leave this place. Trying to convince myself that the risk of being caught was worth it, I pictured the tunnel that would take me back to my world, and a glimmer of courage displaced the abject fear. Hey, Morgan. Hi. Are you okay? When I think about being caught, I get really scared. He smiled. I know, so do I. But you have to think about what it would be like to be here for another six months. He frowned. Or longer. I'd been there less than two weeks and already I'd had more terrible things happen to me than had happened in my whole life. I nodded. You're right. He reached into his pocket and pulled something out. Here. It was a small book of matches. I took it from him and slid it into my pocket. Do you really think this will work? He grimaced. Do you have a better idea? Glad that I had news to deliver, I smiled, then told him about my conversation with Alex and what she was going to do. That's brilliant, Morgan. Thanks. He was quiet for a moment. Maybe we should skip the fire and just use the key card. But don't you think it would be helpful to have the confusion a fire would cause? Or would that put the enforcers on a higher alert? That's true, I guess. Tell you what, he said. Let's start our fires at midnight. Then you use the key card to come to my floor and get me. I'll meet you at the elevator and we'll head to the first floor. When the fire alarm goes off, there should be a lot of confusion so we should be able to slip out without anyone noticing. His plan sounded solid, and I tried not to think of all the things that could go wrong. Okay, midnight. When I saw his grin, it was the happiest I'd seen him. Maybe he really did want to get out of here as bad or worse than I did. We went to our counseling session and sat with the rest of our group. After we said the pledge, I began to worry what Mrs. Reynolds had in mind tonight. It seemed like she had something diabolical planned every night we met. Sure enough, once we'd all sat back down, she made an announcement. Starting tomorrow, all of you will be given three power bars at each meal. There was a murmur that went through the group. They must have decided two per meal wasn't enough to bring about the effect they were after. But because of the extra caloric intake, she added, the amount of food given at each meal will be reduced proportionally. Of course, after their little experiment on me, They'd realized that diluting the drugs with food made the drugs less powerful. The murmurs turned to grumbling. Now, now, Mrs. Reynolds said, this is just temporary. We want to see how effective the appetite suppressants are. What are we, guinea pigs? A boy said loud enough for all to hear. What did you say, Mitchell? Mrs. Reynolds asked. All eyes shifted to the boy, who now looked stricken to be the center of attention. Nothing, he said. I was just joking. Mrs. Reynolds smiled. Never forget, Mitchell. You are here because you broke a rule. You have no rights, no choices, and you'll do as you're told. His face had paled, and I knew exactly how he felt. I'd been in his position only the night before. I'd been made to eat four drug-laced power bars, and the people who made me eat them knew all too well what would happen to me, but they didn't care. 
In fact, they wanted me to have the reaction I'd had so that they could verify the power of the drugs they were giving us. Now, as Mrs. Reynolds made her pronouncement about our new meal plans, I wondered if my experience had led them to make this new rule. I felt sick, knowing it most likely had. Now everyone would suffer more. I knew it wasn't my fault, but I knew how they would feel, and it made me even angrier at these people. I pictured my friends and wanted them all to leave with Billy and me tonight, but how could I convince them? Chapter 52 When I got back to my room after the counseling session, I was glad to see Alex there. How to go? She put her pencil down, then turned around and laughed. You could say he was a little surprised. She paused. Why did you come to his office? During my workout he told me to, I said. He said he had to talk to me. About what? I don't know. When I got there, he told me it wasn't a good time. I smirked. You were in his office then. He's such a jerk, she said. Why didn't I see that before? I shrugged. Tell me how it went. She went to her bed and sat. When I told him I thought I was pregnant, he freaked, just like I thought he would. And when I asked for his key card so I could, she did air quotes, get it taken care of, he was eager to help. I laughed. Wow. I know. So here's the plan. She reached into her pocket and pulled out Austin's key card. Elation swept over me. There it was. The key to my salvation. Home was finally within reach. I'm supposed to use it tonight at midnight, she said. He's friends with most of the enforcers, so he said he would arrange it so they wouldn't sound the alarm if I'm on the elevator at that time or if my chip shows up on the security monitor in a place where I shouldn't be. That should mostly work, I said. What do you mean? I hesitated. Should I confess the plans Billy and I had made? I decided to tell her some of them. It's not just me who's escaping. Her eyes widened. Piper changed her mind? I wish, I said, but no. Billy's going too. Billy? For real? Yeah. Huh. She stared at the wall. I guess I can see that. There's a little more to it than that, I said. What do you mean? I chewed on my lower lip. How much should I tell? She had taken a big risk for me. She deserved to know all of it. At midnight, I said, he and I are both going to start fires in our bathrooms. Then I'm going to get him and we're going to escape. We're hoping that during the confusion of the evacuation, we can slip away unnoticed. What makes you so sure they'd evacuate us? She asked. No other option had ever entered my mind. Why wouldn't they? I don't know. I'm just saying you never know with them. That reminded me of the announcement Mrs. Reynolds had made. Alex, I found out that starting tomorrow, we're all going to have to eat three power bars at every meal, and they're going to reduce the amount of actual food we eat. What? Are you serious? I nodded. Yes, Mrs. Reynolds told us. But why? Don't you get it? I asked. They want the drugs to be more potent. The food dilutes it. When I didn't have anything but power bars for those two days, it really affected me. But what happens when I leave here in a couple of weeks, she asked, and I stop eating those? Won't I go through withdrawals? Alex, do you really think they care about that? They just want us to be zombies while we're in here. She stood and began pacing. This is crazy, Morgan. It's not like I did anything wrong. I was just a little overweight. She stopped and looked at me. Are you sure they're doing this to everyone and not just to you guys? By you guys, I said as I frowned. I assume you mean us delinquents. Don't be offended, she said, but isn't that what you are? I didn't do anything wrong, I said. Yes, you did. You passed out cookies at school. There's nothing wrong with that, I wanted to scream. Instead, I closed my eyes and shook my head. Are you denying it, she asked. I stared at her. No, but I disagree that it's a crime. Whatever, she sighed dramatically. We're getting off track here. The issue isn't what you did, but how they're treating us all like criminals. Alex, they look at everyone like criminals. Remember, being overweight in this world is a crime. She looked at me funny. What do you mean in this world? I blanched at my mistake. Ah, uh, I stammered. I just mean in this society. She looked confused and said, as opposed to... It wasn't always like this, was it? I asked. She sat on her bed. No, I guess not. 
but it's always been this way since I can remember. She paused. Anyway, the point is, I don't understand why they're doing what they're doing. This time I stood, anxiety at what lay ahead making me fidgety. Because they're evil, I said. That's why. I walked over to the closet and looked at my things jumbled on the shelves. There was nothing I needed to take with me. I spun around. Come with us. You need to get out of here, too. She shook her head. I'm out of here in a couple of weeks. And in the meantime, I said, you're going to become addicted, well, more addicted, to those stupid power bars. Then what? When it's time to go, you'll want to stay so you can get more? No way, she said. When they tell me I can go, I'll be gone. So you say now, I said. Look, Morgan, I've done what I can to help you. She handed me the card, but that's all I can do. I took it from her before she changed her mind. I worried about the security monitor showing Billy and me walking around in the middle of the night, but hoped the evacuation would cover our movements. I'm going to bed, she said. Then she turned away from me, making it clear our conversation was over. When I went into the bathroom to get ready for bed, several other girls were there, including Beth. Morgan, she said, where have you been? Not now. My nerves were already stretched tight. You didn't come by after dinner. I glanced at her, then began brushing my teeth. I'm talking to you, she said. I finished brushing my teeth, then turned to her. You know they make us eat those before we can leave. So? So, how am I supposed to get some for you? I noticed the other girls looking at us, but I didn't care. That's your problem, she said. Fine, I'll find a way to get you some tomorrow. It was an easy promise to make since I would be gone by then. Okay, make sure you do. I was able to finish getting ready for bed in peace after that. As I washed and dried my face, I glanced around the bathroom, mentally making a bonfire out of my textbooks. I could add some toilet paper for extra fuel, but nothing else looked flammable. Feeling optimistic, I went back to my room. Alex was in bed, and the lights were off. I climbed under the covers and stared at the ceiling, waiting for the next two hours to tick by. Chapter 53 At exactly 11.45, I climbed out of bed. Alex was softly snoring. I put on my clothes in the dark, making sure the matches and the key card were in my pocket, then I pulled my bed away from the wall and felt around until I found the knife and first aid supplies. I slipped them into my pockets, then gathered my textbooks and carried them to my door. As I pulled open my door, to make sure no one was around, adrenaline pulsed through my veins. This was it. My escape was really happening. I hoped Billy was awake and doing the same things as me. An image of him sleeping in his bed, never getting up to start his fire, filled my mind. What would I do if I was completely on my own? Panic built in my chest as I imagined being caught all by myself. Paralyzed by fear, I stood in my doorway. Alex coughed in her sleep, which jolted me, and I took a deep breath, forcing myself to move. Even if Billy didn't come through, I had to move forward. I had to get back home, no matter what. I tiptoed down the hall toward the bathroom. All was quiet. When I got to the bathroom, I closed the door to the hallway, then set my pile of books on the floor. I picked up the first one and began ripping out the pages, crumpling them loosely. Once I had a pile, I grabbed several rolls of toilet paper out of the stalls and arranged them in a circle around the papers like rocks around a fire pit. Finally, I took the book of matches out of my pocket, tore out a match, and dragged it across the rough rectangle at the bottom. It burst into flame. I held it to the crumpled paper and it quickly caught. I fed more paper to the growing fire, then placed two rolls of toilet paper on top. The room was beginning to fill with smoke, just as planned. I coughed, the air searing my throat. I opened one of the textbooks so that the pages fanned out and set it on its spine so that the pages faced the flames. In moments, it was engulfed. I set the rest of the books around the fire in the same manner, then jumped up and hurried to the door. I used the metal foot at the base of the door to prop it open, then walked quickly toward the bank of elevators, ignoring the security cameras. I hoped Austin was keeping the enforcers from watching the cameras at that moment. I waved Austin's card in front of the reader, and a moment later the doors slid open. I stepped inside, and when I waved the card in front of the reader, 
all the floors lit up. My eyes flew to the button for the first floor, and I almost pressed it, but forced myself to press number seven, Billy's floor. A moment later, the door slid open, and there was Billy, a huge grin on his face. I smiled back. Come on! He joined me, and a moment later, the door slid closed. I waved the card in front of the reader again, and this time felt great satisfaction when I pressed the number one. Did it go as planned? He asked. Yes. You? He nodded. An ear-piercing alarm shattered the quiet. We looked at each other, but neither of us smiled. This was it. The distraction we'd been waiting for. I watched as the buttons showed us moving steadily downward. Fifth floor. Fourth floor. Third. Second. The elevator stopped. Frantically, I pushed the button for the first floor, but nothing happened. The fire alarm must have made the elevators inactive, Billy said. How will they evacuate everyone if the elevators don't work? Maybe they'll use the stairs. He paused. But if they use the elevators, they'll be going up any second. Crap, we need to get out of here. I know. He put his fingers into the seam where the elevator doors met and pulled, trying to pry them open. Help me, Morgan. I did the same as him, but nothing happened. I think we're stuck. Maybe the fires weren't such a good idea after all. I shook my head. No point in regrets now. Let's just find a way out of here. We continued working on the doors, and after a moment I felt them give. I think it's working. Pull harder. We tugged and pulled, and finally they gave enough for us to slide our fingers between the doors, giving us better purchase. We pulled as hard as we could. I felt like I was pulling even harder than I had in the tug of war. Eventually the doors released and slid open. Yes, I said, triumphant. The elevator had stopped just below the second floor, but Billy boosted me up through the narrow opening. Once through, I reached down and helped him climb out. I looked around. This was the floor where I'd visited Mr. Madsen. It looked different in the dark, but I still knew the place. We need to get down one more floor, I said over the wailing alarm. I know. Just then, the elevator door slid closed and we heard it moving. Do you think they're going to start the evacuation now? I don't know, Billy said. I waved the card in front of the reader, but we got no response. We need to take the stairs. Let's go. He grabbed my arm and pulled me down a hall. A moment later, we reached a door marked stairs. I waved the card in front of the reader, but the light stayed red. I waved it a second time, then a third. The door didn't unlock. I looked at Billy and saw my panic reflected in his eyes. Do you think they know we're not Austin? He nodded. Yeah. They probably deactivated his card. Crap! The alarm stopped its screaming. We looked at each other. Why did it stop? I asked. He shrugged. They put the fires out? Everything was going wrong. Maybe the elevators are going to bring enforcers here. Utter terror shattered me and adrenaline flooded my veins. Billy, they must know we're here. We need to get the chips out. Calm down, Morgan. My mind catapulted ahead as I pictured enforcers swarming this floor, surrounding us, Hansen in the lead. Abject panic made my breathing increase. I was going to hyperventilate. I squeezed my eyes closed, working hard to focus on slowing my breathing. After a moment, I was able to get it under control. What should we do? He grabbed my hand and pulled me back the way we had come. His head swiveled back and forth as we moved forward. Finally, he stopped in front of a door marked restroom. He opened the door and pulled me inside. Give me the knife and first aid supplies. He was completely calm. I did as he ordered, thrilled beyond reason that I wasn't by myself. Let me have your arm. I held up my arm and watched as he ripped open a small package, swiped a cool, damp cloth against my skin, then wiped the cloth along the knife. Look the other way and breathe slowly, he said. I turned my head away, and just as I inhaled, a sharp, stinging pain shot up my arm. Ow! I cried out. Shh! I know it hurts, but you have to be quiet. Tears filled my eyes, and I pressed my free hand to my mouth to keep from screaming. The pain was nearly unbearable, but after a moment it lessened. Hold this here. Billy guided my free hand to white gauze he'd pressed against my arm. I'm all done. It's out. He held the tiny chip for me to see, then dropped it on the floor and stomped on it. He pulled out a strip of white tape and wrapped it around the gauze. You're all set. Now you have to do me. 
There was no time to be afraid, so I opened an alcohol-soaked pad and wiped off his arm at the spot he pointed to, then swiped the knife blade. Ready? I asked. No, but do it anyway. I nodded and pressed the tip of the knife against his arm. Do it, Morgan. It's the only way. Nodding, I sliced open his arm and almost stopped when he flinched. But then I saw the small chip, which had been just under the skin, and used the tip of the knife to pop it out. I set the knife on the counter, then pressed a clean strip of gauze against the wound and wrapped the tape around it, holding it in place. That really hurt. His eyes were bright with unshed tears. He blinked them away, then smashed the chip on the tile floor. He turned to the sink and washed the blood from his hands and arm. I did the same, and we threw away the supplies we had used, keeping unused bandages for later. Billy slid the knife into his back pocket. Now that we're invisible to them, we need to get out of here, he said. What about the cameras? If we leave, they'll see us. They probably know exactly where we are. A fresh wave of panic began building building, building, and I felt it begin to crest. Billy, they're going to find us. My ears began to buzz and my vision narrowed. I was going to pass out. Between the minor surgery he just performed and my abject terror, it was all too much. He looked around the small space, his gaze stopping at the ceiling. He pointed up. Through there. What? I was taking slow breaths and the buzzing in my ears was starting to fade as my vision returned to normal. With one foot on the toilet tank and the other on the sink, he punched upward until a vent cover popped open. After you, he said with a grin. He climbed down and I took his place. He boosted me up and I managed to hoist myself into the stifling vent area. It was extremely dark and musty and I needed to cough. Swallowing the urge, I turned around and reached to help Billy through the opening. After he was through, he put the cover back in place. Not ten seconds later, two enforcers burst into the bathroom. My heart pounded so hard I was certain they heard it. With Billy closer to the opening, I couldn't see what was happening, but heard the two men speaking. They're gone! How'd they get their chips out? I don't know, but Tasco's going to be pissed if we don't find them. One of them swore violently, and I prayed he wouldn't think to look in the ventilation system. Billy touched my arm, which comforted me. Knowing he was with me made all the difference. I never could have done this on my own. Let's search the floor, one of them said. They've got to be here somewhere. Moments later, they left the room, and I closed my eyes in relief. When I opened them, I could tell Billy was looking at me. Now what? I whispered. Chapter 54 Let's follow the vent and see where it goes. I didn't like that we didn't have an actual plan. Yes, I was thrilled we'd managed to remove the chips but we were still in the building. Until we made it out, we were vulnerable. I didn't want to consider the horrors of being caught. Billy moved away from me and I scrambled to follow. There was no way I was going to be left behind. To keep the sound down, we moved slowly. Not only that, the space was tight, forcing us to army crawl, which made the journey awkward. Occasionally I heard voices. The enforcers were still looking for us. How many were looking? I could only assume that most went home at night. Was Hansen among the searchers? After a few minutes, Billy stopped. There's an office below us. Let's go down there. What if the enforcers find us? The doors are probably locked. Come on, we have to try. He was right, but I was still terrified of being caught. He removed the vent cover and slid out, then held onto the edge of the vent before dropping to the floor. Come on, Morgan, I'll catch you. Having no choice, I shimmied out of the vent, holding onto the edge as he'd done, then let go. With Billy's help, I managed to land without crashing to the floor. Thanks. No problem, he said as he let me go. Not bothering to close the vent, Billy went to the door and pressed his ear against it. After several moments, he turned to me and smiled. I think they're gone, he whispered. Though his words sounded promising, I would only feel comfortable once I was far away from here but I didn't want to discourage him, so I nodded and smiled. Help me look for something we can use, he said. While he searched the desk, I pulled open the drawers of a filing cabinet. All I saw were files. I moved to a tall cabinet, but the doors were locked. Trying to determine where to search next, I scanned the room. My eyes stopped on a wall of framed certificates. I walked over to them, read the name of the recipient, then turned to Billy. This is Tasco's office. 
He stopped what he was doing. Really? I gestured toward the wall. Says so right here. He looked at the cabinet. What's in there? I don't know. It's locked. He grinned. Then it must be something good. I smiled. Let's find out. He walked over to the cabinet, pulled the knife out of his back pocket, and used the tip to force the lock open. The door swung wide. Yeah, he muttered. That's what I'm talking about. I looked over his shoulder to see what he'd found. It was dark in the room, and even darker in the cabinet, but my eyes had adjusted enough to the lack of light that I was able to see several stun guns on a shelf. All were plugged in. Billy grabbed two and used the clips to hook them onto his waistband. You gonna take one? I'd never used one before, and after having been tasered twice myself, wasn't sure if I could use one against someone. Still, I took one out of the closet and hooked it to my waistband. How do you work these things anyway? He looked at me with surprise, as if the use of stun guns was common knowledge. Maybe it was in this world, but that didn't help me. He took one off of his hip. You hold it against the person and squeeze here. I nodded. It sounded simple enough. He put it back on his hip and looked in the closet again. Look at that. He pointed to a box of power bars. Not the new kind that were laced with drugs, but the kind we'd eaten before. The kind the general population ate. He grabbed several and shoved them in his pockets. I did the same. I guess Tasco likes to work out, I said, as I pointed to several tracksuits hanging in the closet. Billy turned toward the window and stared at it, then swiveled back to the tracksuits before dashing to the window. He studied it, then pressed his forehead against the glass, looking down. I watched as he raced back to the closet and ripped down the tracksuits. What are you doing? Making a rope so we can climb down. He tied the leg of one tracksuit to the leg of another and yanked, testing the strength. It held. Billy, you're brilliant. He grinned. I know, right? Giddy with hope and fear, I giggled, then helped him finish tying the tracksuits together. We carried our rope to the window and set it on the floor. Billy looked around, then walked to the desk and gave it a shove. It didn't budge. This will work. He tied one of the tracksuit legs to the leg of the desk, pulling the knot tight. I'm going to have to break the glass, and it's going to be loud, so as soon as I'm done we'll have to move fast. Okay. You'll go first, and I'll follow right after. I nodded as even more adrenaline surged through my veins. He picked up the desk chair, carried it to the window, and smashed it against the glass. The sound of shattering glass rang through the air, and I expected a swarm of enforcers to burst through the door at any moment. Using a track jacket we hadn't used for our rope, Billy quickly removed the extra glass from the frame, then tossed the rope out the window. Go, Morgan. Go now. I'll hold it steady. My heart pounded so hard I thought it would burst through my chest. I scooted into the window sill and sat in the open space, then grabbed the rope Billy held out to me. Gripping the fabric and praying it would hold, I turned and made my way down. The rope ended about five feet from the ground, but I jumped the rest of the way and motioned for Billy to follow. Just a sec, he whispered out the window. The rope came loose. I frantically scanned the area as I looked for danger. Tall bushes lined the fence behind me, and to my left and right were the long grassy sections that I'd seen at the Saturday challenge. I wasn't sure which way led to freedom. With zero sense of direction, neither way felt more right than the other, but I was certain Billy would know. I looked up to see if he was coming, but all I saw was a blank window missing its glass. I heard a noise coming from my left and saw a faint beam of light. "'Someone's coming!' I whisper screamed praying Billy would hear me and know what to do. Chapter 55 The beam became brighter as the light approached the corner of the building, which was about fifty feet away. Any second, the enforcer carrying the flashlight would round the corner and see me. I scrambled backward and pushed myself into the bushes as two things happened simultaneously. Billy's back appeared in the window as he prepared to rappel down the wall, and an enforcer came into view from the corner of the building. The enforcer was alone, which surprised me. They were usually in pairs. I was hidden behind the bush, but I could clearly see the enforcer moving in our direction. My gaze shot to Billy, who was completely exposed as he began his descent. Not knowing what to do, I dug my nails into my palms. 
If I called out to Billy, I would expose my position, but if I didn't warn him, he would be caught. Billy, I whispered wildly, Billy, look out. He didn't respond to my voice. He didn't hear me. He was nearly to the end of the rope, about seven feet from the ground. In my mind, I was screaming at him to hurry, but he didn't get the message and seemed to take his time. Hey, the enforcer called out as he shone his beam on Billy, who froze for a second, obviously surprised. The enforcer raced forward and Billy went into action, dropping the rest of the way to the ground and landing on his side. Before Billy could get to his feet, the enforcer was on him. My attention was glued to the two of them scuffling on the ground. I desperately wanted to help him, but I couldn't seem to make my feet move. Suddenly, the enforcer's body seemed to seize up, then he collapsed to the ground. Billy had used a stun gun. Relief flooded me, and just as I was about to step out of the bushes, another enforcer, most likely the first one's partner, rushed Billy, pinning him to the ground. In the dim light, something about the enforcer looked familiar, and after a brief moment I realized what it was. I knew this enforcer. It was Hansen. As I thought about all the ways he'd bullied me, Fury slammed through me. Then I saw him swing his fist into Billy's face. "'Where's your little girlfriend, Foster?' he taunted as he punched him again. He was talking about me. It was up to me to do something. I stepped forward, but something caught on the bushes. I had a jerk to free myself. Moving toward Hansen, I reached for the stun gun at my hip, but came away empty. That must have been what had caught on the bushes.' My gaze flew to Billy, but with Hansen on top of him, I could hardly see him, let alone get to a stun gun. I considered going into the bushes to look for my stun gun, but it was so dark I would have to search by feel. There wasn't time. Instead, I rushed toward Hansen, prepared to jump on his back. The glint of metal caught my eye, stopping me. It was the knife we'd used to cut out our chips, the same knife Billy had put in his pocket. It was lying on the ground just behind Hansen. It must have fallen out of Billy's pocket during the scuffle. The other enforcer, who was lying a few feet from Hansen and Billy, followed me with his eyes, but he was incapacitated for the moment. I scooped up the knife, then, using all the anger I'd accumulated in the last ten days, I thrust it toward Hansen's neck. At the last second he leaned forward, and the blade missed the tender skin on his neck, and instead sank into his back. He screamed and sat up straight, but was still straddling Billy. His hands grasped for the blade, but it was just out of his reach. He twisted this way and that, frantically trying to grab the knife that protruded from his back. Then, when he seemed to realize it was hopeless, he turned and looked at me. His eyes met mine, and at the pure hatred that shone from his eyes, I staggered back a step. With a murderous glare, he said, I will kill you. My heart nearly stopped at his words because I knew he meant it. With Hansen distracted, Billy scrambled free and said, not tonight. Then he pressed the stun gun against Hansen's neck and squeezed. Hansen convulsed, then fell to his side. Though his body was still, his eyes were filled with venom as they shifted between Billy and me. Let's go, Morgan, Billy said. Blood dripped from his nose, and his lip was split open. I didn't have to be asked twice, and I followed him as he ran in the direction Hansen and the other enforcer had come from. Beyond grateful to have Billy at my side, I kept up with him, and when we reached the corner of the building, we stopped and peered around the wall. No one was at the gate. They must have been the ones on duty, Billy said. Yeah, but don't you think the others are looking for us? Of course, but they're probably still looking inside the building. He grinned. And remember, at night they don't have that many enforcers on duty. Plus, I said, the others are probably dealing with the confusion of the fires. He nodded. Let's go. He dashed away from the building and toward the gate. I was right on his heels. When we reached the gate, no guards were near, and we were able to race through without being stopped. Chapter 56 We Kept Running All that time on the treadmill was paying off, and didn't stop until we'd run several miles. When we did stop, I bent over and placed my hands on my knees, panting heavily. We were in an alley next to a store, and all was quiet. 
Elated to be free, I said. I can't believe we made it. Billy grinned. Thanks for getting that enforcer off of me. As I vividly recalled Hansen's promise to kill me, my elation seeped away. Morgan, are you okay? He really hates me, I murmured. He was just mad because you bested him. No, he really hates me. He has since day one. Try not to think about him, okay? Right now we need to focus on where to go next. With difficulty, I turned my thoughts away from Hansen and toward what we needed to do now. I thought about the GPS device that had the coordinates to the tunnel programmed into it, as well as the other supplies I'd stashed. I have some supplies at my house. We can't go to your house, Morgan. Why not? They'll look for you there. Oh, I'd been so focused on getting out that I hadn't thought about how the enforcers would search for us. Do you have any other place we can go? I pictured the tunnel, which led to the hut and life in my home world. Yeah, but it's a four-hour drive away. Billy's shoulders slumped. That makes things a little difficult. But I have to get there. Fine. I was glad he didn't even question my demand. What about you? Do you know of any place we can go? He shook his head. Nope. I glanced around. Do you even know where we are? That would be a big fat no. He smiled. No pun intended. I half smiled. Don't you live somewhere around here? he asked. I'm not sure. His forehead furrowed. How can you not be sure? I don't even know what town this is. Didn't you pay attention when they brought you to Camp Willamos last week? One, I said, it was dark, and two, I'd been tasered and was face down on the back seat of the car. Oh. Yeah. I stepped out of the alley and scanned the area. This could be the town where Connor and Anne took me to the mall. To the what? I'd forgotten. In this world, they didn't call them malls. The plaza, whatever. Okay, so you remember being here. I said it could be that town. It could also be a completely different town. You kind of suck at this, don't you? I didn't know whether to be offended or to laugh at the truth. I chose the latter. Yeah, I do. I admit it. I have no sense of direction, okay? Clearly. I don't see you leading us in any particular direction either. That's because I don't remember ever being here. What about when you were brought in? Yeah, that was a while ago, and uh, I might have been unconscious. Unconscious? Look, we've wasted enough time as it is. We need to keep moving. You can bet those two enforcers will call in their buddies to come track us down. He grinned. As soon as they can get up, that is. The abject terror of Hansen getting his hands on me got me moving, and I began jogging. We had no idea where we should go, but we stayed close to the buildings, and soon we entered a residential area. We're probably going to have to find someone to give us a ride, I said, trying to catch my breath as we jogged. I glanced at Billy. But you're going to have to get cleaned up. No one will want to give us a ride with your face looking like that. I know. The occasional bark of a dog was the only sound to break the silence of the early hour. No one was out, and no cars passed us. Hey, Billy said, slow down for a minute. I was more than happy to. My lungs felt like they were on fire. We slowed to a walk. See that house over there? He asked, gesturing with his chin. The house had a for rent sign posted in the curtainless window. Yeah? I think it's empty. He headed in that direction. Let's check it out. We stepped onto the porch. There was a lockbox on the front door. We went to the front window and peered in. The room held no furniture. Let's go around back, Billy said. I followed him to the gate and we slipped into the backyard, then walked to the back door. There were no blinds or curtains on the back door and no furniture in the house. Yeah, no one's here. Billy reached for the door, but it was locked. I could use that knife right about now. Last I saw, it was stuck in Hansen's back. I giggled at the insanity of it all. Billy shook his head and gave me a half-smile. Come on. I followed him to the garage door. He held the locked knob and rammed his shoulder into the door. The noise seemed extra loud in the silent night air, and I feared he would wake the neighbors. Shh! I listened for any sound of a neighbor stirring. He ignored me and rammed it two more times. It burst inward. Apparently pleased with himself, he grinned and held the door open for me to go in first. Chapter 57 
Nervous about the noise he'd made, I went in and Billy followed. He closed the door behind him, but it didn't shut properly. Even so, it stayed in its frame. Hopefully that would fool anyone who happened to glance that way. Light from the street lamps filtered in through the four square windows across the top of the garage door. Billy walked to a door that most likely led to the house and twisted the knob. It was locked. He turned and looked around the garage. There was nothing there, no car, no tools, no junk, nothing. But Billy walked to the wall next to the door and looked at a small faucet. What's that for? I asked. This is where you hook up a washing machine. We can use it to clean up. Good idea. He turned on the faucet and cleaned the blood off of his hands and face. I figured it was all his blood, since Hansen had been doing all of the punching. Then he took the bandage off of his arm and rinsed the wound before placing his mouth under the running water and taking a big drink. He shut off the faucet and turned to me. You have more bandages, right, Morgan? I patted my pockets, making sure I hadn't lost the remaining first aid supplies, then nodded. Good. You should put a fresh one on your arm, too. Okay. I drank from the faucet until my thirst was slaked. We both checked our arms where we'd cut out the chips. The gashes we'd made looked like they might take a while to heal. We spread ointment on them before placing large bandages over the wounds. We only have enough stuff to change it one more time, I said as I put the remaining supplies back in my pocket. We'll figure something out. What should we do now? We have to keep moving. How long do you think they'll search for us? We assaulted two of their enforcers. They're going to be really pissed. Fresh worry coursed through me. I had to get to that tunnel before they found us. Hansen's words kept running through my mind. I will kill you. There was no doubt he meant it, and I was certain he was capable of it. We need to find a way to get to Fox Run. What's in Fox Run? Where is Fox Run? It's where I lived before my family moved to Timber Hills. Okay, and what's so special about Fox Run? How is that a safe place? His questions were both reasonable and sincere, but as I looked at his face, I imagined how his expression would change if I told him the truth. Yeah, so, Billy, you see, I'm not from this world. I'm from a parallel universe, a world where it's not illegal to be overweight, and I want to get back there. And you see, there's this tunnel in Fox Run. Yeah, it will take me there, kind of like an express train to Crazyville, but you have to trust me on this. Instead, I said, I can't really explain right now, but that's where I need to go. Skepticism was written all over his face. If he thought that was sketchy, then he definitely wouldn't want to hear the truth. Look, I said, I understand if you have a better idea, but, well, I'm going to Fox Run. He was quiet for a minute, then he nodded. As a matter of fact, I don't have a better idea, so Fox Run it is. Relief gushed through me, and I realized that I didn't want to make the journey alone. I would deal with telling him the truth when we got to the tunnel, but for now, we would just focus on getting there. I thought about Fred, the man who had given me a ride from Fox Run to Timber Hills, the man who had given me the idea that I was in a parallel world, the man who had given me his phone number. Would he give us a ride? The night the enforcers had taken me away, I had been looking for the slip of paper with his phone number. It had to be in my room somewhere. I just had to get to my house to look. Plus, if I could convince Billy to go to my house, I could get the backpack I'd prepared. Most importantly, I could get the GPS device that had the tunnel coordinates programmed into it. Billy, I know of someone we could call to give us a ride to Fox Run. His eyebrows went up. You do? Who? It's this man who gave me a ride once before, but his phone number's at my house. Oh. His face showed his disappointment. I don't think it's a good idea to go there. What if we went now? We could watch the house until morning. If we could make sure none of the enforcers were there, it would be safe. He chewed on his lip and stared at the wall. Then his eyes met mine. Guess it's worth a try. If Billy agrees, I reasoned, it must be safe. Okay. How far is your house? That depends on where we are. He laughed and shook his head. Back to that old discussion, are we? I smiled. Let's find a gas station that's open all night and see if we can get a map. 
Okay. Making sure no one was around, we left the garage and walked back the way we had come. We reached what looked like the center of town, which seemed the most likely place to find a gas station. Sure enough, we saw a place with its lights on. I'll go in by myself, Billy said as we approached the building. If both of us go in with these bandages on our arms, it might look suspicious. How are you going to get a map? We don't have any money. I'll figure something out. Trusting him completely, I nodded, then waited around the back of the building, out of sight. Five minutes later, Billy came waltzing toward me, a big smile on his face. His enthusiasm was contagious, and I smiled back, though I had no idea if he actually had good news. It looks like your town is fifteen miles east of here. That was going to be a long walk. Why are you smiling? He laughed. Because now we know which direction to go. That's what you think, I said. Did you forget I'm directionally challenged? East could be to the left, right, whatever. Luckily for you, I have a sense of direction. He pointed in the direction we'd been going, and east is that way. How do you know? He tapped his forehead. My internal compass, Morgan. My internal compass. I smirked. Whatever. Wanting to make good time, we started off at a jog. I still loathed running, but at least I had a good reason to be doing it, and I was doing it by choice. How did you figure out where Timber Hills is anyway, I asked, the idea suddenly occurring to me that the clerk and the gas station may also know where we were going. They had a bunch of maps near the door. I just opened one up and looked. Oh, that was easier than I thought. And the clerk didn't care? He laughed. I didn't ask her. After several miles, we were going down the sidewalk of a wide street lined with houses. Eerie quiet surrounded us, making me edgy. With no one around, we stood out. It was true that people jogged all the time in this world, one thing that wasn't so different from my home world, but not usually at three o'clock in the morning. Hold up, Billy whispered. I slowed to a walk next to him, wondering what he'd seen. He motioned with his head toward a pair of bicycles lying in a nearby yard. What do you think? Bikes would be faster, I said, but I hate to steal from some kid. You'd rather risk getting caught by Hansen than take some kid's bike? Icy coldness washed over me at the reminder of Hansen's threat, and I strode over to the bikes, lifting one up and climbing on. Billy mounted the other, and off we went. We made much better time, and soon we arrived in my neighborhood— we knew the bikes might come in handy later, but didn't want them visible while we stalked my house, so we hid them in some bushes around the corner from my street and walked toward my house. It was still pretty early, nearing four o'clock, and all was quiet in my neighborhood. As we approached my house, we didn't see any cars with people in them. I hoped that meant the enforcers wouldn't bother looking for us here. Now what? I asked Billy. I didn't think we should just walk up to the door and knock. Besides the fact that everyone is probably sleeping, I didn't think it would be helpful to my family if they saw us in case they were questioned. But I needed to get inside somehow, and I didn't have a key. Now, he said, we wait. For what? I don't know yet. That didn't sound promising. Maybe this was a bad idea. He looked at me with incredulity. It was your idea. I rolled my eyes. I'm well aware of that. We are here now, he said. Let's see what happens. We were several houses away from my house, but I could see it. Trying to figure out a good place where we could hide and observe, I looked around. What if we go into the backyard of the neighbor across the street and watch from there? What if they catch us? Do you have a better idea? He studied the area. I don't really want to have to crouch in a bush for two hours, so your idea is worth a try. Our decision made... We hurried over to the gate of the house directly across the street from my house and slipped into the backyard. We closed the gate, then peered through the slats. We had a perfect view of the driveway and front door. Chapter 58 Over the next two hours, we took turns watching the house. It was my turn when a car pulled up in front of the house. Billy, I whispered, tapping him on the shoulder as he sat on the ground dozing. He jumped up, immediately alert, and looked through the fence slats. Enforcers. My heart raced as two uniformed men climbed out of the car and strode to the front door. 
I could hear their knocking from where I stood. No one answered, and they had to knock again. It was still pretty early, and I wondered if anyone was up. A minute later, the porch light came on, and the front door opened. With the men in the way, all I could make out were a pair of small feet, and knew it was one of my brothers. A moment later, Mom came into view. Her hair was disheveled like she'd been sleeping. Her face came in and out of view as she spoke to the men, and they shifted position. But when I saw her face, I could tell she was distressed. What exactly were they telling her? That I had attempted to kill an enforcer before escaping? Or that Billy and I had assaulted two enforcers? Either one was a serious crime, and I could only imagine the worry that news would give Mom. She wiped at her face, and I knew she was crying. I had an overwhelming urge to run to her and tell her I was okay, that the men had deserved what they'd gotten, but I knew that wouldn't help the situation. Finally, Mom shook her head and closed the door. The men walked back to their car and got in, but just sat there. Do you think they're going to leave? I was frantic to talk to Mom, and to get my backpack. Doesn't look like it. What should we do? I pressed my face against the tiny space between the slats, watching, watching. We can wait if you want, but I kind of doubt they'll be leaving any time soon. The sun was rising, and before long, Timber Hills would be alive with activity. Sighing, I turned away from the fence and looked at Billy. I guess we should keep moving. The sound of an engine turning over broke the silence. I spun around and peered through the gap in the fence. They're leaving, I whispered without looking away. Maybe it's a trick and they're just going around the block. Though he could be right, I couldn't leave now. Let's wait and see. Okay, he paused. Are you hungry? I glanced at him. Of course. He reached into his pocket, pulled out one of the power bars we pilfered from Tasco's office, and held it out to me. I took it from him and stared at it. Do you think this one has the drugs in it? Nah. Billy unwrapped his and took a bite. These are the old kind. They're fine. My stomach wanted to believe him, so I opened mine and ate it. It didn't taste quite as good as the new ones, but that just reassured me that it was probably safe. We stayed in the neighbor's backyard for twenty more minutes, and the enforcers never came back. What do you think? I finally asked, keeping my voice to a whisper. I didn't know who lived in the house that we stood next to and didn't want to find out. Should we go over there? Now? While your family's home? Well, yeah, that's kind of the point. I thought there was something you needed to get. There is, but I'd like to see my family, too. That's not a good idea. Why not? What if they have to report that you were there? They would never do that. What about the little kids? If they saw you, they might accidentally tell someone, and if the enforcers found out, your family could get in trouble. Of course he was right. I could totally see Brandon or Zack letting it slip that they had seen me at the house. What would happen to my family if the enforcers found out they hadn't immediately reported me? Would they get sent to Camp Willamos? The thought of my little brothers or Amy or even Mom having to go through what I'd experienced made me sick. Okay, you're right. We'll wait until they leave, then I'll get what I came for. Billy nodded. I'm sorry, Morgan. I know you wanted to see them. What about you? Don't you have a family you want to see? The warm expression on his face faded, but he didn't answer. What time does your family leave? I let my question drop. About 7.30. Okay, we have less than an hour to wait. Chapter 59 When the garage door slid open an hour later, I pressed my face to the fence and watched as Mom herded the boys and Amy out to the car. Seeing them made my heart ache, and I wanted to let them know I was okay. Mom seemed downcast. I was certain it was due to her early morning visitors. They backed out of the garage, and the door rumbled closed, then they drove down the street. The enforcers hadn't come back, and I hoped they had moved their search elsewhere. Ready? Billy asked. Yeah. Quietly, we opened the gate, left the backyard, and shut the gate behind us. We dashed across the street to my house and into my backyard. When Goldie didn't come out to meet me, I was surprised. I have a dog. Where is it? I don't know. We walked around to the back patio and the sliding glass door. Goldie was in the house, standing by the door, patiently waiting to be let out. There's your dog. Yeah. 
I reached toward the door and pulled. It slid open and Goldie rushed out, her tail wagging. I squatted next to her and wrapped my arms around her as she licked my face. After a moment I stood. I guess my mom forgot to let her out and lock the door. She probably had other things on her mind. Yeah, like me. At least we can get in. We went in, with Goldie following, and closed the door. I'm so thirsty. I went into the kitchen and took out two glasses. You want some water? Yes. Billy followed me to the kitchen. We gulped down several glasses of water, then I took a moment to take in my surroundings. I'd only lived in this house for two weeks before I'd been dragged away to the fat center, but coming here brought a strong feeling of home and I basked in the feeling for a moment. We should probably make this quick, Morgan. Billy's words reminded me of the reality of our situation. Okay, I'll be back in a sec. I dashed up the stairs to the room I shared with Amy. Someone had made my bed and picked up the clothes I'd carelessly left on the floor. Knowing it must have been Mom, I smiled. I hurried to the closet to get the backpack I'd filled with my getaway supplies. At first I didn't see it and worried that Mom had found my odd assortment of items and put them away, but then I saw it, tucked back in the corner. I pulled it out and unzipped the main compartment, quickly looking through the items inside. Everything was there. The only thing I'd been unable to find the night I'd been taken was Fred's phone number. I'd looked through the desk drawer and hadn't found it that night, but I would look again. I yanked open the drawer and quickly searched, but didn't see the scrap of paper with his number on it. Wanting to be thorough, I pulled the entire drawer out and dumped the contents on the floor, then sifted through each item. Yes, I said under my breath as the scrap of paper came into view. I placed it in my pocket and quickly scooped the rest of the items into the drawer before putting it back in the desk opening. I picked up the backpack and turned to leave the room, then set it on the floor and hurried to my desk. I pulled out a sheet of paper and a pen and wrote a note to Mom, telling her I was okay and that I would see her soon. I tossed the backpack over my shoulder, dashed to Mom's room, and put the note in her dresser drawer, then raced down the stairs to where Billy was petting Goldie. Billy stood when I came into the room. Are you ready to go? Yeah, let's get out of here. I'm afraid those enforcers will be back any second. What do you have in that backpack? Why? He frowned. Maybe I'd have some suggestions of what to bring. Okay. I set the backpack on the floor and unzipped it. Billy reached in and pulled out the axe. Why do you have a hatchet? You mean an axe? Morgan, this is called a hatchet. An axe has a longer handle. Oh. And your reason is? He waited for me to answer, but I was quiet. Are you a hatchet murderer or something? Ha ha, very funny. He tilted his head, clearly waiting for an answer. I have my reasons, but no, I'm not planning on killing anyone. He set the hatchet on the floor and looked through the rest of the items. Water bottles, power bars, flashlights, batteries, and the GPS device and charger. Interesting. He packed everything back in, then looked at me. Does your mom have a first aid kit we can take, or any antibiotics? I don't want our arms to get infected. Good idea. I sprinted up to the hall closet and found a small first aid kit, then went into her bathroom and rummaged through her medicine cabinet, but didn't find any antibiotics. Hurrying back down to Billy, I handed him the first aid kit, which he placed in the backpack. No antibiotics, sorry. That's okay, we'll figure something out. He stood and swung the backpack onto his shoulders. Okay, let's get out of here. Are you sure you want to carry that? I can manage it, you know. I'm sure you can, but I thought I was helping you. Okay. I wasn't sure how I felt about giving up my precious cargo, but didn't want to hurt his feelings. He'd done so much to help me already. He slid it from his shoulders. Here, you can carry it if you want to. I took it from him and placed it on my shoulders. The weight of it felt good because I knew it held the tools I needed to get home. Chapter 60 We left through the garage. I didn't want to leave the sliding glass door unlocked all day. And Goldie followed us to the backyard. I gave her a final hug, then we opened the gate, made sure no enforcers were around, and hurried down the street to where we'd stashed our bikes. Which way to Fox Run? Billy asked. I can answer this, I said, proud of myself. I pulled the GPS device out of the backpack and turned it on, then punched in the saved setting for the tunnel. 
I showed Billy the map. This is where I want to go. He looked at me, his eyebrows bunched, then he smiled. North it is. I turned off the GPS and put it away, then we climbed on our bikes and began pedaling. After a while, I said, if we can get to a phone, I have someone I can call who may be able to give us a ride. Why didn't you just call from your house? I gave him a look like, duh, Billy, you should know this. He grinned. Right. The enforcers might have tapped the phone. I nodded. We rode on, but I was so terrified that the enforcers would find us that each time a car approached, I wanted to swerve down the first side street I saw. As we left the outskirts of Timber Hills, I became more and more anxious to find a phone and call Fred, although I knew the chances of him being available, let alone willing to help us, were not high. When he'd offered to help me if I needed it, he was probably just being nice. Even so, I had to give it a try. Otherwise, we would end up riding our bikes all the way to Fox Run, which could take days, assuming we could even get that far without being caught. As we rode along, I felt so exposed, but kept going as we had no other option. When we reached the town just north of Timber Hills and rode near a cluster of stores, I got an idea. Billy, let's stop at that grocery store. We rode up to the side of the store and parked our bikes. Wait here, okay? He nodded. When I went inside, I noticed there were only a few customers. It was still pretty early. And I walked to the customer service desk. A woman stood behind the counter, sorting through some papers. She looked up when I stopped at the counter. Her name tag said Jane. Hi, I said, trying to look pitiful. I was wondering if I could use your phone? I lost my phone and I need to call my dad? Shouldn't you be at school? Jane asked. That's the problem? I put the inflection of a question at the end of each sentence, hoping that would make her more willing to help. My friend was supposed to give me a ride, but she dropped me off outside and said she was skipping, but I don't want to get in trouble. The woman sighed. We don't usually allow customers to use the phone. Truly feeling desperate, it wasn't hard to convey that in my tone. Please? I really need to call my dad. I'm going to be in so much trouble if I miss school. A small smile turned up her lips. Okay, just this once. She pushed a phone toward me. Dial nine to get an outside line. Thank you so much, I said. Jane went back to what she was doing, but she was well within hearing distance. I pulled the slip of paper with Fred's number out of my pocket and set it on the counter, then picked up the phone and pressed the nine. When the dial tone sounded, I punched in Fred's number. He answered on the second ring. Hi, this is Morgan. Who? I dropped my voice. Morgan Campbell? You gave me your phone number when you dropped me off a few weeks ago. He was silent for several beats, then, Oh yeah, I remember. You was hitching and I gave you a ride. Yes. You found your family okay, right? I glanced at Jane, who was listening to my conversation. I can't really explain everything right now, but I was wondering if you could pick me up and take me back north. North? How far north? Back to where we first met. Where are you now? Just outside of Timber Hills. I'm about fifty miles north of there now, on a job. Is there any way you can come to me by this evening? Thrilled he was willing to help us, I would agree to anything. Yes, where are you exactly? I'm in Walland. Meet me at the corner of Main and Oak at five o'clock and I'll give you a ride. Really? Thank you so much. I glanced at Jane, who was now openly staring at me, her eyes filled with disapproval. Happy to help, Morgan. I set the phone in its cradle and looked at Jane. Thank you. That wasn't your dad, was it? she asked. I've got to go. She glared at me, but I ignored her and hurried out of the store and back to Billy. Let's get out of here. We jumped on our bikes and hurried away. When we'd traveled two blocks, I told him what had happened. That's great, he said, but I think we need to stay off of the main roads. We rode for another hour, mostly along a lightly traveled two-lane highway, stopping occasionally to get a drink of water from the water bottles in my backpack. At one stop, Billy offered to carry the backpack for a while. My shoulders were sore, so I agreed. After a while, I began to feel the now familiar symptoms of withdrawal. Although they weren't nearly as bad as they'd been the morning before, thanks to only eating two power bars at dinner the night before, along with a regular meal. Billy was behind me, and when I pulled to a stop next to a tree, Billy stopped too. I climbed off my bike and sat down, leaning against the tree trunk. Ready for a break? 
He pulled two water bottles out of the backpack and handed one to me. I unscrewed the lid and gulped down the cool water. Whoa there, Morgan. You might want to save a little for later. I felt like crap and wasn't in the mood to joke around. Don't you feel sick at all? What do you mean? I held up my hand, which shook slightly. He squatted next to me. What's going on? This is nothing, I said. You should have seen me yesterday in Matson's office. I thought I was going to hurl. A light seemed to go on in his head. The drugs and the power bars. Yeah, I don't get it, though. You seem fine. You had a lot more than I did in the last few days. That's for sure. I rested my head on my knees, waiting out the sick feeling. The last two mornings when I'd felt so sick, eating a power bar had helped. But now I didn't have any of the drug-laced bars, so that wasn't an option. Plus, I knew I just had to get the drugs completely out of my system. Billy set his hand on my shoulder. You'll get through this. I looked up at him and smiled. Thanks. We stayed there until I felt well enough to go on. As we pedaled down the road, I felt better and hoped my body would soon rid itself of all traces of the drug. After fifteen minutes, I pulled up next to Billy. Can we stop at a gas station or something so I can make a pit stop? Sure, I think there's a town up ahead. Two miles farther on, some buildings came into view. We rode up to the first gas station we saw and leaned our bikes against the wall. We had no money, but hoped the clerk wouldn't object to us using the bathrooms in the back. When we walked in, we turned in the opposite direction of the clerk, who was helping a customer, and hurried to the bathrooms. Afterward, as we headed toward the exit, the television behind the counter caught my attention. I jabbed Billy in the arm, motioning with my head for him to check it out. The sound was off, but there was no mistaking what the news anchor was talking about. Pictures of Billy and me filled the screen. It was the picture they'd taken when I'd first arrived at Camp Willamos. My lip was swollen and my face was bruised. I wasn't smiling and I looked like a juvenile delinquent, a criminal, which was basically what the caption called me. It said, Morgan Campbell and Billy Foster, wanted for the assault of an enforcement officer, reward for information leading to their capture. My gaze locked on Billy's and his eyes were as wide as mine. As one, we turned and looked at the clerk who was staring right at us. Then we ran. Hey, the clerk called after us. Wait a minute. Stop. Ignoring his command, we jumped on our bikes and raced away, pedaling furiously. We had no doubt the clerk would be calling the authorities and that they would be there any second. What should we do? I screamed. What should we do? I don't know, Billy said. That was not the answer I wanted to hear. Chapter 61 When we came to a side street lined with houses, Billy swerved to turn and I followed his lead. Thirty seconds later, we heard blaring sirens coming from the street we just left. Certain it was enforcers who were after us, we pedaled onward, glancing over our shoulders to make sure they weren't behind us. We turned at the next street, where, besides a woman pushing a stroller, no one was around. We flew past her and turned down another street, and after a moment I slowed and turned to Billy. Do you even know where we're going? He shook his head. No idea. I just wanted to get away. I nodded. We'd better figure out where we are, or we might get way off track. We have to meet Fred at five o'clock. I glanced at my watch. That's in less than eight hours, but we still have to go a long way. I wonder how far we have left. I looked up ahead and saw where the street curved, which made a wide spot where we wouldn't be in front of anyone's house. Let's stop up there. Moments later, we were stopped, straddling our bikes. Billy took the backpack off of his shoulder and pulled out two water bottles, handing one to me. Let me have that for a sec, I said, as I pointed to the backpack. He handed it over. I pulled out the GPS device and turned it on. The battery showed 50% left, which I hoped would be enough to get us to Fred. I could charge it in his car. After turning it on, I typed in Walland, the town where we were to meet Fred. Seconds later, it showed the way to go. Looks like we have another 35 miles. If all goes well, Billy said, then gave me a look like, yeah, right. Then we should have no trouble getting there in time. If all goes well, I echoed. Can I see that? He pointed to the GPS, which I handed to him. Then he studied the map. If we take these back roads, we should be able to stay off everyone's radar. He handed the device back to me. At least I hope so. Living on hope wasn't my first choice, 
but since I had no other option, I went with it. After turning off the GPS, I put it back in the pack, then slung the pack over my shoulders. I placed one foot on the pedal. Let's go. We continued on, stopping occasionally to check the GPS to make sure we were going the right way. After two hours, stopping a few times to rest, we'd gone another fifteen miles. I'd never been so tired in my life. Even with the two-hour workouts at Camp Willamoss, my legs had never felt so rubbery. I wasn't used to pedaling for so many hours at a time, not to mention the fact that we hadn't slept. At one long rest, where we used up our supply of power bars and water bottles to the point where I began to get worried that we wouldn't have enough, we sat on the weed-covered ground in the shade of a tree. "'Are you ready to go?' I asked, pushing myself to a standing position. Billy didn't move. "'Where are we going, Morgan?' I looked down at him. I knew what he was really asking, and it scared me. "'To meet Fred!' Billy stared out over the meadow across the road from us. There were no houses in sight. Then he looked up at me. First of all, who is this guy? Second, where is it that you want him to take us?' I sank to the ground next to him and looked back the way we had come. The road stretched on and on, with no cars in view. I turned to Billy. "'I can't explain right now, but I can tell you that there's a safe place there, in Fox Run.' He sighed. "'You don't have to go with me if you don't want to.' I fervently hoped he would stay with me, though. "'But that's where I'm going, one way or another.' He looked away and shook his head, then he looked back at me. "'I'll stay with you, for now.' I smiled. "'Thanks.' He smiled in return and stood. "'We'd better get going.' "'Yes.' He held out his hand and I grasped it, letting him pull me up. We climbed on our bikes and headed down the road, but ten minutes later Billy called out to me to stop. He was behind me and I rolled to a stop, then turned to see what was going on. He was leaning over his bike, his hand on the back tire. He had a flat. I laid my bike on its side and went over to him. He looked at me with a frown. This might slow us down. Standing with my hands on my hips, I glanced at his bike and then at mine. We could try riding double. Good idea. He walked away from his bike and toward mine, lifting it from the ground. Maybe I could drive and you could sit on the handlebars. Regretting my suggestion, I looked at the bike. Uh, I guess we could try that. Or we can just walk. I grimaced. We still have, like, twenty miles to go. Just saying it's an option. I took the backpack off of my shoulders and handed it to him. It might be better if you're wearing this. Yeah. He put it on, then straddled the bike. Okay, let's give this a try. I had to admit I was a little nervous, but the other option, walking twenty miles when my legs already felt like rubber, didn't appeal to me either. He held the handlebar steady and I backed up over the front wheel. Then I lifted myself up enough to sit onto the handlebars. Though it was awkward, I kept my balance. Okay, Billy said. Here we go. Off we went. After a short time, the seating arrangement became uncomfortable, but I didn't complain. Instead, I kept my mind on the tunnel that we were sure to reach soon. Too bad this isn't a motorcycle, Billy murmured right behind me. Do you have a motorcycle? I used to, a dirt bike. What happened to it? He was quiet for a moment. We sold it. Who sold it? He was silent for even longer. My family. Oh. I was curious about his story, but reluctant to dig when he seemed so uncomfortable talking about his family. We rode in silence, and I watched the scenery as we went by. Orchards, fields growing some type of produce, an occasional house. Suddenly, there in front of us was a dead animal. Look out! I shouted, but Billy hardly had time to react. He swerved to avoid it, but that caused me to lose my balance, and as I began falling, I gripped the handlebars as if that would keep me from crashing to the ground. The only problem was that made the whole bike tilt sideways. Though Billy held on, the front wheel turned sharply to the right and we fell over in a heap. When I hit the ground, my arm scraped the pavement, then my shoulder hit the ground, jolting me. I let out a scream, then looked at the damage. My right arm was scratched and bleeding, but other than that and a sore shoulder, I was okay. I turned to Billy, but he seemed all right. The bike was a different story. The front rim was bent and some of the spokes had popped loose. 
Are you okay? Billy asked as he crouched next to me and looked at my arm. I'll live. He pulled off the backpack and found the first aid kit we'd taken from my house, then cleaned up my arm. That should help. My arm looked better. Thanks. We should probably change the bandages on our arms while we're at it. I examined the place on my arm where we'd sliced out the chip. The bandage was pretty dirty. Billy changed the bandage on my arm, and then I changed the one on his. Now I guess we have to walk. He smiled half-heartedly as he stood. I took the GPS out and turned it on. We have fifteen miles left. That's not too bad, and it's only noon. We should be able to make it. I was going on thirty-one hours with no sleep. My legs were sore, and I was on edge, expecting the enforcers to roar up to us in their car at any moment. Too tired to complain, I just nodded. Yeah. He rolled the bike off of the road as best he could and laid it on the ground, then walked back to me. Let's go. I pushed myself off of the ground and stood next to him, the backpack in my hands. I'll carry that, he offered, taking it from me. I was happy to hand it over, and once he put it on, we began walking. We stayed on the edge of the road as we walked, far enough to avoid getting hit by the rare cars that drove by, but close enough to walk on even ground. We trudged along for at least two miles before a house came into view. It was set well off of the road, surrounded by trees, with a long dirt road leading to the front. A moment later I heard the sound of a distant car approaching. We hadn't seen a car in the last half hour, but every time one passed my heart thundered with fear. I looked over my shoulder at the vehicle that was still quite a ways away, but did a double take when I thought I saw a light bar on the roof. Are those enforcers? Billy looked over his shoulder, then grabbed my arm and urged me forward. Yeah, I think so. He frantically searched the area. Over there, behind those trees. Though my legs were like lead weights, the rush of adrenaline gave me sudden energy and we sprinted toward the thick trees that concealed the house and hid behind the closest one. Seconds later, the car drove by and sure enough, it carried a pair of enforcers. Nausea welled up inside me and a sudden dull ache pushed against my skull. That was close, Billy whispered. Too close. Too scared and worn out to speak, I nodded. Hansen's promise to kill me kept playing through my mind. If they caught me and brought me back to Camp Willemoss, I had no doubt that not only would Hansen make my life a living hell before he actually did kill me in some horrific manner, but all of his buddies would too. I simply could not get caught. What are you kids doing? An older female voice called out to us. Chapter 62 Startled, I spun around and saw a woman with deep wrinkles in her face and a puff of gray hair. She wore an apron and stood on the porch of the small house, the door hanging open behind her. Come over here now, she motioned for us to approach. I looked at Billy, and he glanced at the woman, then he shrugged. The two of us walked side by side to the porch, stopping at the foot of the three steps that led upward. Maybe it was the warm smile on her face or the apron she wore, but she reminded me of my grandmother, a woman who was fiercely independent but loved her family more than anything. What are you doing in my yard? She waved her arms around to encompass the tree-filled space. I shifted my attention to the doorway behind her, afraid someone else was inside, someone who might be calling the enforcers to come pick us up. Maybe her job was to stall us long enough for them to show up. Then she could get the reward money. Well? Billy smiled. I'm sorry we bothered you, ma'am. We'll be on our way. She smiled back. There's no hurry, son. I don't get many visitors out here. Why don't you come in and rest for a spell? You look plum worn out. She was right about that, but I still didn't trust that she wasn't just trying to stall us. We should go, I whispered to Billy. What's that, dear? she asked me. I, uh, I said we should get going. Oh. She looked genuinely disappointed. Whether it was because she saw her chance at the reward money about to walk away, or because she really wanted company, I wasn't sure. I just made lunch, heated up some leftovers from dinner. She leaned toward us conspiratorially. Hamburger with real beef, she winked. I also made fresh apple pie. My stomach rumbled at the suggestion. Even though we'd eaten two power bars each, and even though I'd gotten used to feeling hungry, the mention of fresh apple pie made my mouth water. 
Was she trying to entice us with food because she knew we were escapees from the fat center? Or was I being paranoid? Maybe we can come in for a minute, Billy said, making the decision for us. She clapped her hands together once. Good! I love to have guests. Then she turned and walked inside. We mounted the porch steps, but when we reached the doorway, I peeked inside before going in. A tidy room with wood floors and furniture like my grandmother's, and only the old woman. Come in, come in, she said eagerly as she walked into an adjoining room. Billy gave me a gentle shove, and I stepped over the threshold. The aroma of freshly baked pie filled my nose. I relaxed. She was telling the truth. We walked toward the room where she'd gone, the kitchen, and Billy whispered, Do you notice she doesn't have a TV? I immediately caught on to what he was telling me. No TV meant she didn't know who we were. My fears began to ease. When we walked into the kitchen, she was setting two placemats on a small round table to join the one she'd already laid out. Sit down, sit down! She smiled as she bustled around. Billy took the backpack off of his shoulders and set it on the floor. Do you have a bathroom I could use? I asked. Oh yes, it's down the hall and to the right. Thank you. Not only did I want to freshen up, I wanted an excuse to check the place out and make sure my trust wasn't misplaced. I walked back through the living room and down a hallway. There were three rooms off of the hallway, two bedrooms and a bathroom. I went into the first bedroom and looked around. A neatly made bed and a tidy dresser nearly filled the small space. I peeked in the closet for good measure, but the only thing I found were a few dresses hanging from the bar and some boxes stacked in a corner. I went to the other bedroom, which appeared to be the room the woman used. This bed was neatly made as well, but on her dresser I saw several photos of a young family with two small boys. I wondered if these were her grandchildren and if they lived nearby. I looked in her closet, too, just to be safe, but no one was lurking. Next, I went into the bathroom, and when I looked in the mirror, I hardly recognized myself. My hair was a mess, and the worry in my eyes was unmistakable. I freshened up, then opened the medicine cabinet, curious what I might find. There were a few medications, but nothing that looked like an antibiotic, not that I planned to steal from this woman, so I closed the door and went back to the kitchen. Everything okay? Billy asked. I nodded. Everything's great. He smiled. Mrs. Duncan said she has enough food for us to split a hamburger. I looked at Mrs. Duncan, who was mixing a pitcher of liquid, her back to us. At Billy's words, she turned and nodded, then went back to her task. Billy leaned toward me and whispered, I'm Brian and you're Michelle. I nodded. Thank you for inviting us to lunch, Mrs. Duncan. She set the spoon in the sink and carried the pitcher to the table. You're very welcome, dear. She pointed to the pitcher. Help yourself to the lemonade. With a twinkle in her eye, she said, It's made with real sugar. Did you make your pie with real sugar, too? I asked. Oh, yes. There's really no other way to make it taste right. But isn't that expensive? It is kind of a treat, but I've been around a lot of years, and I'm not going to change the way I cook just because a bunch of... She stopped suddenly. Please have some lemonade. Then she turned her back and began working at the counter. I looked at Billy, my eyebrows raised. He smiled and shrugged. A few minutes later, Mrs. Duncan said half a hamburger on each of our plates, including her own. I'm sorry they're not whole, but that's all I had. No, that's fine, I said. They smell heavenly. She placed a plate of fresh vegetables on the table as well, then sat down. Help yourselves. I took a bite of the hamburger and my taste buds rejoiced. This is wonderful. I haven't had a real hamburger in ages. In fact, I hadn't had one since I'd stepped foot in this world. Only the veggie burgers that seem so popular. Thank you. I'm not sure I've ever had a hamburger made with real beef, Billy said. Is it difficult to get? She suddenly seemed nervous. Where are you two headed? East, Billy said, before I had a chance to respond. Her eyes went to the bandage on Billy's arm, then to mine. What happened to you? I'd only eaten half of my hamburger, but my appetite disappeared under her questioning. Uh, I fell, she nodded. And you, Brian? I had to suppress a grin when she called him by his alias. Yeah, I fell too. That's very strange. You both falling and getting hurt at the same exact place. Billy stood suddenly. 
Thanks again for lunch, but we should be going. Taking my cue from Billy, I stood as well. Mrs. Duncan chuckled. Sit down now, both of you. I glanced at Billy, and he looked at me, neither one of us moving. Please. Slowly, we sat back down. You're those two kids who ran off from that federally assisted thinning center, aren't you? No TV, huh? I said under my breath, my anxiety notching up. No, I don't have a television, Mrs. Duncan said, but I do have a radio, and of course, internet. I sighed. You didn't call the enforcers, did you? Of course not. I don't take kindly to what our government has done. I well remember the way it used to be, and I don't approve of the control they want to have now. My tension loosened a bit. Unless she was just pretending. But if she'd called the enforcers, surely they would have come by now. Now, what are your real names? I can't remember what they said on the news. Billy and Morgan, ma'am, Billy said. Oh, yes. Well, welcome to my home, both of you. Thank you, I said, as my appetite returned. Would you mind if I charged up my GPS device? No, you go right ahead. I plugged it in. It was down to 15%. Then I went back to the table. When we'd finished our hamburgers and vegetables, Mrs. Duncan brought out her apple pie. As I imagined the sweet flavor, my mouth watered. She gave each of us a generous slice, and I enjoyed every bite. We really do appreciate the meal, Billy said, but we have to get going. I understand. Would you mind if we filled our water bottles before we left? Billy asked. Of course not. You help yourself. I helped Billy fill the six water bottles, then we put them in the pack, along with a charged GPS device. Morgan, Billy said quietly as I zipped the backpack closed, maybe we should call this guy we're meeting and see if he'll meet us outside of Walland. That way we won't have to go right into the middle of town. Good idea. I turned to Mrs. Duncan. Do you mind if I use your phone? That's fine, dear. She pointed to a wall-mounted phone, one with a long cord attached to it. I took Fred's phone number out of my pocket and punched it in. He answered right away. Hi, it's me, Morgan. I'm glad you called. You are? Why? I'm really sorry, but I'm not going to be able to help you out. My heart pounded at this new wrinkle. Why not? Just a few hours ago you said you would. I know, but that was before I knew you was a fugitive. I can't afford any more trouble with the government. I'm really sorry. Good luck. Then he hung up. I stared at the phone, now dead in my hand. A moment later, a dial tone sounded, and I hung the phone back in its cradle. When I turned to look at Billy, he and Mrs. Duncan were both watching me. I looked directly at Billy. We have a problem. Chapter 63 What's wrong? Billy asked. Will you excuse us a minute, Mrs. Duncan? I said. Sure, honey. I pulled Billy into the living room. Fred bailed on us. What? Why? He found out the enforcers are after us, and he doesn't want to get involved. I frowned. I don't really blame him. Yeah, I guess. What do we do now? Remind me again why we have to go to this place that's two hundred miles away? I sighed. I'll remind you that I'm going there. I hope you'll come with me, but I can't explain right now. Okay, whatever. I have nowhere else to go. Inside, I smiled, relieved I wouldn't be on my own. So, he said, how do you propose we get there? I walked into the kitchen, and Billy followed me. Mrs. Duncan, you don't happen to have a pair of bikes we can borrow, do you? No, I can't say that I do. Disappointment swelled within me, and my shoulders slumped. But, she said, her eyes sparkling, I might have something better. My hopes rose. Follow me. She opened a door that led out of the kitchen and to the back part of her property. Billy put the backpack over his shoulders, and we followed her out. She walked toward a barn, but stopped in front of the doors. Would you mind opening that for me? It's a little heavy. Billy stepped forward and slid open the first door, then the second, then stepped back to allow Mrs. Duncan to enter first. She walked in with us close on her heels. Will that do? When I saw what she pointed to, my eyes widened. I didn't know much about motorcycles, but this one looked sleek and fast. Billy walked over to it and ran his hands over it. This is a beauty. He turned to Mrs. Duncan, his eyebrows furrowed. This is yours? Not exactly. It's my son's. You see, his wife found out that he almost crashed and she got scared. She told him it was either her or the bike. She chuckled. You 
can see he made his choice. Why didn't he sell it? I think he's hoping his wife will change her mind. But won't he be mad that you let us take it? You bring it back when you can. Her generosity staggered me. The bike must have cost thousands of dollars, and she was willing to let two virtual strangers, strangers on the run from the enforcers, take it with a request that we bring it back. Of course, Billy said. I knew he was sincere, but he had no idea that where we were going there would be no coming back, assuming we succeeded. In the back of my mind, I still worried that I had to go through the tunnel on the same date I'd come through, November 10th, but I desperately hoped I was wrong and that the date didn't matter. Pushing aside that concern, I looked at the joy on Billy's face and fresh hope swept over me. We could get to the tunnel tonight. Let me just get the key. The moment she left, Billy turned to me, a huge grin on his face. I'd never seen him so happy. You know how to drive this thing? I asked. Yes, I do. Good. Mrs. Duncan was back a minute later. Here you go. She handed the key to Billy. The tank has some gas. She paused. Now, I don't know where you're going, but I do know a few people who would be willing to help you if you need it. She handed me a small piece of paper with two names written on it, along with a phone number next to each name. I slipped it into my back pocket. Thank you. One more thing, she said. Then she handed me two twenty-dollar bills. I stared at the money, feeling guilty that I was considering accepting it when I didn't know if she could afford it, but also knowing we would absolutely need it. She must have read my mind because she said, Don't you argue. I know you can use it. I felt tears of gratitude for all that she was doing for us, a pair of fugitives that she'd barely met. Thank you so much for your generosity. She smiled. Like I said before, I don't agree with what has come of our government, and I don't think it's right that they make people leave their families at their own expense to force them to lose weight. She squinted at me. That is what happened to you, right? Yes. Are those fat centers as bad as I've heard? I had no idea what she'd heard, but what I did know was that the experience I'd just been through had been much worse than I would have imagined. If someone had told me that the fat centers drugged teenagers into submission and had games where you fell into pits filled with live spiders, I would have laughed, thinking they were teasing me, but as I knew all too well, it was completely true. I looked at Mrs. Duncan and nodded. She reached out and stroked my arm, which made me think of Mom which in turn made me anxious to get going and get home. The helmets are over there. She pointed to a nearby shelf. There are two. She chuckled. My son actually thought his wife would ride with him. Billy helped me put one on, then he put on the other. You'd better wear the backpack, he told me, as he took it off and handed it to me. I secured it onto my back and watched him get on the bike. Even through his faceplate, I could tell he was grinning from ear to ear. I climbed on behind him and held on to his waist. He turned on the engine and revved it. You're going to want to hang on tighter than that, he yelled over the noise. Bye, Mrs. Duncan, I shouted. Thank you again. She just nodded. I wrapped my arms around Billy's waist. We surged forward and out the barn door. We hit the street a moment later and turned north. I'd never been on a motorcycle before, but found the speed exhilarating especially since I knew every mile we covered brought me closer to home. We decided to get on the freeway. We figured we'd be less conspicuous there than on the back roads, and made much better time than we could have dreamed of on the bicycles. It was just after one o'clock when we left Mrs. Duncan's, and as the miles flew by beneath our feet, we eventually came to the exit for Fox Run. When I saw the sign saying it was the next exit, tears flooded my eyes. This is where my journey had begun, and I was thrilled beyond words that I was back. Billy exited the freeway, and we zoomed down the off-ramp, stopping at the light at the bottom. Where to? Billy called out. Left. Though I didn't have a good sense of direction, I was certain how to get to the entrance to the forest by my house, after imagining going there so many times. I guided Billy to my street, and we parked at the curb between two houses. I remembered the woman, who now lived in my house, and hoped she wouldn't see me, fearing if she did, she would be all too happy to call the enforcers. Billy turned off the engine and I slid off the bike. I took off my helmet and hung it on one of the handlebars, as did Billy, then I pulled the backpack off of my shoulders and eagerly took out the GPS device. I turned it on and pulled up the directions to the tunnel. After a moment the directions displayed. Wearing a broad smile, I said, Let's go.
Chapter 64 Billy took the backpack from me, and I carried the GPS device as we set off into the woods. Many times we had to veer off course to go around tangled bushes and other obstacles, but within an hour the tunnel was in sight. My heart pounded and blood rushed to my head. I couldn't believe I was so close to getting home. "'What is this place, Morgan?' I grabbed his hand and pulled him forward. "'You'll see!' We reached the entrance to the tunnel, and I stared in the darkness. "'Let me have the backpack.' He handed it to me, and I put the GPS device inside and took out two flashlights, handing one to him. I flicked mine on and stepped inside the tunnel. The light from my flashlight lit the inside much better than the matches had. I put the backpack on and walked inside, with Billy right behind me. After a short distance, I saw a burned-out match on the ground and smiled. We kept going, and I found match after match. I kept watch for the burned-out lantern, but knew that would be a ways down. "'I hope you know what you're doing,' Billy said from behind me. I did, too. I thought about what it would mean if I succeeded. I would be home with my family. But what about the other Morgan? The one who I could only assume had switched places with me. Would she suddenly be back here?' The enforcers would be after her, and she would have no clue that her life was in danger. I felt a twinge of guilt that I had messed up her life in this world so badly. But what could I do now? I had to focus on what was best for me. But what about Billy? What if he didn't want to go to another world? I wondered if I should tell him now, before we went through the wormhole. What if someone brought me to another world without telling me? What would I do? What if he couldn't find his family in my world? What if he got there, and couldn't get back here, but didn't want to stay in my world? He'd helped me so much. I had to give him the choice. I stopped, and Billy ran into me. Sorry, he said. I turned to look at him in the light from the flashlight. I need to talk to you. He shone his flashlight on the earth-covered walls. Now? Here? Yes. I need to tell you something before we go any farther. Okay, what is it? I pictured my family and how happy I would be to see them, and I couldn't hold back a smile. I'm from a different world. Billy stared at me for a second, then burst into laughter. He looked at me like I was insane. What? The look of astonishment on his face made my smile fade. It's true. This tunnel leads to my world. Through his laughter, he said, Are you like an alien or something? I shoved him with a hand, not holding the flashlight. No, you idiot, it's a parallel universe. He finally stopped laughing. Uh, don't you think you should have mentioned this before? Why, so you could mock me? You know it sounds crazy, right? Of course I know that, but it doesn't make it any less true. And this, he swung his hand around, other world, I suppose it's okay to be fat there, right? Yes, I said with enthusiasm. There are people there who are overweight, but you can eat what you want, and no one is dragged out of their homes and taken to fat centers. He spoke to the wall. This is unbelievable. Then he looked back at me and stared. You really believe this, don't you? Duh, because it's true. So, when we come out the other side of this tunnel, how will I know we're in this other world of yours? First off, I said, a big tree will be blocking the exit, which is why I brought the axe. It's a hatchet. Whatever. I brought it so we could get out of the hut that we're going to go into. A hut. Right. Yes. And then we'll go to my house. The one that you parked by and my family... Tears sprang to my eyes at the thought. My family will be inside. Not some other family that moved in because my dad was forced to go to a fat center. He nodded. Okay. Do you believe me now? Uh, I'm not sure yet. I guess we'll see. I turned and started walking again. I saw another match on the ground. See that match? He shone his flashlight where mine was pointed. Yeah? It's for me, when I came through, and eventually we'll see the lantern I dropped. Okay. His agreement wasn't enthusiastic, but that was all right. He would believe me soon enough. We continued on, and I saw several more matches, but then I stopped seeing them. They just weren't there anymore. The lantern should be around here somewhere, I said, shining the light around as a bad feeling began to grow within me. Billy shone his light around, too. I walked back the way we had come, thinking maybe I had missed it, but I didn't see it. But I did see the beginning of the matches again. Maybe someone else found it and picked it up? That sounds reasonable, he said. But deep down I had a very bad feeling. 
I didn't say anything and kept walking, on the lookout for any clue I had come through here before. Finally, we came to the end and I saw the ladder that led upward. I looked up and saw that the space I had come through, the space that had been open the last time I'd been here, was closed. The bad feeling increased, but I forced it down, my hopes overriding any doubts. We need to get through there. I pointed to the square that would need to be removed. Billy scaled the ladder and pushed against the square, but it didn't budge. He looked down at me. Are you sure you came through here? I didn't like his logic. It only confirmed the fear that was growing inside me. Yes, of course. He climbed down, and I took off the backpack. He unzipped it, then removed the hatchet. He set the pack on the ground and climbed back up the ladder. He swung the hatchet at the wood, and it didn't take long for him to break through. Light from the space above trickled down. He kept working at the square until it was open enough for us to climb through. Do you want to go first? He called down to me. Unease tightened my chest. You're already there, so go ahead. Okay. He hoisted himself through and disappeared from view. Then he poked his head back down. Your turn. I slung the backpack over my shoulder and climbed up the ladder, my heart thudding at what I would find. A moment later, I reached the top. Chapter 65 Hand me the backpack, Billy said, his hand extended. I gave it to him and he pulled it through, then he reached down and helped me up. The moment my head was through the opening, I saw that the hut was intact. No tree had crushed the door. The unease swelled to a crescendo. I thought you said a tree had fallen on this place. Billy smiled tightly, like he wanted to placate the crazy girl in the room, but couldn't hide the obvious truth. I opened my mouth to speak, but a thick knot had formed in my throat as my hope that I would be reunited with my family faded, and the distinct possibility that I was still in Billy's world seeped into my gut. Trying to gain control over the hysteria that was just beneath their surface, I swallowed several times. There may be an issue with dates. My voice caught as I spoke. Dates? What do you mean? Well, you see, when I came through, it was November 10th, and now it's what, the end of September? Yeah, so? Well, maybe I have to come back on the same date, November 10th. Are you sure? I couldn't hold back the tears any longer. Of course I'm not sure, I shrieked, making Billy fall back a step. I don't know that much about parallel worlds, okay? For all I know, we're in a completely different world now. I found it hard to breathe, but somehow I kept talking. Maybe in this world they just kill you if you're overweight, or, or maybe in this world it's okay to be fat, but you aren't allowed to live past the age of 20. Morgan, calm down. Calm down? How can I calm down? An overwhelming feeling of despair flooded me, and I wrapped my arms around my stomach and fell to my knees. Sobs tore from my throat as the stark reality pounded through my head. I'm still in this world. Dad's still locked in a fat center. Hanson still wants to kill me. Billy and I are fugitives in this world, on the run, just two kids with zero resources. Distraught beyond all reason, I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. I felt Billy's hand on my shoulder, but it didn't help. The only thing that would help would be for me to be with my family, in my world. Hey, Morgan, hey, it's going to be okay. You just have to come back here in six weeks, right? He paused, but I didn't answer. I'll help you, okay? I'll make sure you get back here at the right time. My tears slowed, and I turned my head. You will? I hiccup as my sobs subsided. You believe me? He hesitated. Sure, yes. I knew he didn't really believe me, but was probably afraid of what I would do if he said so. Slowly, I managed to get myself under control. Then, despite what my gut told me, a whisper of hope pricked my mind. Wait a minute, I said. Maybe I'm wrong. I stood and wiped the tears from my cheeks. Maybe I am back, but it's just September here, too. My voice lifted as I warmed to the idea. Yeah, that would explain everything. That's why the cover was on, and that's why the lantern wasn't there. But what about the matches? Those were there from before. I wouldn't allow him to squelch my hope, and I waved away his logic. That was from where I came through the wormhole, or whatever, into your world. They stopped halfway because when I stepped from my world into yours, it was like a new tunnel. And now, since it's early, it's like I never went through that first half. That's why the lantern isn't there. That's why the matches stop so suddenly. 
because I hadn't gone through that first part of the tunnel yet. That wouldn't have happened until November 10th. Morgan, you need to face reality. I didn't want to hear it. His reality didn't involve parallel universes, but I knew, I knew that I had come from another world. When I found this hut, I continued, ignoring his statement, I marked trees with a marker so I could find my way back, so of course they won't be there now. I looked at him, eager for him to agree. Because it's too early, don't you see? I could be back after all. A look of sadness filled his eyes, and I knew he thought I was completely insane. Come on, Billy, I'll prove it to you. I dashed toward the door and flung it open. He reluctantly followed, the backpack in his hands. He put it on and followed me out. The sun was beginning to go down, just like the night I'd found the hut, and I asked Billy to give me the GPS device so I could find the way back to my house. He handed it to me, and I programmed in my Fox Run address. It said it would take 30 minutes to get there, but I didn't plan on taking that long. No, I was going to move as fast as humanly possible to my house. I would prove to Billy that I wasn't crazy. No, I was stone-cold sane, and I really did come from a different world. Slow down, Morgan, Billy called after me as I raced onward. Ignoring him, I kept moving forward, getting frustrated when I had to go around particularly large obstacles. Finally, we were mere minutes from our destination, and my heart pounded as hope and fear battled for prominence. Finally, finally, a row of houses came into sight, and I imagined my family throwing their arms around me at my return. My heart filled with a bursting joy that I had only imagined before, but then something near my house caught my eye something that looked fast and sleek, and I felt my hopes crash down, and I felt my face crumple with defeat. There's the motorcycle, Morgan. Yes, I whispered. I see it. Then I heard a sound that sent tremors through my whole body. A siren wailed in the distance, and it sounded like it was getting closer. Holy crap, Morgan, we've got to go. I know, I said, this time with no emotion in my voice. I had to shut off all feeling, or I would implode. It was too much. The truth that I had failed. The truth that I was still here and the enforcers were trying to find us. The truth that if I didn't come to the tunnel on the right date, then I would be stuck in this world forever. Like a robot, I let Billy take my hand and urge me forward, running toward the motorcycle, running toward freedom. The scream of the sirens increased as the enforcers approached, but we reached the motorcycle first. I knew it, a woman screamed. I knew it was you. I looked at the woman and recognized her as the woman who lived in my house. I hated her, hated her with an unreasonableness that shocked me. Morgan, put on your helmet. We've got to get out of here. They'll be here soon. I did what he asked without thought, then climbed on behind him and held on as we roared away from my house, away from the approaching sirens, and toward whatever life I would have to live for the next six weeks until I could try again to go through the tunnel. Six weeks, I told myself over and over. Six weeks. I just have to survive here for six more weeks, and then I will succeed. And when I tried again, Billy would be by my side, and Billy would see that I wasn't crazy, and Billy would know that I was telling the truth. And when he arrived in my world— a world where it was okay if you weighed something besides what other people told you to, he would smile. And when I saw my family, my whole family, including Dad, I would throw my arms around them and I would never let go. But for now, I held on to Billy as we flew down the road, away, away, away from the enforcers who wanted to catch us. This has been Dare to Endure. Parallel World Book 2 Written and narrated by Christine Kersey Copyright 2013 by Christine Kersey Morgan's story continues in Dare to Defy Thanks for listening.